Beat by Jared Garrett. Narrated by the author, Jared Garrett. For Thomas, Hincy, April, Lily, Nathaniel, Benjamin, and Wallace. Your hugs and imagination keep me going. Beat by Jared Garrett. Text copyright 2015 by Jared Garrett. Audio copyright 2018 by Jared Garrett. All rights reserved. This book and audiobook or any portion thereof may not be reproduced or used in any manner whatsoever without the express written permission of the author, except for the use of brief quotations in a book review. Chapter 1 The beeping monitor on my wrist felt like needles jabbing my ears. Spammy piece of dreck. Pedaling hard around the corner, I had to dodge the people walking home from their shifts. Shouts followed behind me, telling me to slow down, warning me of the knockout, as if I needed warnings. I'd worn the papa on my wrist since leaving the nursery at age four. I knew about the knockout. The afternoon sun glowed off the white curving walls of the huge dome buildings lining the sidewalks. I was still a hundred meters from the engineering dome. I forced myself to breathe slower and deeper. I glanced at the beeping papa on my wrist, ignoring the three flashing digits telling me my heart rate. The time readout was small, but I was used to focusing on it. 1428. I wished I'd had time to deactivate the bugging speed suppressor in the cycle. I had two minutes to get to my position in development four. But if an admin or enforcer caught me tampering with the cycle... I'd not only be in for a longer shift in the engineering dome, but I'd also get a shift in the dumps. Working with Roger was tech paradise, but scrubbing kilometers of smelly conveyor belt sucked bug, and enforcers could tell when you were going faster than your cycle was designed to. You had to be careful and lucky if you wanted to have fun in New Frisco. I grinned. Bren and the others were finally catching on to the whole fun thing. We'd been pushing for the last hour over in Hope Park, pushing your heart rate as close to 140 as you could without breaking that barrier and getting the knockout. That was fun. Even more fun was seeing Paul or Connor slip up, pass 140, and fall completely inert on the ground. Nobody was as good as me. I hadn't had the knockout for months. The beeping got louder with one long beep coming between three short ones, it was like having a neurotically beeping parent attached to your arm, which was why everyone called it a papa. I slowed, reminding myself to breathe slower. It would not help to get the knockout right outside the engineering dome. An image flashed behind my eyes, me collapsing just as the magnetic doors to my department slid open. That would be embarrassing. I jolted the pedals to a stop, tapping the brake sensor with my right thumb, and yanking the cycle into a hard skid, my back wheel careening left. Leaping from the cycle and kicking the leg activator, I dropped it into a locking slot against the outer wall of the dome and jogged the four meters to the door. Nick Granger! I jerked to a halt, the grating, filtered voice sending tingles down my spine. Bug me! The black-clad enforcers with their glinting multi-barreled keepers patrolled the sidewalks during the day, but I hadn't seen one as I pedaled. This enforcer loomed over me, his matte black uniform acting like a light magnet. The space around him seemed dim. I haven't done anything wrong. What's his problem? The last thing I needed now, for my shift and for my plans tonight, was to get in trouble with an enforcer. My right hand went to my pants pocket, fingering the tiny square in there before I could get it to stop. Your speed endangered other citizens. The enforcer's face was hidden behind a smooth helmet that made me think of an ant's head. A visor that didn't reflect even a little of the sun covered his eyes. This is your second offense this week. I knew that. Spam. I should have just left two minutes earlier. I'm sorry. I lost track of time. That's what your personal assistant is for. I know. I shivered. The visor's dull flatness made the man seem more machine than human. Everyone knew the enforcers were human. They even had papas. At least that's what we were told. But they lived differently from the rest of us, 
and worked as if they were part machine. Last year, they showed up in force at my school to restore calm when teacher Harris went nuts. He'd started throwing desks and chairs, yelling about the bug and humanity and something about artificial language. The enforcers were there five minutes after it began, maybe twenty of them, circling the teacher silently and firing their keepers at the same time. Battery-powered nets and electrodes hit Harris in an avalanche. The barbed electrode spiked his heart rate, and the knockout hit him. Within sixty seconds, the enforcers were gone, and unconscious, net-wrapped Teacher Harris with them. We were told Harris had somehow blocked his knockout and had died of the bug while being treated for what the other teachers called dementia. For a while, I had wondered why the enforcers hadn't just allowed Harris to naturally push his heart rate up, enough to have the knockout kick in. Then, one day, it came to me. A show of force like that would keep people from acting up or breaking rules. I wouldn't have been surprised if they had put Harris up to that fit just to give the admins and enforcers more control over us. Watch the time, the enforcer said. I lowered my gaze to the enforcer's keeper. The weapon bobbed slightly as the man spoke. It was a sleek weapon, not quite a meter long, that shot all kinds of nasty things. Aside from the nets and sizzling electrodes, I had once seen a rubber bullet. What else was in that smooth cylinder under the barrel? Stay calm and maintain the calm in others. Yes, sir. I hated the fear the enforcers sparked in me. I wondered if they ever did anything like pushing. I wasn't sure whether the enforcers trained so they could catch somebody on foot without getting the knockout. If not, I was in better shape than this guy. I might even be able to outrun him unless they really were part machine. But even if I could run faster, there was no way I could outrun an electrode or rubber bullet. Not that running away from an enforcer did any good. They always knew who and where you were. Nope. I'd have to be able to take off the papa to make running worth it. Or I could jam the tracker? My stomach flipped. Take it easy, save it for tonight. I couldn't jam it right now, anyway. I stared at the enforcer's matte visor, guessing where his eyes were. Wishing my mouth weren't so dry, I injected sincerity into my voice. I'll do better. Once more, and we will have a longer discussion. Yes, sir. Dismissed. The enforcer stepped back and proceeded down the sidewalk, his steps loud on the hard ground. I stood there for a few seconds, wondering if I was insane. If we made a mistake tonight, the trouble we would be in... It had to be worse than the dumps. We might disappear like Harris had. I glanced at the papa, and my heart sank. Bug it. 1433. The doors hissed open, and I darted through the entry area, past the start of level 8 girl at the front desk, tossing a smile at her pretty face, and into Dev 1. Twenty seconds later, I slipped through the door to Dev 4, and spotted Roger at his usual station. Five other pairs of workers filled the room at their various stations. Just like Roger and me, one was the mentor and the other the intern. But unlike Roger and me, most of them were working on boring stuff, like a better clothing processor for the homes in New Frisco, one that would use less power. Not us. I grinned as I took in the machine Roger had conceived and I had helped him build so far. It had the general shape of a cycle, but it was anything but. Propulsion units, all mounted on independently rotating pivot balls, clustered all over the bottom of the machine. Handlebars at the top controlled it, but Roger had finished that part before I became his intern. It was a powered cycle, a really fast one. It was going to be able to fly above the sidewalks and roads, not as high as the enforcer pods, but above people's heads for sure. My entrance must have caught Roger's eye because he looked up. Hey! Hey! I waved my papa at the sensor embedded in the side of the table where Roger worked. Nick Granger, four minutes late to shift, released at 1824. Luckily, there was enough noise in the lab that the sensor's voice didn't carry far. Roger popped a fresh power cylinder into his build-all tool. Everything good? Yeah. I pulled my build-all from the magnetic strip above Roger's work table. I was almost on time, but an enforcer stopped me. Point his keeper at you? Roger stepped on a plate and the cycle was hoisted up another half meter, high enough for both of us to get under it. 
Roger was nearly a head shorter than me, so I appreciated him doing that. No, but he didn't really have to. While I pulled on anti-static gloves, Roger slid a shiny fab steel plate down behind a propulsion unit. He tapped his build all against the part he wanted to loosen, waited a moment while the attachment slid into place on his tool, then slipped the attachment over the bolt. A whir sounded as the tool tightened around the bolt. Roger pressed the button on his build all and the bolt was removed in a second. He dropped it onto the table. I stepped up next to him and held the propulsion unit while he removed the other three anchor bolts. The unit was 20 centimeters in diameter and 10 centimeters tall, with completely smooth lines and a power core embedded into the top half of the fat disc. With the bolts out, I toggled two wire clips off and lifted the unit onto Roger's cluttered work table. Something's wrong with it, Roger said. He flipped it over, opening the power core compartment. It won't run higher than 70%. He pulled out the power core, rubbing his gloved hand on the metal contact. Maybe the connection is being obstructed somehow? I glanced at the core, possible but unlikely. There was enough surface area for a good connection, even if it were dirty. Running at a low percentage meant power wasn't being used right. I turned the propulsion unit over, setting it down carefully. The bottom part, the place where the force pushed against the ground and gravity, was ringed by heat plates, manufactured specifically to capture and reflect heat energy back to the power core, maximizing and conserving energy use. My idea. I bent close and slid my finger lightly along the top of each plate. There. You got something? Roger bent close and set down the power core. I touched the plate in question. Yeah, it's loose. So? Roger's favorite question. Sometimes he knew the answer, and sometimes he didn't. But he loved asking me, kept insisting it made me hone my thinking. So, if it's loose, propulsive power is lost through the seam, and the recycling doesn't work like it should either, adding up to a pretty significant net loss of efficiency and capacity. No response came from Roger. I straightened and met his eyes. What? He smiled, but there was more to it than the usual goofy satisfaction when I got something right. I couldn't have said it better. I shrugged. Yeah, well, I felt squirmy at the compliment. I'm good at this stuff. You said so. I grinned, trying to get rid of the weirdness. What was the big deal? Really good, Nick. Crazy good. Roger handed me my build all. Fix it. I turned back to the propulsion unit and got to work. As I disassembled the heat plate, Roger tested the other units. Every minute or so, a thick wine and a bright glow would fill the air. Once the heat plate was completely disassembled, I started putting it back together, making sure all the pieces were tight. As I snapped the last piece into place, I realized Roger was watching me. I handed him the repair unit. Roger let out a quiet snort. <laughs> nice work. Fast work. It's fun. There was that weird expression again. This was ridiculous. What's going on? Roger didn't answer. Instead, he ducked under the machine. I joined him, and we worked together to put the unit back in place. After a minute or two, Roger sighed. <sighs> I'm gonna miss you. Chapter 2 Wait, what? I asked. Miss me? Roger looked like he had to fight hard to meet my eyes. We're done. You get most of this stuff better than I do. Protocol says you move on now. My heart sank. Drek. Bugging Drek. I don't want to. This is the best project I've worked on. I wanted... I bit that part back. He nodded. You wanted to test it. You don't... I mean... Maybe we don't say anything. Don't tell anyone we're done or that I'm done here. I knew his answer before he said a word. You know how much trouble I'd get into? You too. We have to follow protocol. He came closer. I know. It's spam. Worst kind of spam. He spoke quietly enough that nobody else would hear. You do all this work and can't test it. I'm sorry. Now I understood that weird expression. He felt guilty. You reported already? 
Roger nodded. I couldn't look at him. Not even Roger would bend the rules. He was the smartest, most interesting person I'd interned with, but he towed the line just like everyone else. Great. My throat tightened. Come on, you're fifteen. Too old to cry. A tall, gangly guy with a huge lump sticking out of his throat stepped into view from behind the powered cycle. His eyes darted all over Dev 4 and rested on me. Nick Granger? I glanced from Roger to the tall man. Uh, yeah? Phil Klein, you're working with me now. He looked down his pointy nose at me and spun around. His two long fingers waved for me to follow him. Spamming dreck. Phil Klein was famous for being awful to work with. I didn't look at Roger as I started after Phil. I thought he was my friend. But you didn't get to have friends in the new chapter. Not unless you found someone else willing to break the rules. I wished I could contact Bren right now and vent at him about this newest stupidity. How unfair was this? Why couldn't I choose where I wanted to work? Nick. I stopped. Roger had a totally defeated expression on his face. The build all. You have to leave it here. I lifted the tool I'd forgotten was in my hand. I wanted to slam it to the ground and stomp it into pieces. Granger, let's go. Phil Klein's voice cut through the noise of Dev 4. I ignored it. What choice did Roger have? I couldn't blame him. I held the tool out. Thanks. It was fun. Roger took the tool and nodded. I followed Phil across Dev 4 through the sliding doors to Dev 3. He stayed ahead as we crossed between two long rows of lab tables where a bunch of people hunched over screens set into their workstations, building models for harnessing energy from the sun and other sources. The doors whispered open to development too, and Phil led the way around work tables. You have to check in. Phil leaned on his station. I flashed my wrist at the sensor embedded in the side of the table. Nick Granger, transition to Dev 2, mentor Phil Klein. And it was official. But no, the lady's voice wasn't done. Four minutes late to shift, released at 1824. You could try getting here on time, Phil said. You know how the whole arrive late more than once, stay even later things works, right? He smirked. People said Phil tried to find reasons to bother people. True story. I made a face at the tall man, irritated that I had to practically break my neck to look him in the eyes. So instead, I quickly took in the workstation. Two actualizer printing machines with scanning portals, and several reader attachments. Configuration consoles. I assumed that was how you fine-tuned the prototypes and components that Dev2 built. Phil lectured at me for a few minutes, and then we got to work. At first, using the actualizer machines was Blaze, almost as great as building the powered cycle with Roger. Once you loaded the design the people in Dev1 sent, you had to set parameters, and then you could watch the machines build the components, molecular layer by molecular layer. But that wasn't designing or building, and it got old fast. And so did Phil's general bugginess. I hear you're late a lot. How come? Phil turned back to the larger of the two actualizers at our station. Cycle breakdown? Or maybe it was a girl? He could stuff it. Spam. I felt my heart rate slowing. Let's just do the work. You're the boss. Phil snorted. <laughs> no, wait, that's me. I glared at his profile. Even if I wasn't faster than the enforcers, I knew I'd beat Phil in a race. He was obviously like way too many of the people in New Frisco, who took the better calm than dead motto seriously and accepted the scary bug statistics as total truth, keeping their heart rates under 100 all the time. They let their papas lead them by the wrist, making all their choices about where to be at what time and whether they should walk or ride their cycles and how much time they should spend playing bounce-a-walk. Add to that the fact that all the kids my age had to sit in boring classes take the track we were told to, and walk around the school dome at the exact same pace as everyone else. Even when I was done with school, I'd still have to eat exactly what the central computer told me to eat, wear the exact same gray clothes, and... and all because of the total dreck that the admin spewed. The bug is still in the air. 
If your heart rate goes over 140, you're in the danger zone. Better safe than sorry, better calm than dead. But after everything I'd found, I knew it couldn't be possible anymore. A killer biotoxin couldn't still be in the air after a hundred years, no matter what the admin said. The question was why the admins and the prime administrator kept saying the bug was still around, and why people believed them. Unless it somehow was possible. My stomach flipped again. No, I'm right. I'm positive. Frag it. I needed to concentrate, or I'd end up having to stay in my station even longer. I didn't have time for that. See, you have to double and sometimes triple check your parameters and specs, Phil said. Otherwise, we waste raw material, and that gets logged on my record, which we can't have. I fought the urge to make a remark about the difficulty of tapping buttons on a hollow pad as compared to building a power-optimizing propulsion unit. This wasn't a good time to get in more trouble. I leaned toward the actualizer and began the process of checking inputs again. Chapter 3 at 1840, I emerged from the engineering dome, imagining my hands around Phil's scrawny, irritating neck. The guy obviously had it in for me. Every time I got part way through a job, he'd poked his pointy chin in front of me and told me my parameters were off, meaning I'd had to spend extra time finishing the last prototype, even after foolish Phil was gone. I glanced around. A few people made their way down the sidewalk toward the center of town, while two other guys peddled their cycles the other direction, toward the residential districts. A future of flat, powerless boredom stretched in front of me like the plain beige sidewalk material that surrounded me. This was living? I scanned the domes that made up so much of this district of New Frisco. They were essentially huge rectangles with tall domes for ceilings identical except for the color of the stripes on their walls. The engineering dome was orange. The med dome had red stripes. Unsurprisingly, the ag dome had green stripes. Their unique colors glowed softly in the setting sun. Checking to make sure nobody was around, I walked to the right, toward my cycle, and into the blind spot of the cameras on the neighboring domes. I reached into my pants pocket and pulled the extending wire out of the ancient file reader, quickly threading it under my zip and yanking it up through the collar. An enforcer turned the corner on patrol, walking right toward me. I nearly swallowed my tongue. My right hand was still at the top of my collar, gripping the wire. I walked toward my cycle, scratching my neck with my right hand. Should I yawn? Whistle? I was an idiot. I bent and flashed my papa at the rack, unlocking my cycle. My heart thudded loudly enough for people in the nearby buildings to hear it. The enforcer walked by, not paying me any attention. The tension in my chest eased up, and I quickly fitted the tiny plug at the end of the wire into the slot I'd customized into my earcom. I tapped my pocket and got on my cycle. The exposed wire between my collar and ear was skinny enough that nobody should notice it if I kept moving. After a moment of pedaling, the illegal sound of music filled my ear. Along with the electrical instruments was a woman singing in a language I didn't know. The woman's voice filled me with some kind of longing I only felt when I listened to this file. I had no idea what the words meant, but it seemed like she was singing about frustration a wished-for happiness, and everything that should have been better about the world. I made my way up the first hill on my way home, which ran along the northwest edge of Purple Res. I pedaled quickly, needing to get home and to get my homework done before dinner so I could keep my evening free. Nick, you're a fragging bug-eater! Bren's voice came through my earbud, automatically softened so it wasn't loud enough to damage. I laughed and tapped the file reader lightly, stopping the music. Well, Bren, you're a tech-challenged spam bot who cries when the knockout hits. I imagined the mic in my earbud sucking the words out of me. I didn't even have to speak very loud for it to pick up my voice. The thing was so sensitive, it captured the sound directly from my throat. At least I know how to win a cycle race. Because you cheat. I don't cheat. I'll show you to... Whatever, spam boy. I cut him off. He couldn't mention tonight. Everyone knew the frequencies were monitored. 
A moment of silence passed. Then Bren got it. Like I was saying, I'll show you tomorrow. I'll even give you a head start. I don't need it. I pedaled my cycle down the road toward my house. Yeah, we'll see. I'll come by later? Yep. I let the silence draw out for a moment before tapping my music back on. The music washed over me. I'd never understood why this kind of thing was illegal. There was nothing destructive about the most beautiful voice I'd ever heard. All that spam about the decadence of the pre-infection world, how all the media was depraved, and how music and art were simply outlets for man's base or nature. How could that be true of this music? I still couldn't believe it had already been two years since I'd found the reader. I had left Hope Park on a dare from Bren. I stepped out into the grassy hills beyond New Frisco, knowing that the cameras and my papa would send an enforcer after me. But I only had to stay out for 85 seconds, and I would break Bren's record. Even though I knew other kids did it, at first I thought some animal would attack me within seconds. But all that happened was that I smelled real grass, not the oxy grass that covered yards all over New Frisco. I wandered for just over a minute, loving the feel of the shrubs and trees and grass. I was kicking at the dirt under a tall tree root when I caught sight of a small blue case. I grabbed the case, knowing right away that I'd be in huge trouble if I didn't turn it in. But something in it rattled, so I pried it open. An old plastic pen and the wafer-thin reader were all it held. Of course, I hadn't known it was a reader at the time. I stowed the case in my zip pocket and ran back to Bren and our families. That had been the first of many times that I'd left Hope Park and explored the world outside New Frisco. Those explorations usually lasted only two or so minutes, since I didn't want to get in trouble, but I had found I could cover a lot of ground if I moved fast. I'd only found one other interesting thing in my brief explorations. I'd been jogging slowly, pushing my heart rate to around 130. I wanted to go past a tall, tree-covered hill that was maybe 200 meters away from the park's edge. On the other side of the hill, in a deep, rocky pit surrounded by tall, powerful-looking trees, I found a big, dark splotch. On closer investigation, I discovered it was the remnants of a huge, ancient fire. I dug through it with a stick I found nearby and surprised myself by finding a tight bundle of papers. When I poked at it, the bundle fell apart and a flash of white caught my eye. It took some doing, but I finally got the white paper and realized I had found a few pages from a pre-infection book of some kind. Images caked the pages, photographs of people who looked really strange. The quality of the pictures was degraded, of course, but their features were so perfect that they looked artificial, and their skin was so pale that they looked like they had to be wearing paint. Nobody I knew had skin that color. Intrigued, I stuffed the few pages under my zip and ran back to the park certain I'd meet a group of enforcers. But when I got back, my papa told me I'd been gone for only three minutes. Months passed of carefully cleaning the reader and pouring through the ancient pages, during which I felt like I was immersed in the old world. I considered asking my classmates if they'd ever gone out and found something, but too many of them seemed too eager to follow the rules. They'd probably turn me in. But I was sure there were others, maybe even some adults, who had been able to slip out of the city for a couple of minutes and found things. Not that it mattered. I'd never find out who those others might be. Enforcers took their name seriously when it came to enforcing the rules of the new chapter. After hitting a dead end at home, I'd snuck the ancient reader to the engineering dome to dissect it a little when nobody was watching. It was there that I discovered the processor in the reader, analyzed the contents of the hard drive, and found some digital media packets. It had taken more months to rig up an analog connection between my earcom and the reader. I didn't want a wireless connection, not in the always monitored world of New Frisco. One night, in my room, maybe four months ago, I finally heard the one uncorrupted sound packet on the reader. That night, my room felt small, my bed uncomfortable. I worried the enforcers were going to somehow find out and come and take my new treasure. Maybe they would even take me, and I would disappear like Teacher Harris— and the others we sometimes heard about in quiet whispers. So, I never told anyone about the song or the magazine pages, or anything else. I wasn't going to become a quiet whisper. I coasted along the road that marked the border between the downtown district and the residential areas. 
Nope. Tonight I would make sure of that. I might even become a shout. Chapter 4 We've been hearing about your work in the engineering dome. My dad spooned some fruit soup into his mouth, dropping some onto his chin. He didn't notice. Mom's hand appeared, dabbing at the spot with her napkin. He gave her a smile. She gave the same smile back. Ugh, even the napkins were gray. Boring, easy to keep clean, totally practical. They say your ability with new tech is precocious, Mom said. She swallowed a bite of protein paste. The paste was gray, too. I snorted. Isn't precocious a word you use with little kids? Like babies? Sometimes I wondered if Mom and Dad ever actually came home from their jobs at the nursery. Technically, Mom said, but you'll always be my baby. She made a ridiculous face at me. Then she and Dad looked at each other, my dad offering Mom a small smile. I knew they were thinking about four years ago. That night, I'd tried to forget. Of course, I knew they worked in the nursery, giving so much to the babies there because they had wanted my sister so badly. I'd been excited about having a sibling, too, even though a sister wasn't as cool as a brother. Mom had gotten pregnant despite the meds telling her that some condition she'd developed would keep her from having her second child. Everything had gone amazingly until six months into the pregnancy. I would never forget Dad's face when he showed up late that night. He looked like his entire world had been broken. He'd spent all of five minutes at home before riding his cycle back to the hospital. Mom had tried to put on a strong face when I saw her at the hospital the next day, but I could see her broken heart through her eyes when she cried. I was still ashamed of how much I cried, too. But they were good in the nursery, caring for the little kids too young to be exposed to a world with a supposed biotoxin in the air. In any case, Dad said, looks like the algorithms are placing you in the engineering track for level eight. I poked at the gray paste on my partitioned tray, fighting the excitement that boiled in me. I loved tech, but it would be better if I could choose that track instead of a computer. I used my spoon to cut a canal in the paste. We'd learned about the concentrated, perfectly balanced, nutritive stuff in school at the same time that the teachers ragged on the old fast food and restaurants that used to be everywhere. This paste was thick, gray, and apparently perfect food, except it tasted like sadness. Engineering's a good track, Nick, Dad said. The selection algorithms never go wrong. They got us right, Mom said. I swallowed my protests about not being able to choose the job I would do for the rest of my life. My mom and dad loved what they did, and I'd never heard them complain about anything related to their job or life. But everybody knew that pre-infection couples chose who they would marry, out of love. I watched my mom and dad, seeing how calm and satisfied they seemed. Dad was always easygoing. He smiled easily and listened to me when I complained. Today, when I had gotten home, he'd noticed my frustration right away. Even from the living room, he could still tell when I left my shoes on the floor and didn't put them away, a habit I'd picked up from Bren. Dad and Mom had been playing some kind of game with hollow cards. They'd tried to explain gin to me before, but I'd gotten bored after they'd talked about how many cards you hold in your hand. Dad had stopped to listen to my story about the cycle and being transferred to Phil, but he'd taken it all calmly. He'd even tried to tell me that I'd learned something from Phil. Now, at dinner, watching Mom and Dad eating the protein paste and other nutritives, I wondered how my life would have been different a hundred years ago. The new chapter was all about efficiency, even down to the new spelling rules. The stuff I'd seen about the pre-infection times painted a world that was a lot more complicated, that allowed people to do what they wanted. It might not have been efficient, but I thought it would have been a great time to live. And die, of course. The bug had killed a lot of happy, inefficient people. Over 90% of all humans had died, and that was followed by a couple of years of radical change, which led to the new chapter, and the papa with its knockout, the savior and slave master of humanity. You'll enjoy engineering. Dad wiped his napkin across his face, dropping it onto his tray. You got these? He pointed at the food trays with his chin. Yeah. He went to the living room, and Mom followed him. The truth was that I was good with tech, 
really good at it, but it burned to not be able to choose anything. Who knew? Maybe I'd been placed in a class with people that some algorithm had said I would become friends with. Maybe it had already decided who I was going to marry. No, the algorithm couldn't possibly make us talk to each other. I was picking my friends. If I got lucky, the algorithm might at least pick a girl I knew for me to marry. If I got lucky... Hey, Bren's coming over in a bit. That's fine, Mom called over her shoulder. Don't forget curfew. Like I could. As I grabbed the trays and took them to the food jenny, the machine that delivered all of our meals, I heard the screen on the living room wall come to life. Speakers' voices discussed the news and business of the day while I scraped the tiny remnants of dinner off the trays into the tube that carried away leftover food and recycled it. I waited, hoping the computerized system wouldn't make a note of too much food being left uneaten. It had done that before. Optimal heart health requires all proteins and other nutrients to be consumed, the stupid thing had said. I'd had to get another helping of the bland paste from the Jenny. If I had lived a hundred or more years ago, I could have tasted those hamburger things and french fries. But I wasn't sure what French meant. I knew frying was an old way to cook things, but I'd never heard the word French outside of one of the ancient pages I had found. Setting the trays in the jenny, I hit the button and the shiny steel door slid down. The jenny hummed as it carried the trays to the sanitization plant. I sat with my parents for as long as I could stand the fake good looks of the speakers and their oily voices. After a little while, I left the living room with a quick glance back at my parents, who were laughing at something a speaker had said. They seemed happy, even though they hadn't chosen anything about their lives. Some algorithm in the matching system had paired them up. They lived according to the rules and never complained about the papas. As the papas instructed, Mom and Dad played bounce-a-walk three times every week bouncing and catching those ridiculous blue balls with every step. They went to work, watched the screens, and just let their lives go on calmly under someone else's control, believing everything the admins and speakers preached to them. They believed the bug was still in the air, even though it couldn't possibly still be around, according to the information in our textbooks about toxins and bacteria. They even laughed and repeated the new chapter's motto at the end of every broadcast, Better safe than sorry, better calm than dead. They seemed happy. Maybe I was asking for too much. The gray walls of the house felt like they were closing in on me. They were the exact same color as the clothes everyone wore. It's not asking too much to be able to choose something, I said to myself, stepping into my room, or to have some fun that doesn't involve walking and bouncing a blue rubber ball. I sat at my desk, my zip hanging from the chair, and took the earcom out of my ear. I lifted my vid goggles to my eyes, letting the earbuds built into the vid goggle straps slide into my ears. But it is asking too much to believe all that spam about the bug. Only the adults I knew really believed the bug was still around. But nobody I knew was brave enough to test that idea by stopping the knockout. Not until tonight, at least. I checked my papa. It was early yet. The front door of the house announced Bren's arrival. Hey, he said, walking in my room a minute later. I grinned. Bren. Duh. Brenda. He shook his head. Doc, your jokes are drack, he scanned my room. What are we doing? I slid the old reader out of its hiding place in the drawer of my desk. A month ago, at this desk, I'd found a minuscule portion of a video file that hadn't been corrupted. I'd had to tinker with my vid goggles so they could convert the file format, but that hadn't been too hard. Did you bring your vid goggles? I held the reader up so he could see it. Of course! Bren slid his own modified goggles out of his pocket. We sat on my bed and connected both of our goggles to the reader through the jacks I'd rigged, and I tapped the reader. I heard Bren suck in a breath and hold it. I realized I was doing the same thing. No matter how many times we saw it, the short clip was amazing. Lines flashed in the hollow lenses of the vid goggles, fuzzy sound filling my head. A few seconds passed. An image materialized of a man, a metal weapon in his hand, sliding across a blue car. I drank in the sights of what had to be part of a pre-infection recording. Loud explosions burst in my ears. 
fire and bullets flying everywhere. Those cars are huge, Bren muttered. Yeah, the buildings are all square and stuff, too. We watched the cars, scanned the streets, ate up the sight of people running on ancient concrete. Had it hurt to run on something so hard? Had ankles gotten broken all the time? And the man's weapon? Based on other things I'd read and heard, I guessed it was what they used to call a gun. The clip ended abruptly. I looked at Bren through the goggles. Do you think those guns were as bad as keepers? He shrugged. All I know is I never want to have anyone shoot anything at me. Yeah, pretty much. We both laughed. I tapped the reader, and the clip played again. The old building stood tall and irregular, giving the sky a jagged appearance. Explosions, the man firing his tiny gun, which was so much smaller than an enforcer's keeper, glass shattering, screaming, then over. I played it again, or at least I tried to. After the lines flashed, the image on my vid goggles went dark. I tapped the reader. Make it go, Doc, Bren said. Make it go, seriously? I picked up the reader and scanned it. It didn't look broken. I tapped it again, still nothing. I gave Bren a mocking glare. What am I, a doctor of tech? Something like that. Heal it, Bren laughed. Lots of kids use doc with their friends as a short for doctor, because doctors had saved humanity. I thought it was kind of silly. What if mechanics had saved people? Would we say mech? I lowered my vid goggles, looking closer at the reader. What was wrong with this thing? Just one more time. I wanted to get a closer look at the stores to see what they were selling. I waited for a moment and tried tapping it again. Nothing happened. Battery must be dead. I elbowed Bren. Can't bring it back without charging it. Can't bring the video back without charging it at the engineering dome. That would be tricky, again, but that was fine. Spam. Bren took his goggles off and folded them. I gotta kill at least another thirty minutes. Jan had her friends over again. At the mention of his sister, her face flashed in my mind and I tried not to blush. Jan was a year younger than us and sometimes a little gigglier than I could sit through, but I'd had a nice conversation or two with her about propulsion and gravity fields. When it was just the two of us, her sense of humor got a lot sharper, too. I forced a goofy grin at Bren. You didn't want to talk about cycles and boys? Why are girls like that anyway, I thought. Boys in cycles, every time you get two or more of them together. I know, Bren said, rolling his eyes. And what's the point, anyway? Algorithms choose who you marry. He got kind of a dejected look on his face. I tried to ignore the warmth in my chest as I remembered laughing with his sister about a dumb mistake someone had made in the engineering dome. He was right. What was the point, anyway? I checked the time. He had to go. I kicked him out, quietly reminding him to be careful sneaking out later. Don't worry, Doc, Bren said, and he headed home. I popped my ear comm back in and touched the right front corner of my desk, activating the screen and keyboard in my desktop. I IM'd some friends, but not the people I would be meeting tonight. I spent the next hour messaging and then chatted with Bren through my ear comm, figuring we usually talked about this time. And if the frequencies were monitored, we didn't want to do anything unusual tonight. Hey, I said. Mr. Nicholas, I rolled my eyes. Mr. Brenkulus. That's ridiculous, Bren laughed. No, it's Rebrenkulus. We both burst into laughter. Good one, Bren said, as usual. So, Bren said after a minute, I didn't ask earlier, how was your paste? Pasty. Pastolus? He knew I hated this stuff. Let it go, Nick. We fell silent, unable to think of something to talk about with tonight looming over us. You ever wonder what an apple tastes like? Bren asked. Every day. Frag it, Bren said. A light click sounded. Paul, any guess what apples taste like? I waited for Paul to respond. He was one of the group of pushers and probably the smartest person I'd ever met. Smarter than Roger, even. Only silence came over the ear comm. Must be fiddling around on that work table of his, I said. Yeah, maybe he even took out his ear comm so he wouldn't be interrupted, Bren said. Another click sounded, and I heard Bren whisper Connor's name. Then, Connor, you there? Yup. Connor's quiet voice slid into my ear. We're talking about apples, Bren said. Yeah. What do you think sweet stuff tastes like, I asked. Who cares? 
It's a word for something we don't have anymore, so it's stupid and I need something to eat. Brandon and I broke out in laughter again. Connor never thought about anything but food. The poor kid never got enough. He even snuck other kids' protein paste sometimes. Through his laughter, Bren shot back, You could always eat your parents. Bren, that's disgusting, I said. The three of us chatted a little more, me venting at them about my transition from Roger to foolish Phil. After a while, we ran out of things to talk about. Besides, 2230 was coming fast. Our earcoms went silent, but we all knew we would see each other later tonight. I checked the time on my papa. My homework was done, so I still had a few hours to kill. Grabbing my zip from the chair, I dug into the pocket, found my old glue wad, and squeezed it between my papa and my wrist. For a lot of reasons, I didn't want the 2230 knockout that everyone in New Frisco got. If I got the knockout, I'd for sure sleep through the meetup tonight. Also, I hadn't had the nightly knockout for months. It had been a matter of sliding something skin-like between the papa and my wrist, so that the tiny needle didn't break the skin. I had used a thin wad of glue the first time I tried. I'd experimented with lots of other things since then, like flattened bread and even cloth. The bread just crumbled, and the cloth wasn't skin-like enough, and had gotten me sent to the dumps for a week. The glue worked best, because it absorbed the tiny injection. Once I'd figured out how to block that tiny injection, and I could stay up as late as I wanted, I hadn't used the nightly knockout at all. It was a little victory, but I'd take it. The meeting was still a few hours off, so I lay on my bed, flicked my left wrist, and queued up a preloaded hollow, projecting for my papa. I tapped a spot on the papa's band and slid my vid goggles back on. A hollow image appeared about 20 centimeters away from the goggles, nearly on my chest. I lifted my hands to the hollow image and fired the game up. Chapter 5 my heart pumped at around 75 beats per minute. My papa wasn't reading it, but I knew my own heartbeat. A little high, but I had it under control. I took a slow breath and sat up, pulling out the skinny glue wad between my papa and my skin. I'd be putting the new one in at the meetup before the big test. I tossed the used wad of glue into the small trash chute next to my desk. I felt like a faker. In my head, I knew the bug was gone. I preached that to my pusher friends, but what did brave old Nick Ranger do? I still used the knockout as insurance. Sure, I hadn't needed it in months, but I had never deliberately blocked the knockout until my heart rate was down to 120. I'd never pushed my heart rate anywhere near 140 with the glue blocking the knockout. Not that the knockout was fun. My last experience with an unscheduled knockout still burned. I'd thought I could keep my heart rate under the 140 threshold, but lost focus as I got to the classroom door. The exact wrong moment. Running in late and falling over the moment you got to class tended to make every kid in level 6 laugh at you. And if you ended up with a long red line on your forehead from where you'd hit the door on your way down, that didn't help. Stupid knockout. Although, that was also how I'd become friends with Bren. Until then, he'd just always been some kid in the same level as me. But that day I woke up and he was propping me up at my desk. What are you doing? I'd asked. Trying to help you not get another bruise like that, Bren said, pointing at my forehead. Like what? Bren traced a line on his forehead. Like the one that the doorway gave you when you hit it? He was smiling, but not laughing at me. Why? Because two lines would make you look really, really stupid? He raised his eyebrows and his mouth quirked in a silly grin. I had to laugh. Stupider than getting hit by the knockout right when I was walking into the classroom? Running. Bren corrected. Okay, more like falling, and yes. We both laughed and became best friends. Bren was the first person I'd told about pushing. How I'd been late, pushed my heart rate up to 135 and kept it there, and the rush I'd felt afterward. So pushing had been born. Some of my friends and I, along with others who sometimes showed up, met every couple of days between school and our shifts in the domes. The clock on my nightstand told me it was 0100. The entire city would be asleep now. Well, not quite. I imagined everyone in New Frisco falling asleep at the exact same time every night. Like programmed sheep. Sure, it was convenient, and everybody got plenty of rest, but it felt like just another way the new chapter controlled us. Pointless control, too. I hated that. My glue wad gave me back some control. 
A little while after my 14th birthday, I'd figured out how it could stop the nightly knockout without the admins finding out. The fun didn't last long since I was the only one I knew who was awake, so I had started trying to figure out how to block the tracker in my papa. I knew the tracker had to be using a radio frequency, so it had been a matter of lots of experiments to find the correct polymer mix of plasteel and charge it exactly right to block the signal. I dug the shallow plasteel cup out from under my bed, slid it over the top of the papa's face, and pushed it down until it was snug. I'd made one for Bran and the others who had agreed to meet me tonight. We could get out of our houses, do the experiment, and get home, all without anyone knowing we were gone. As far as the admins would know, our signals would have faded out for a little while. That had to happen all the time due to interference. Just as long as anybody monitoring the housing districts didn't know we had left our houses. That was all that mattered. Oh, and not dying from the bug. No, I thought, I'm not wrong. I'd seen the signs of other people outside the city. Rumors of the wanderers had always existed, and I knew I'd seen a trace or two of them. A piece of non-gray, non-ancient cloth hanging from a bush. The smell of a recent fire. Wanderers didn't have papas. No papa, no knockout. And without the knockout, there was no way they could survive if the bug were still in the air. It was like when I opened a piece of tech and immediately knew what each component did. I knew I was right. The bug had to be gone. The admins, the speakers, the prime administrator, they were all lying to us to keep us under control, to keep us from making the same mistakes humans had made years ago. Bren had pointed out the regular news reports about people still dying of the bug. People who somehow avoided the knockout and recklessly allowed their heart rates to pass the safe threshold. He had doubted the bug was still around, but he wasn't sure until I laid it all out. We lived a hundred years later. Biotoxins couldn't still be in the air after so long. Everyone was pretty sure the wanderers were real, and they didn't have papas to protect them. And somehow more people didn't suspect that. Didn't hate life in New Frisco. All over the new chapter, the surviving five or so percent of humanity lived in such fear, a hundred years later, that they just accepted what the admins and the papas said. I slid a finger under my papa and yanked. Nope. Stuck like always. Nobody I knew had ever gotten the thing off, but I'd heard that if you managed to get it off, the enforcers would track you down and do something pretty awful to you. I sat on my bed, the smart foam firming up under me as my weight moved. Taking a moment to collect my thoughts, I breathed steadily, willing my heart to slow a little. I sat for a moment, wondering if I should have talked about tonight's plan with my mom or dad. If my plan went wrong. If me and my friends were totally wrong. No, no, I was right. But mom and dad followed the rules. Happily. They might even report me to the enforcers themselves. And if I died, my parents... Could I do that to them? Man, that would break my mom for sure. I looked around my room, feeling the weight of the plasteel walls and grayness. My gut clenched. I had to prove it was all lies. This life was so... wrong. More than wrong. Fake. Artificial. No humans had ever lived like this, and they'd been fine. Yeah, up until the bug had killed something like seven billion people. But the old way of living couldn't have actually created the bug. That didn't make sense. Maybe when tonight worked, we could change things. Have music again. Or films. If this worked, no, when this worked, I was going to be a hero. I realized I was stalling. I gripped my bed and blew out a lung full of air. I slipped my feet into my shoes and stood, the loose smart fabric tightening automatically around my foot. Grabbing my zip and pushing my arms through the sleeves, I crept to my door. I'd read that pre-infection houses had windows that opened. If the windows in my room opened like those old ones, I could have slipped out the window and climbed down the tree next to our house. But no. Yet another restriction in the interest of our safety. I cracked my door, stopping to listen for a few seconds. Total silence. I pulled my zip closed and dropped the hood over my head while I crept down the hallway and stairs toward the front door. The gentle walking that the phys ed teachers taught us from a young age was surprisingly useful when I wanted to be sneaky. I pictured the metal car in the video clip I'd seen. Driving one of those everywhere must have been incredible. Focus. 
I had to focus. First, I had to make it out of the talkative front door. There was a sensor in the doorframe that kept track of our comings and goings, but I was smarter than the smart house. I'd found the sensor in the top hinge. When the door opened, a connection broke and the sensor activated. Supposedly, it was to allow the house to greet us when we arrived and say goodbye when we left. I didn't know if there was an admin in some office somewhere who monitored these sensors, but I did know that I didn't want my idiot house to announce when I was leaving. Luckily, whoever designed the sensor thought everyone was an idiot, or it wasn't meant to be security tech. Fooling the thing involved sliding a thin magnetic strip into the hinge so that when you opened the door, the connection never broke. The only problem was that my magnetic strip didn't keep its magnetic properties very long. I reached into my zip pocket, finding the thin strip. I held it to a lower hinge to test it. Bug, it didn't stay on its own. I crept to the kitchen to fix my little piece of metal. I had to hurry. My friends would be waiting. In the kitchen, I tiptoed to the food jenny and held the metal strip against the side of its steel door, right next to the powered actuator. I carefully slid the strip down the door, feeling the actuator's gentle vibration in my fingers. When I got to the bottom, I lifted the strip from the door and then slid it down again. It made a soft rasping sound. I repeated the action several more times, hoping to speed up the work of the magnetic coil in the actuator. After a couple of minutes, the strip stuck to the metal door on its own. A moment later, I slipped my sliver of magnetized metal into place in the top hinge of my house's front door, making a mental note to grab it when I came home. I closed the door behind me and glanced around, seeking any sign of movement on the street or behind any windows. Pale blue streetlights lit the long street, making the leaves on the two trees in each yard look almost white and casting shadows everywhere. Every light in every identical house was out. I had to get to Hope Park. I glanced at the metal cup covering my papa's face. This would work. I swallowed hard and told myself to quit stalling. My cycle leaned in its slot to the right of the door, metal spokes on the wheels gleaming in the spill of light from the street lamps. The cycle stand was on a concrete pad surrounded by the oxygrass that covered the space in front of our house. I held my papa close to the sensor on my cycle's handlebars. A click sounded softly, unlocking the cycle. Good. The metal interference cup still let me use my papa close up. Hopefully, it blocked the signal from the trackers. I spun the cycle around and pedaled down the road, headed east. I rode past several streets that branched off from mine. Fox 10? Fox 9? I whispered, naming the side streets as I zipped past them. Nerves made my stomach clench. My heart picked up the pace as I increased my speed. I was definitely in the mid-90s now. I forced myself to relax. This would work. I wished I could chat with Bren through the earcom. Without looking at the papa, I whispered, Now. The three-toned warning sounded muffled under the metal cup. It wanted me to spend more time warming up. My heart rate was rising too fast. This was true. I took a few steady breaths as I pedaled. I needed to get to the park without getting the knockout. My cycle's speed suppressor engaged, startling me. I hadn't realized how fast I was going. Even my bugging bike was trying to control me. Frag it! I kept my voice down. I should have done this before. I stopped the cycle with a few thumb taps on the brake button. In one movement, I kicked the stand lever with my heel and jumped off. The pneumatic feet deployed swiftly and quietly. By the time they held the cycle up, I had nearly removed the external casing of the tiny box attached to the main stem of the cycle. Using my pinky nail, I poked around for a minute and then, finding the tiny suppressor chip, slid it slightly out of its slot with a well-practiced movement. No more speed suppressor slowing me down. I jumped back on the cycle and got going, wanting to hit the hill and get up it without the cycle's kinetic motor kicking in and helping me out. I urged my legs to move faster enjoying the sensation of my ankle joints smoothly swiveling with each revolution of the pedals. I felt like a machine, unstoppable and tireless. 
I guessed I was going at least twenty kilometers per hour by the time I started up the low hill that marked the northeast end of Green Res, the residential sector I lived in. My papa beeped again, one long beep and two short ones. This one meant my pulse had just hit one hundred. I ignored it, knowing I could make it up the small hill without pushing my heartbeat much faster than one twenty, as long as I kept breathing easily. The alert came one more time before I crested the hill. That meant I'd hit 115 and was, according to my wrist dad, approaching the danger zone. Shut up, I whispered, tapping the cycle to a halt at the top of the hill. I didn't need a computer to tell me how to live. I didn't even need it to tell me my pulse. Nobody I knew needed their papas for that anymore. We had grown up with these things constantly alerting us, so we just had to stop and pay attention for a half second, and we could tell our pulse. It was, well, in our blood. I scanned Purple Res, which was laid out right in front of me. Hope Park lined the east edge of Purple Res. Nothing moved. No. Wait. A few streets down, I saw what looked like someone on a cycle. Purple Res was the resident sector just north of Green Res, and was where Bren lived. I pedaled hard, wanting to catch up to him. I zipped down the hill, crouching low over my handlebars. I savored the wind in my face, the air whistling through my ears. I could almost feel my blood pumping faster through my veins. This was going to be a very uncalm night. Calm. I imagined the day that the bug had hit, the day of the infection. Thousands of joggers and weightlifters and others had fallen down dead in gyms and on roads all over the world, their healthy hearts passing the 140 beats per minute barrier, allowing the bug to infiltrate their cardiovascular systems and kill them almost instantly. Teachers had been telling us for years that we had never really been sure of what it was about the higher heart rate. There were theories that some kind of protein or other chemical was released when the heart hit a certain speed, which of course depended on each person, but the fact was that nobody had ever really been sure. I had trouble believing that, but Bren always called me paranoid and delusional. Maybe he was right, but it was hard to believe we hadn't figured out everything about the bug. It had killed billions of people. Cities all around the world had been devastated. The only cure had been to keep everybody calm and impose 140 beats per minute as the maximum safe threshold. Of course, everyone was a little different, but the scientists had estimated that the vulnerable range began at 140 and ended at 150 at the most. But the doctors had only figured that out after millions, billions of people had died, buried in shallow graves all around the planet, or burned in massive bonfires. Maybe there were still big piles of human ashes in addition to piles of old burned books and magazines. An image of countless pillars of bug-infested smoke billowing into an atmosphere high above flashed behind my eyes. I shook the image away. Ninety-plus percent of humanity had died. But that was old news. Those people were long gone. And so was the bug. It had to be gone. Questions and doubts surged. I forced them down. Time to prove it. Chapter 6 I only caught up to Bren when he was a street away from Hope Park. Off the cycle! I pitched my voice low. Bren's head whipped around, fear on his face, and I burst out laughing. I pulled up alongside him. Bug eater! Bren swung at me, and I swerved. You just about killed me! Baby, I said. He slowed as we got closer to Hope Park. We both looked around, listening for the sound of enforcer pods. At the same moment, we glanced at our covered papas. Bren lifted his left wrist, indicating the metal cup. These better work! They'll work. I tapped my brake sensor. We were almost there. And you're a bug eater. Shut up! He grinned at me, waiting. I jumped off my cycle at the edge of Hope Park's oxygrass. You're a spammer. I pretended to look down my nose at him. Besides, if the interference cups weren't working, we'd be in big trouble already. All right, all right. Bren pushed off his cycle. He looked at me through the dim light. Seriously, though, are you sure about this? What if it's still here? Totally impossible. I felt the truth of those two words. 
the fear in my gut eased. But why do they say it is? Bren snorted. Shut up. I know. Control. But why? I thought about his question. We'd been over this a lot, but I didn't mind thinking it through again. It's just a guess, but maybe someone just likes power. Or they think this is better for humanity. Either way, they're wrong. But people are fine, and we're alive. I caught sight of the others, standing in a cluster under some trees. We pushed our cycles through the thick, uniform oxygrass. True, unless you define alive as actually having a life. We kept walking. Nobody heard you go out, right? Bren laughed. Doc! I almost woke Jen up as I was leaving. I peered at him through the darkness. Not good, Bren. I said almost, Bren said. Does she know about tonight? Jan was Melissa's friend, and Melissa was a pusher. Pretty sure Melissa didn't say anything. I nodded. Good. But the image of Jan watching me make history tonight felt kind of cool. How would she react? Maybe a soft smile. Her big eyes getting closer. My face heated up. I tried to shake it away. She'd hear soon enough. But she still might not see me as anything more than just her brother's best friend. Shoving that thought away, I headed toward the group of pushers with Bren. Everybody turned to watch us as we approached. They stood half-hidden in the shadows of the trees. I glanced at Melissa, who stood on the right of the group. I could tell her face was set in an expression of challenge. She had never believed that I was going to do this, had been calling my bluff for the entire week. She'd find out that I wasn't bluffing soon enough. Hey guys, Bren said. Everyone put the metal cup on, right? He raised his wrist. Everyone else did the same. Of course, Melissa said. You really doing this? I sometimes wondered if David was here basically to be a bug eater. He almost never pushed, but he knew Bren from human studies. David and Paul, his younger brother, had showed up at the last after-school meetup and sometimes chatted with Bren and me when we got together during lunch between classes. David struck me as a coward, so I was surprised he had the guts to game the knockout tonight and come out here. Connor and his friends, Jack and Greg, had shown up to our after-school pushing maybe two months ago with Melissa and two of her friends, Natalie and Donna. Thankfully, Jan had never come. Donna stood next to Melissa now, no Natalie. What are you looking at? I asked. Everybody was just staring at me. You, bugface, Melissa scowled at me. If you're going to do it, let's go. She checked her papa. These cups might work, but somebody's going to wonder where our signals went. I shrugged. If my stomach got any tighter, I was going to puke. Fine. Nick, Paul said. You sure about this? If you stop the knockout and push past 140, what if the bug's still here? It's not. Everyone knows that, Connor said. But what if it is, Greg said. The speakers report at least one death every month or so. Shut up, Paul grunted, elbowing Greg. It doesn't matter. Chiphead here doesn't have the guts to do it. Irritation flared, loosening my stomach. Spam! Just watch. I traded a glance with Bren nodded confidently to him, and pushed my cycle away from the group. The path that wound through the park was a slightly lighter strip of flat, tough rubber. Reaching the path, I started to get on my cycle. Hey, Bugface, Melissa said. She had followed me, and the others had followed her. Forgetting something? She held up her left wrist. No. I had been, but I wasn't going to give her the satisfaction. I reached in the pocket of my zip, and pulled out the fresh wad of glue that I had made that day. This new wad was still somewhat malleable, so it was a little harder to slide between my skin and the papa. But after a few tries, I got it. My breath caught in my throat, but I forced myself to stare everyone down. There went my safety net. I lifted my wrist, turning it and showing it off. Approved? Jack, always the guy who had to make sure rules were followed, despite the fact that he was at this very moment breaking curfew in a big way, stepped closer. He wiggled the pad of glue. It's good, he said. His officious announcement bothered me, but I ignored that. I nodded and got on my cycle. Wait, Connor said. 
How do we know you're not going to take the glue out when we can't see? Doc, Greg slapped the back of the guy's head. The glue makes the papa totally useless. It can't even read his pulse when the glue's in there. No beeping. No pulse, no knockout, David said. How do we know your heart rate's high enough? Connor asked. Simple, I said. I'll burn back here fast after getting it up high. You guys can take my pulse by hand. We'd already talked about this. They were just stalling, which I kind of didn't mind. Quit it, I thought. I'm right about this. The bug was gone. The papas weren't keeping us safe anymore. They were controlling us. But it was fun to think that maybe these guys were worried they were about to watch me die right before their eyes in a few minutes. I turned right and started pedaling. The bug is no more. I, Nick Granger, shall prove it. Pushing hard, I followed the path's twists up a small hill. The kinetic motor kicked on to help me get up the hill. The chip must have fallen back into the slot. I felt the electric motor ease the amount of pressure I had to use to move the pedals and scowled inwardly. I needed to get my heart rate up. The hill sloped downward into a popular recreation area that had a bunch of trees all around. I pedaled quickly, pushing my heart rate past 100. No warning beeps. The glue was working so far. And if it didn't stop the knockout, well, it would. It had to. I'm not about to die. I repeated that phrase in my head a few times, pedaling steadily, the wind cooling my face. I had to change this. Either way, I wasn't going to live a lifeless life, one of infinite boredom. I slowed to turn around. I took a deep breath and adjusted the wad of glue. Releasing my breath, I counted down from five. On one, I shot off, gulping air and trying to swallow it past the knot in my chest. The bug's gone, I whispered, the wind sweeping my words behind me. I hit the bottom of the hill, pumping the pedals hard and gripping the handlebars tightly, and sped up the slope. The bug's gone! My feet moved faster as the stupid kinetic motor kicked on again. I was at 120, easy, still no beeping. I hit the hill's crest, pulled up on the handlebars and got some air, and then dropped fast. The bug's gone! I shouted, exhilaration making my voice louder than I'd expected. I pedaled harder, my legs beginning to burn. My hands felt completely stuck to the grips of the handlebars. I had to be at 130 or more. It's gone. It's gone. I sang under my breath between gasps. This had to be the fastest I'd ever gone. I guessed I was going 40 kilometers per hour, at least. Swerving around a curve, I blasted past the gathered pushers right when I was certain I'd hit 140. Might as well make sure of it. My breath caught painfully in my throat and chest. Digging deeper, I pushed my cycle faster, up another hill, this one bigger. I had to have broken 140. Had to. The charge in the kinetic motor must have been at max after all this pedaling. This time, I appreciated the help getting up the hill. I hit the top of the rise, shot down, and then tapped the cycle into a near stop as I pulled it hard to the left. The back wheel screeched and fishtailed around. I was already pedaling again, back up the hill. My thighs ached, wanting to quit. The motor made things a little easier. I pushed harder. My heart pounded like the beat of the hammer machines in the engineering dome. It felt like my heart wanted to rip open my chest. Coming down the hill, I kept pedaling, even though it hurt, wanting to maintain my pulse. I felt like I must have been hitting 150 or more. My stomach was tight. I felt almost sick. Was the bug about to attack me? Everyone knew 140 was just the minimum safe threshold and that each person had their own vulnerable range. What was my range? I brought the cycle to a shuddering halt with a bunch of fast taps on the brake sensor, sliding to a stop right in front of the others. Gasping for breath, I shot my hands into the air. Bug's gone! My entire body shook from exertion. I was right! Elation filled me with energy. I wanted to shout loud enough to wake up the entire city. Melissa and Bren stepped forward, each of them grabbing a wrist. Melissa had grabbed my left wrist, so she checked to make sure the glue wad was still under my papa. Then, both of them concentrated quietly for a few seconds. Be still, Melissa said, glancing at her papa. I tried to keep my jittering body motionless. Every muscle in my body quivered as I waited for them to announce my victory. The seconds stretched. 
My heart rate slowed a little, but skipped back up when Bren spoke. Bug me, Bren whispered, his eyes wide open in shock as he stared at me. Bug me. Melissa's head shot up and she looked at me hard, then turned to the others. One sixty-five, I grinned in triumph. The bug's gone. Chapter 7 The other pushers stared at me, obviously shocked that I wasn't already beginning to twitch on the ground as the bug infected me. I wanted to shout at them, at the entire city, all of the fragged up new chapter that I'd won. I was right. I scrubbed sweat from my face, my heart still thundering in my chest, and waited for someone to say something. Jack and Greg scampered to their cycles and disappeared, pedaling like crazy. Donna took off after them. Where are they going? I asked, my breath catching a little. What the bug? But I understood before I'd finished speaking. They were terrified at what I'd just done. They obviously didn't want anything to do with this anymore. Then David grabbed Paul, trying to drag the younger boy away. No! Paul tore his arm out of his brother's grasp. No, I'm staying! No, you're not. We're out of here. David said, reaching for Paul again. Paul dodged David. I stepped forward but was grabbed by Bren. He shook his head. This was between David and Paul. Let him be, Melissa said, trying to get between them. If he wants to stay... You shut up, David's voice cracked. He's my little brother. I'm not scared, Paul backed away again. He gets to choose, Melissa said, planting herself in front of David and folding her arms. David swung at Melissa, slamming his fist into her cheek. She crumpled, her face slack in shock and pain. Paul, we are leaving, David said, lunging. You can leave if you're scared, Paul yelled, dashing toward the ravine about a hundred yards to the right. I'm not scared. David jerked to a halt, glaring at the rest of us. He was breathing heavily and his papa beeped under its cup. The cool night air felt crisp against my skin as I waited for him to make a move. Melissa jumped at him, obviously ready to get him back for his sucker punch, but Connor grabbed her. A moment later, through the darkness, I saw David's shoulders slump. He turned and trudged toward the cycles. I glanced around. Paul was running back toward us now. He must have seen David give up. Paul's papa could be heard beeping under the muffling interference cup. Aside from Paul, we still had Bren, Melissa, and Connor. We all stood staring at each other, obviously shocked that so many had decided to abandon us. Do you think they'll tell someone? Connor's gaze moved from Melissa's face to mine, to Bren's, and then back to mine. And get the enforcer's attention on them? No way. Melissa snorted an ugly laugh. They're cowards. If they came out and admitted they were involved, the punishment would be even bigger than a shift in the dumps. She sucked in a breath through her teeth. No way do they tattle. Bren snorted, but it sounded forced. He still clutched my left arm. I shook him off. I tested the glue wad, still there. I guessed my pulse was 125. I thought about taking the wad out. I realized in that moment that everything had changed. There was never a reason to let the knockout get me again. Not for the mandated bedtime. Not for a too high heart rate. The wad stayed in. Forever or at least until I figured out how to get the stupid papa off. And I had to tell someone, like an admin or my parents or something. Silence stretched between my friends and me, my mind filled with thoughts of exposing the bug for the lie that it was. But New Frisco, all of the new chapter, might not see me as a hero. What do we do now? Bren asked. Paul rejoined the group, his papa beeping loudly. We looked at each other. We have to tell everyone, I said. I didn't come out here to screw things up, Connor said. None of us did, Melissa said. But if you're going to cry about it, you should leave too. Her arms were crossed on her chest again. In the dark, I could barely make out that she was working her papa around her wrist. Shut up, Connor said. I'm not a bug eater like those guys. We have to tell everyone, I said again, seeing visions of my face on screens around the world. This is going to change it all. Everything. Nick, 
Bren said. Quit it. I tried to make out Bren's expression. What? We're not rebels or revolutionaries or anything. We just wanted to have fun. Bren shifted and gestured weakly at the remaining pushers. What if we don't want to screw the whole world up? And what if we made a mistake? It's no mistake. Bren, seriously? Melissa checked. You all saw. The bug's gone. We don't know that for sure, Connor said. No, Bren said. Nick's right. At the same time, Melissa said, It was 165. I'm sure. What do you mean, I'm right? I glared at Bren. I mean, of course I'm right, but... He means that the bug's got to be gone. There's no way it's still in the atmosphere like they've been saying. Right, Bren said. He crossed his arms and glared back at me. But that doesn't mean it's our business to go out and make a mess of everything. And maybe we don't want to. I want to! Paul practically jumped with each word. What was he, ten, eleven? We could change the whole world! I couldn't see her, but I knew Melissa had just rolled her eyes. Spam. It doesn't matter anyway. We have to get back home. I heard the wry grin in her voice. She fiddled with her papa and put her right hand in her zip pocket. There's got to be a patrol due around here soon. Okay, we can wait, Brent said. No! I wasn't going to sit through bio class again. Another two hours of Mr. Johnson's droning voice would be torture, especially now that I knew he was just lying to us. No waiting! I'm going to... It occurred to me that I had no idea what I should do to get the word out. The speakers were basically good-looking admins with special voice enhancements. And all of the grown-ups I knew, other than my parents, were teachers or doing some other kind of work for the city. Maybe one of the men in the engineering dome? Was everybody lying or did nobody know? What about the prime administrator? What about mom or dad? Neither of them had doubted the presence of the bug. But maybe they would listen. Maybe they would help get the word out. I had to tell them. That would be step one. I would tell them in the morning, or maybe even as soon as I got home. They would forgive me for sneaking out, right? Let's meet during lunch tomorrow, Connor said, already moving toward the cycles. We can all come back with some ideas and stuff. I wanted to argue, but he was right. Fine, I'll keep quiet until then. What if David doesn't let me come? Paul's voice dripped with self-pity. I had to admire the kid's spine, but I also didn't care if he didn't show up at lunch or the next time we met at night. We only did this every couple of months, so we didn't push our luck, and I didn't want to babysit. It wasn't like Paul had done anything anyway. Your problem, Bugface, Melissa said. She glanced at me and then Bren. She gave him a smile and followed Connor back to the cycles. Bren hung back, so I stayed with him. See you all tomorrow, I called. I felt deflated. The thrill of victory had faded to something like disappointment or frustration. I'd proven there was no more bug, and now nothing. The others called some yes over their shoulder and were soon pedaling away. I faced Bren. So, he said, hero much? I grinned. Well, yeah, you should worship me and stuff. He smiled back. I'll wait on that. Besides, you'll probably be too famous for me in a week or two. True. I pushed my cycle toward where his leaned against a tree. But you can stay around and, I don't know, polish my cycle? Maybe clean windows. You're a bug eater, Bren said, kicking my calf. We said nothing until we got to his cycle. That was pretty stupid, Bren mounted up. Nope. Perfectly planned and perfectly executed, with perfection. I kicked his cycle's back wheel. Spam. Bren glanced at me with a grin. I took my speed controller chip out. Then he was pedaling furiously toward the path we had just come from. Given that he was riding through oxygrass, he didn't go very fast, but he took me by surprise. So it took me a minute to catch up with him. At the path, he reached into his zip pocket. We can't have you feeling too special now, he said, showing me a thin wad of glue. My heart pounded for a moment. It had worked for me. Of course it would work for him. I bet you can't even hit 130, I said. I adjusted my knockout blocker. Frag that, Bren said. He slid the glue wad between his papa and his wrist. You know I can. He glanced over his shoulder. Want to check it, oh perfect one? Shut up. I caught him again as he rode up the path toward the hill. 
You're sure about this? Doc, you just did it. Bren pedaled faster, pulling away. Of course I am. Bren continued pulling away. He was making it a race. We crested the hill, ignoring the help the kinetic motors were giving, and screamed down the other side. 120! Bren shouted. Weak! I'm already at 130! I called. Then the only sound was the wind in my ears and the frantic spinning of our pedals and wheels. We kept following the path. It led toward our homes anyway and was easy to follow, even with the stars and half moon as the only light. One thirty minimum! Bren didn't even look back. He was faster than me, somehow naturally stronger. I hit one forty forever ago. His laughter carried easily back to me. He wasn't going to beat me. I leaned forward, keeping my butt on my seat and pumping furiously. I had to be at nearly 160 again. Still no bug. Of course. I'm there. Gotta be past it! Bren slowed a little as I caught up with him. Are you sure? Bren gasped for air. His face flushed a darker shade of gray in the light of the stars and park lamps. Yes! He pedaled harder. Where are you going? I wasn't sure he heard me over the wind rushing past. We leaned into our turns, following the winding path through groves of trees and past the edge of the huge ravine, leaving no doubt. Then we were in a real race, both of us trying to make it to Purple Res first. We zoomed past a herd of maintenance bots as we left the path, caught air, and hit the street. We both laughed. Skidding to a halt at the street that led to his home, Bren let out a whoop. I did the same, and we both burst into laughter. This was better. Better than before. We grinned at each other, trying to speak around gasps. I won, Bren said. I let you. Spam, he gulped. Had to hit at least 160. He spat into the road and heaved a huge breath. Now two of us. It was even better that the other one was Bren. Me too. He checked his papa and shook his head. The interference cup was still on. It's gotta be after two in the morning. He angled his cycle down the street. Tomorrow, he coughed, then gulped more air. Death to the bug! He rolled away. Yeah. I watched him go for a second and turned toward my home, checking that my glue wad was still protecting me from the knockout. I was never going to get the knockout again. The totally useless knockout, controller of humanity. I pedaled hard toward home. Death to being afraid of the bug. Death to the new chapter. Chapter 8 I heard Bren cough again. He had to be at least a block away. I could only hear him because there was nothing else making a sound. Another cough came. What? I tapped to a stop. I hadn't coughed at all after pushing past 140. What was wrong with Bren? A fear I didn't want to name filled me, and I spun around, hurtling to catch up with Bren. I found him stopped in the middle of the street, off his cycle and hunched over, hands on his knees. Bren! I called from halfway down the block. In the illumination of the street lamps, I saw his face turn. He coughed again. Bren? I said again, hopping off my cycle. What's going on? He tried to straighten, but ended up clutching his chest and tipping backwards until he landed on his backside. What the bug? Tingles spread across my body, fear squeezing my chest. Impossible! Bren! Panic, sour-tasting and blinding, forced me to my knees next to my friend. He wasn't coughing anymore, but was gasping. He fell back again, lying down in the middle of the street. Nick! Bren clutched his zip over his chest, his other hand reaching for me. Hurts! The street lights provided enough light for me to see that his lips were darkening, turning blue. What is it? I let myself wonder if he had asthma. Nobody ever got excited or stressed out in New Frisco, so asthma practically didn't exist, but we'd talked about it in Pathophys. An obsolete disease. Like the bug was supposed to be. Bren's body started jittering and shaking violently. He gulped as if drowning. His face looked like one of the fish in the biolab. His eyes darted to my face and to the sky, back and forth, wildly. Nick, help! I didn't know what to do. If this was the bug, it couldn't be. I'd be sick too. 
I'd have been twitching in Hope Park. The bug was gone from the atmosphere. But what else could it be? I yanked the cup off my papa and threw it down the street. Please see that I'm out here. Please. How long would it take the enforcers to notice my signal? Bren's face mottled with dark splotches as I watched him. He gagged and sat up violently. I tried to hold him down, hold him still, frantically trying to figure out what to do. Bren puked. My arms were splattered as his vomit cascaded down his front. He lay back, shaking more and rolling back and forth. Nick! I met Bren's eyes for a moment, and then he looked away again. It was as if his eyes couldn't stay still, like he was wildly searching for an escape from whatever was happening to him. Mottled face, puking, couldn't catch his breath. This sounded like the bug. I shook my papa, hoping it would make the signal faster. Come on! Help! Someone help! How could Bren have been infected with the bug, but I wasn't? Impossible. Suddenly, Bren's heels slammed again and again on the smooth street, his arms flailing uncontrollably. He was having a seizure, a bad one. If this was the bug, it was cutting off his oxygen supply and forcing his heart to beat way faster than it should. I had to do something. The knockout. His heart rate had to be higher than 140 still. I dove across Bren's body for his left wrist, missing it and ending up more covered in his mess. I tried to ignore the stink, but gagged. I swallowed, pushing myself into an awkward hop that carried me from Bren's right to his left side. This time, I got him. He moaned, and his heels slammed on the ground again. I pinned his arm between my knees and held his wrist. I knocked the metal cup off. It clanged against the road, disappearing into the darkness. I pulled the glue out and watched for the papa to register contact with Bren's skin again. It began to beep loudly, incredibly loudly, and fast. Maybe ten beeps per second. It could have been one continuous beep, it was so fast. On the papa, I watched the digits flash. Bren's heart rate was 164 and rising fast. Come on! I shouted, wishing the knockout would work faster. Would it give him more than one? If anybody was really monitoring the papas in one of the admin buildings, they might notice Bren and send help. Sick with worry, trying to deny the guilt that was building in my stomach, I reached for Bren's face. Bren, it's gonna be okay. The knockout will help. He was shaking worse now, so hard that his bones should have been splintering. Nick! Bren's voice was a croak, a sound squeezed through pain I didn't want to imagine. This couldn't be happening. This could not be happening. Bren, I'm sorry. I don't understand. My throat tightened. A sob tore through me. I didn't want to scare him worse, so I tried to keep the tears back. I failed. I'm sorry. I don't get it. This shouldn't be happening. Nick, Bren said again, going suddenly still and focusing on me. All I could see around his pupils was white. Nick, his voice was a barely audible whisper. I swallowed, trying to get control of myself. I leaned closer. Bren, it's going to be okay. Somebody will come. I'm sorry. His left hand squeezed my hands tightly, bone-crushingly. Bug! Then he screamed. His back arched up and his head slammed into the pavement of the street. It happened again, then a third time. Terrified, totally paralyzed, I watched my friend. Should I hold him down? Would my papa give him more knockout if I got it off me and onto his wrist? Stupid. Nobody could get their papas off. Bren screamed again his chest heaving. Lights went on in houses all along the street. Suddenly, he went still and totally silent. He was looking at me. I leaned forward, hoping the knockout had finally worked. Bren, it'll be... I gagged, all the strength leaving my body. The whites of his eyes were gone, replaced by dark gray. Tiny dark streams of blood rolled down his face, pooling on the pavement. His chest didn't move. I sucked in a breath, trying to hold it back, but I couldn't. I flung myself to the side and threw up. Scrubbing my face with what I hoped was a clean part of my zip, I straightened. Bren! I slid closer on my knees. Bren! He didn't move. Please! No, Bren, don't! Please! I grabbed his shoulder, shaking him. Nothing. I shouted at him, fear and grief making me jittery. I shook his shoulder again. Bren didn't move. 
What do I do? I asked the street, the night. What do I do? A memory from phys ed of how to do CPR came to me. Bren, please don't die. I'm sorry. I swallowed and got control of myself. His shirt was covered in puke. I pulled it up so I could try getting to his chest and doing CPR. You were supposed to push the chest, try to get the heart started, right? I reeled back, disbelief and guilt and horror mixing into a knot of sickness inside me. I tasted vomit, needed to throw up, needed to spit. I yelled instead. Bren's chest was... was bleeding. It was as if the blood had pushed so hard at the inside of his skin that it had finally pushed its way through his pores. Blue lines marked his veins under his skin, all over his torso. I heard doors opening down the street. What do I do? I looked left, right, all around me. Bren was gone. The knockout had been too late. He would be found. People would be here in a minute. I had to get out of here. If I stayed, I'd get in trouble. They'd think that I did it, or at least that I'd been involved. I was involved. I did do it. I couldn't run away from my best friend. I stared at Bren's face, his wide eyes. Leaning forward, I gently slid his eyes closed. Bren, I I'm sorry. So sorry. Whatever happened, I was going to stay with him. But what if I had to tell Jan? I couldn't do that. I imagined what her reaction would be if I spoke those words to her, tears falling from those blue eyes. Somebody would come, enforcers or admins. Somebody would find Bren and me, would explain this whole thing. Why had Bren gotten the bug and I hadn't? I couldn't keep up with my thoughts. My head felt heavy. This was the bug, right? I forced my thoughts into a rough order. Bren had shown every symptom of an infection from the bug. It had to be. But why wasn't I dead? Why Bren and not me? They would want to test me, find out if I was immune. They would know how Bren had avoided the knockout. They would know to ask me about it. I couldn't face that. Get away. I had to go. Had to go. I pushed myself up, wobbling for a minute. No. It was my fault he had died. I had to stay and help figure out what had happened. If, if I was immune, I could help everyone. Everyone except Bren. The high-pitched whine of an admin pod drifted through the night sky. I checked my papa. Nearly 0230. Had only an hour passed since I'd proved the bug was... But it wasn't. Bren had just proved the bug was still around. I turned slowly, feeling like my thoughts were pushing through layers of wet clothing. Lights were on in most houses down the street. People were coming out. Some of them had to have seen me. How had this night gone so bad? This is insane, I said aloud. I shook my head, trying to clear it. I forced a deep breath through my burning throat. This is wrong. Wrong. I was alive. Bren was dead. Something was very wrong. Somebody shouted. People ran my way, their shadows multiplied by the streetlights. Hey, what's going on? A woman came into view, baggy sleeping clothes waving all over as she jogged toward me. I don't know. My friend. I looked at Bren's unmoving body. I think he's dead. My throat tightened. Tears dripped down my cheeks. What are you doing out here? The woman stopped a few feet away from Bren, staring at him. Oh no, the bug. We, we were, I couldn't breathe. A man ran up. What's happening out here? It's the bug, Rob. The woman stepped closer to the man who had just arrived. He put his arm around her. What? The man took everything in. Bren's body, me standing there crying. Hey, kid, what happened? Why aren't you at home sleeping? I shook my head, unable to speak. An enforcer pod screeched to a halt a few meters above the street. Lights blazed from all over it, blinding me. Return to your homes. Return to your homes. The metallic voice rang out as the pod hovered above the street, a wide door opening in the side. The couple didn't wait around, and I saw other people who had started to come over disappear back into their houses. You, stop right there. The voice came from the first enforcer who dropped out of the hover pod. I wasn't going anywhere. Then he shot me. From one moment to the next, I was standing and then slamming onto the road, 
pain blossoming around my left shoulder. A rubber bullet. Nick Granger, you are in violation. Stop resisting detainment. The voice came from the pot again. I wasn't resisting. I rolled to my knees, confusion and pain battling it out in me. I'm not! We will use lethal force if you continue to resist. The amplified voice rang out along the street. Frag me! I stood, putting my hands up. I'm not resisting! Just help my friend! I think I'm in... I felt myself picked up a little and thrown backwards by the next rubber bullet. Then more explosions sounded, and I heard and felt more of the bullets slam into the road around me, a few hitting my chest. Pain exploded in my chest. Had they cracked my ribs? Why weren't they listening? Frantically, I scanned the area. Five enforcers were approaching. I heard the whir of the drums on their keepers. I'm not resisting! My cycle was maybe two meters away. We have no choice, Nick Granger. Bug that! I jumped at my cycle, my feet landing on the pedals, and I jetted out of there as fast as I could move my legs. Stop! Keepers fired, but I was moving fast and weaving, trying to get the cycle's pneumatic feet to go back up. I felt bullets hit the cycle, and one hit my lower back. Another fountain of pain erupted. Why were they trying to kill me? I pedaled hard, glad I still had my wad of glue in. The last thing I needed right now was the knockout. I glanced over my shoulder. The enforcer's pod door was closing. I thought I saw at least one enforcer still on the street near Bren. I had to get away or hide. Hiding was impossible. Spam! Getting away was impossible, too. I still had my papa, and I'd thrown both mine and Bren's interference cups away somewhere, so they could track me wherever I went. Fragging dreck! Somehow, I had to get the papa off. The haze and confusion burned off my brain a little as a plan began to form. There was only one place I knew that might have the tools to take it off. The admins could track me to the engineering dome, but they couldn't predict where I would go, so they would have to catch up to me, which meant I had to go fast. I put as much distance between me and the enforcer's pod as I could, flying around corners and taking as fast a route as possible to the engineering dome. I pushed hard up a hill, feeling the kinetic motor kick on near the top. It made no difference since I was already pedaling as hard as I could. My throat felt raw and red as breaths dragged in and out. I glanced back. The pod was out of sight. I heard it, though. It sounded like it was maybe a couple hundred meters away. Not far enough. I pushed hard, rounding the last corner of the residential zone and tearing through one of the downtown plazas at full speed. My breath came fast, my heart rate higher than it had ever been. Questions smacked me behind the eyes. Why had Bren died and not me? And why had the enforcers immediately acted like they were going to kill me? Another question flared bright as the sun. Was I somehow immune? That had to be a possibility. And if I was immune, there might be others out there. Others nobody had heard of. If not, if I was the only immune person on the planet... My immunity could save everyone else. My blood or whatever it was in me could help everyone else become immune. But the odds of me being the only immune person were slim. Maybe something else had happened. Chapter 9 I came to the engineering dome and leapt off my cycle, letting it fall as I ran to the door. It was locked, of course. The two sliding halves were magnetically sealed together where they met. If I had some kind of admin authority, I could just pass my papa in front of the sensor, and the doors would slide silently into the walls on either side. No problem. My running away so fast must have surprised them, and my not falling over from the knockout had to have surprised them more. I had maybe a minute, probably less. I scanned the walls of the engineering dome. A gutter pipe ran down the side of the building. It was bracketed tightly to the polymetal walls. There were skylights and vents in the top of the dome. I had seen some in Dev 5 being cleaned, so I knew they opened outward. If I could get to the roof, I could get in that way. I ran to the pipe and yanked hard. It didn't budge. I glanced up. Twenty meters is high, but in the darkness it seemed like the pipe stretched all the way up to the stars. I wrapped my fingers tightly around the pipe and put my foot on the lowest bracket, pulling hard. My foot slipped and my elbows slammed into the solid walls. 
Lances of pain shot up into my shoulders. My fingers popped free with a brief jolt of pain. Stealing myself, I tried again, gripping tighter and imagining I was a spider. This time my foot stayed. I kept my left hand tight on the pipe and slid my right up a little. I put my left foot on the next bracket, clenching as tight as I could. I pulled. Both feet slipped, and my fingers jerked painfully out from between the pipe and the wall. My left forefinger stayed stuck longer than the others, nearly staying behind permanently. I hit the ground hard, my elbows leading. No good. I shook my hands, willing the pain in my fingers to go away. I broke into a run around the outside wall. I tore around the building, seeking inspiration. A rock might work. I had no time left, and it was worth a try. I searched the ground. No rocks, of course. Maintenance bots had been through this area earlier in the night, picking up any debris they found, including stray rocks. It was a dumb idea, anyway. The glass in the windows was reinforced. I needed to torch or something to cut through the walls or windows. I heard the enforcer pot again. It was getting closer. I had to get in this building. Now. I stood in front of the east entrance again. I ran to the sliding doors. If I were arriving for a shift, the doors would have opened no problem. I'd have to find some other way to open them. Pushing at them didn't work. The magnetic seal was too strong. The magnetic seal. Maybe I could break it or weaken it enough to push the doors apart. It came to me in a flash. I had the cycle in front of the door in seconds. I took off the back wheel, dropped it, and dragged the cycle right next to the door. Then, sticking the back fork in the ground just enough to keep the cycle steady, I unclipped the cover of the kinetic motor. I used one hand to steady the cycle and the other to push the pedal. With the front wheel still on, the cycle was angled upward, as if it were on a hill. The kinetic motor had a way to detect a slope. I pushed the pedal. Within three or four revolutions, the kinetic motor kicked in, and the chain began to move on its own. Electricity. I had to channel that electricity to the magnetic seal. I heard the enforcement pod siren again, closer now. I needed a wire or something that would... My wheel! I dashed to the back wheel I'd taken off and stomped on it as hard as I could, sharp pain slashing through my right arm at the movement. Pushing the pain aside, I stomped again and reached down, pulling two broken spokes free. Back at the door, I checked my distance. One spoke was enough to reach from the kinetic motor to the doors. Now I just had to find one of the electromagnets. It took maybe two seconds to find the nearest magnet inside the body of the door on the left. The spoke nearly jumped right out of my hand. I bent the other spoke in half and stuffed it in my zip pocket, not wanting to get rid of it. Having tinkered with every cycle I'd ever had and shadowed several people in the engineering dome, I knew where the electric charge in the kinetic motor was stored. I pedaled with one hand and with the other positioned one end of the spoke on the motor's power source. Then I put the other end of the spoke on the magnetic seal where the electromagnet hid behind the material of the door. A tiny spark popped in the night. I needed a lot more to break the seal. I pedaled with my right arm, fighting to keep the spoke in my left hand from moving. A few more sparks lit and glimmered out, making me blink the bright light away. I fought the urge to check the door seal. I had to get this right the first time. The enforcer pod, no, that was two pods now, whined louder, much closer. They were here. I dropped the pedal, gripped the spoke, and stood. I jabbed the spoke into the tiny crack between the doors, wiggling it to get it in. It slid in almost with no effort. I pushed down and it slid between the doors, easily, running down the slightly wider crack. I ran the spoke to the top of the doors and then wiggled it left and right. I ran it back down and, leaving the spoke at about waist height between the doors, pushed at the doors, trying to get them to separate. They jerked slightly, resisted, and then slid open an inch. Frantically, I jabbed my fingers into the gap and spread the doors farther apart, shocked that this had worked. In less than a minute, I'd wrenched the doors wide enough apart that I could slide through. I wasted no time and forced my way into the engineering dome. I fought back the feeling of triumph, feeling guilty about it. I had to remember why I was doing this. I stopped briefly to get my bearings, glancing around the entrance area. The light had come on as I'd entered, but it was still warming up, so it was pale and blue. I broke into a run down the short hallway that led to offices off to the right and to a door that opened up to Dev 1. 
Lights high overhead flickered to life as I slid through the door. The brighter work lights above the benches stayed dark. Development One was basically an open lab, with work and design tables, handhelds, computers, a few tool racks, and lots of rolling stools. There was an open aisle that ran straight across the room from the door I'd just come through to the door that led to Dev 2. I seriously doubted that I would find a cutting tool in Dev 1, so I just made a cursory search as I ran through the room. I saw nothing that would help me. I passed Paul's workstation. He was ten years old, and he already had his own design station. From what I'd heard, the kid was a prodigy, even better than me. Dev 2 was laid out in a similar way, but where Dev 1 was mostly dedicated to research and design, Dev 2 was the prototype room, my new workstation. Tools were everywhere. Molding machines lined most of the walls, and orange-painted poles indicated where you had to be careful not to step into a pit where vehicles were maintained. Heading straight to a rack that held cutting tools, I tossed a glance at Phil's workstation. I had a feeling I'd never shadow him again. The nano cutter was right where I'd seen it earlier that day. It worked on the molecular level, using nanos to sever the bonds between molecules. You used it when you needed a really neat, precise cut. It would also cut through just about anything. The problem was that it took a while to warm up, and I wasn't sure I could get it to work on just the strap of the papa and not the flesh of my wrist. I switched it on and looked around while it slowly grew warm in my hand. Just as I was thinking that the nano cutter might be ready, I heard the siren of an enforcer pod scream by right outside the wall. I had to keep moving. They were coming. My throat tightened up and I glanced back through Dev 2. If they hurried, the enforcers could come through the door in the next minute, or less even. I looked from my wrist to the nano cutter, momentarily frozen by indecision. Should I cut it now or run? Hey! I glanced up at the loud voice, dread filling me. The black mask and helmet of an enforcer stared at me. The second thing I saw was the ugly, matte black keeper in the enforcer's hand. Chapter 10 I stood for a half second, momentarily paralyzed by terror. Drop it! The enforcer's voice sounded like a dog bark, pushing at me with almost physical force. But I could also tell it was a woman. Drop what? I looked at my hand. It still held the nano cutter. I wasn't finished. I shoved the cutter into my zip's right pocket, grabbed the nearest tool off the workspace, and flung it at the enforcer. She brought her keeper up, and I ran, desperately flinging more tools at her, trying to keep her distracted. I ran through the door to Dev 3 so fast that my left shoulder clipped the sliding door. I tightened my neck and back, sure I was about to be hit with a jolt of electricity or a rubber bullet. I threw myself left, skidding behind a table and crawling on all fours toward the door to Dev 4. I had no idea where I should go. How was I supposed to get out? An explosion pounded in my ears and something whizzed past my face. A metallic thud followed by several others, then the sound of tools being smashed. Those weren't rubber bullets. What the bug? Shouldn't they want to question me? They had to know Bren had died of the bug and that I was with him, but no, they wanted me dead. I ducked and crawled as fast as I could. The cutter slipped out of my pocket. I dove for it and stuck the handle in my mouth. I gagged briefly but fought the unpleasant sensation away and kept going. Stop! I glanced back at the shout. The enforcer, if it was the same one, stood in the doorway back to Dev 2. Don't move! I moved. Dipping low, I scampered across the room, trying to keep a table or two between me and the enforcer, and probably other enforcers who had to be behind her. Maybe I could somehow make it to the west entrance of the dome. Nick Granger, out of station, late to shift. The sensor's voice shocked me. My papa had come too close to a sensor at a workstation. Didn't those things sleep? The floor of the engineering dome felt cool under my hands as I half ran, half crawled closer to Dev 4. Hunched low, I was pretty sure the enforcer didn't have a good shot at me, but that also meant I couldn't see her. Come out and we'll go easy, the enforcer called. I kept as silent as I could, knowing she would see when I made it to Dev 4. The dome's surrounded, Nick! You're not going anywhere! I gritted my teeth, biting hard on the cutter's handle, and threw myself forward, 
Just two more tables and I'd be at the door. Where do you think you're going? The enforcer sounded angry and surprised. I rounded the last table, and the door must have sensed me because it slid open with a soft hiss. I grabbed the nano cutter out of my mouth and dove through, hearing a small explosion followed by a crackling sizzle above my right shoulder. Electrodes skipped off the floor in front of my hand, sparking. Yelping, I yanked my hand back toward me. I rolled and felt my earcom jog loose, nearly falling out of my left ear. I stuffed it deeper in. I had to move in unexpected ways, or she'd get me next time. I grabbed a table leg, using it to help me change directions fast. Then I stood a little, trying to go faster, but banged my shoulder hard on the corner of the table. Pain sliced through me. I ignored it and got away from the door, hoping it would close, at least briefly, before the enforcer showed up again. Maybe I could hide before she got here, stay out of sight? No, they'd find me. They had all the time in the world. The building was surrounded. No way out. I glanced around Dev 4 and put the cutter in my pocket, this time remembering to zip my pocket closed. Only two more development labs until the west entrance, and if they could track Papa's really well, they would know exactly where I was. No hiding while I still wore the thing. And they probably had people closing in from the other side. And that enforcer would be here any second. I scanned Dev 4. Roger's lab. The enhanced cycle we'd been working on was covered by a shimmering dust cloth. The doors whispered open as I flung the dust cloth off and reached for the starter, straddling the powered cycle. Feet extending from each side kept the machine balanced. I darted a glance at the open door. Feeling my pulse in my head, I grabbed the handlebars and pressed the start button. The enforcer appeared through the doorway just as the machine began rumbling and making a high-pitched whine. Then... It lifted off the ground. My body naturally conformed to the seat, and... No, it was conforming to me. I felt slight movements as the nanoplastic that made up the body of the cycle molded itself to me. I ducked hard as electrodes sizzled over me. They splattered just behind me. Stop! The enforcer yelled. I threw my body forward. Come on, go! The special cycle jerked forward an inch. Break flashed urgently red on a small readout in the middle console of the handlebars. I'd forgotten to take off the parking brake. Shouts and explosions filled the lab as I ducked and flipped the brake toggle off. The door leading to Dev 5 slid open, and two enforcers emerged. They fired immediately, explosions bouncing off the lab's walls, rubber bullets slamming into the cycle. Two clipped my left shoulder agonizingly. Lethal force, the first enforcer shouted. I screamed in pain and ducked, throwing myself forward again. The cycle blasted out of its space, the feet that had been holding it up sliding into the body of the machine with a satisfying whir and click. The sudden speed nearly threw me off the hovering machine. I pulled back. The enforcers had obviously been just as surprised as I had been when the machine exploded into motion. They backed off momentarily, back through the door to Dev 5. When I leaned back, the cycle jerked roughly to a stop, lifting a little. I knew in my head how to control the machine, but I had never actually tried. It was really sensitive. I leaned forward again. The cycle blasted forward. I squeezed the handles, clenching the body of the machine with my knees. I leaned to turn the machine and tore through the door, knocking one of the enforcers to the ground in the process. Dev 5 was devoted to agricultural engineering, so there were only a few work tables covered in prototypes of farming equipment. I saw no enforcers ahead of me, so I leaned forward again. The machine went faster. I was shooting along, maybe a half meter off the ground, faster than I'd ever gone before on my cycle. As I aimed toward the door to Dev 6, and hopefully through that room to the outside, I inspected the special cycle. Brake switch, check. Lean forward to go, check. Back to slow, check. I tested the pads under my feet, using them to make my turns more precise. The machine was sensitive to everything, and it worked perfectly. I wished Roger could see it go. I glanced over my shoulder. The enforcers had no way of keeping up, but they were trying hard. I hoped that the two I'd blasted past had been the only ones coming from the west entrance. I needed to get through the door to Dev 6. It was maybe 15 or 20 meters ahead of me, and it would only open when it sensed someone approaching. But these doors always opened slowly, and I was moving fast. 
I tossed another glance backward. It would be close. I pulled backward a little on the handlebars. I was suddenly nearly two meters off the ground, still hurtling toward the closed doors. My heart hammering and wind prying my mouth open. I leaned back and slowed. I eased the handlebars forward until I was back to a half meter above the dome's floor. Turns out the powered cycle could more than hover. It actually flew a little. Did Roger know that? I slowed more as I closed to within four meters of the door. Another two meters and the door opened. I leaned forward and zipped between the doors before they'd made it all the way into the walls. The west entrance to the dome was hidden behind a group of at least five enforcers. The ones behind me must have called ahead because these new ones immediately started shooting at me. I ducked and made a hard left, just in time to miss the net that flew over my head. Something slammed into the cycle, making it wobble a bit. I weaved between tables covered with computer parts and huge magnifiers. Deb 6 was filled with shouts and explosions, all muffled against the backdrop of the powered cycle. I continued dodging tables, ducking and weaving wildly, trying to lower the chance of getting hit. The cracks of the bullets suddenly dropped off. I looked up and saw some of the enforcers reloading their keepers. I decided to rush forward while they were distracted and try to draw them away from the door. I directed the cycle toward the enforcers, accelerating. They stood their ground and took aim. Bug it! I wasn't fast enough to surprise them. They weren't going to move. And when the other enforcers showed up, they'd win eventually. I swerved abruptly to the left and zigzagged nearer to the other door, thinking I could go back the way I came. The three enforcers filled the doorway in front of me. They fired immediately. I swerved crazily. Dull pain from the earlier rubber bullets had set in on my right side and back. This was bad. Both exits were blocked. I wasn't going to get past the enforcers, and I didn't think I could fit through one of the windows, even if I could break it. Windows. I looked up. I couldn't get in the dome through a skylight, but could I get out? Also, how high could this thing go? Chapter 11 I couldn't dodge bullets and sizzling electrodes forever. Leaning into a hard left turn, I rocketed around a table and headed for the north end of Dev 6. There was a pretty straight shot from the north wall to the south wall of the lab, directly between tables and workstations. Something hot sliced the skin where my right shoulder met my neck. Lances of white hot pain burrowed into my scalp and shot down my back. I clenched my jaw, fighting away the aches all over my body. I felt blood drip down from the cut in my neck. More real bullets. They wanted me dead. But why? The enforcers had begun to fan out, leaving one person directly in front of each door, blocking the way. I dragged the cycle into a sliding turn, leaning back and squeezing the hand grips hard to keep from losing control. I turned the right hand grip forward a bit and the propulsion unit's winds lowered into a growl. I turned the throttle again, and the machine bucked under me, growling deeper. I pushed the hand grip forward, but didn't lean yet, wanting to keep from blasting off too fast. The cycle bucked under me again. I gunned the throttle and leaned forward, immediately pulling the handlebars back a little. I shot forward, straight down the narrow aisle that ran to the south wall. I had maybe 60 meters ahead of me. The cycle lifted above the floor, gaining speed. I glanced to either side. The enforcers had found out more and had stopped shooting so much. Their movements seemed coordinated. They looked like they were about to try something. The cycle was gaining altitude, but not fast enough. I looked up and saw the skylight. With the bright lights inside Dev 6, it looked like I was planning to hit a block of solid black. I would have to circle at least once to gain enough altitude and get the right trajectory. Working my feet carefully, I angled the cycle into a right turn, still gaining altitude. I was way more than 10 meters off the ground. Keeping my body forward, I pulled back, flying higher. Pain flared in my calf as I got hit by a rubber bullet. I tightened my grip on the cycle and gave it more throttle, finding it harder to stay upright the higher I got. I guessed I was at 15 meters, only five to go, when something slid across the back of my calves. Keeping my head low, I glanced down. Bug me! I hadn't known about those. Roger had obviously planned to take the powered cycle on a flight. Stubby wings, maybe 60 centimeters long, had just finished extending from each side of the rear propulsion unit. I hoped the skylight wasn't too narrow for me to fit through. I hoped the tempered glass would pop out or break easily when the cycle hit it. 
and I hoped I could aim well enough to not splatter myself against the ceiling or wrap myself around the girders that were now flashing by maybe three meters above my head. I had to get this right. I wouldn't get a second try because if I missed, I'd hit a girder and that would be it. No more Nick, no more rocket cycle. The wobbling of the cycle had evened out when the wings deployed, so now I was able to take a tighter right turn. This was my final pass. I glanced down. The enforcers had stopped shooting and were all running toward the west entrance. Some had already made it out. They must have guessed what I was about to do. I briefly hoped that all of them would go out, leaving the exit unattended. But no. Two stayed behind. I refocused my attention on flying. Thirty meters left. I pulled the cycle into a slightly steeper climb. I found that if I was careful, I could fly just between two long girders in a sort of channel up to the skylight. Pushing the throttle, I leaned forward to maximize my speed, my chest and stomach flat on the body of the cycle. I had to be going 50 kilometers per hour, maybe more. This was going to hurt. 10 meters. I gave it all the throttle I could and pulled up sharply. The cycle jerked once or twice and then responded, its nose angling up. I tucked my head down, wanting the front of the machine to take the brunt of the hit. Bracing for the horrible impact, I closed my eyes, clenching the cycle with every muscle in my body. It was nowhere near as bad as I'd expected. A huge bang, like two gigantic metal hands clapping, deafened me. My ears popped. I felt a bone-jarring slam on the front of the cycle and slipped forward on the machine, but I was held in place by the nanoplastic Roger had used to build the seat. I briefly imagined myself being splattered through girders, but after a second, I was in the cool, late-night air of New Frisco. Now I was slipping backward a little, still gaining altitude. I had to even out, had to get control. Even as I tried to pull myself into a better position, the cycle angled more steeply up, not working. I had to change direction, fast. Wind tore at my clothes, the hood of my zip. I pushed the turn control with my left foot. My angle changed and I was suddenly able to see the ground over my left shoulder. I had to be 80 meters up. My heart stopped beating for a full second or two. I pushed up with my feet, stopping my turn but gaining a better hold on the cycle. I pushed the handlebar forward a little, finally slowing my ascent. Angling myself toward the east edge of New Frisco, I eased the cycle out of its climb and then down so I was skimming above houses. I blinked against the wind as I carefully wiped one sweaty hand, then the other against my zip. I felt practically every heartbeat, my veins and arteries expanding and contracting with every pump of blood. I'd never felt more alive, more free. A shout exploded from my chest. Anger and grief and guilt conflicted with my relief and exhilaration. I was alive, free. I'd done it. I beat the bug and the enforcers, and I was flying. The most incredible sensation ever. But Bren was dead, and I knew the enforcers behind me would catch up fast. I screamed again, hurling exultant defiance at the artificial world that seemed so clear to me now. I had to keep this view. Even if I was immune, I wouldn't go back. I'd give them my blood, but that was all. The sirens peeled back the momentary freedom I'd felt. I tossed a look over my shoulder. Lights flashed gold and scarlet on the enforcer pods. They were coming. Chapter 12 The Enforcer's pods were faster than me. And I still had my papa, so I couldn't very well hide or dodge effectively. The wrist dad had to come off. I angled the cycle down until I was coasting maybe a meter above the road that led past Green Res and toward Hope Park. If I stopped to cut the strap, the enforcers would catch me. I'd have to be fast. Then a thought came to me. I could control my speed and direction with my body and feet, so I didn't need to hold the handlebar the entire time. I leaned back and angled myself into the mix of shadows thrown by the streetlights, steadying the cycle into a straight glide. I released the handlebar, going from my pocket with the nano cutter in it. The cycle's whine immediately dropped pitch, and the machine slowed suddenly, dropping quickly until it was a fraction of a meter above the road surface. I cursed Roger's carefulness. He'd told me he was going to build a safety mechanism into the machine. He'd done it while I was at school. 
Apparently, the machine lost power without a signal from my papa. I quickly leaned forward and brought my wrist to the sensor on the console. The machine roared back to life. Thanks, Roger. Now what? The enforcer pod would scream up behind me any second. I could cut the papa off, drop it, and try to get as far away as possible on foot before they figured out what I'd done. Or I could remove the papa, somehow attach it to the rocket cycle, and... No, that wouldn't work. The machine wouldn't move without someone controlling it. I pulled to a stop, circling around the back of a house. The cycle settled to the ground, two feet automatically deploying from either side and propping it up. I pulled the nano cutter from my zip pocket. I'd made it maybe three or four kilometers away from the engineering dome and only had a couple more blocks until I hit the edge of town. I could drop the papa down a ravine and just go on foot at that point. The enforcers wouldn't be far behind me. I placed the nano cutter over the strap on the inside of my wrist and tapped the configuration tabs on the cutter with my thumb. The strap on the papa was made of res stick, and that was a preloaded setting in the cutter. That made it faster. I figured the strap was about three millimeters thick. I activated the cutter and held still. The cutter warmed in my hand. Come on! Breathing evenly, I willed my heart rate to slow. I had to be near 140 again. I still couldn't see the enforcers, but I could hear the sirens on their pods. I wondered how many pods were on my trail. I'd caused a lot of trouble tonight. They obviously were seriously angry. I thought of Bren and wondered if his parents had been told yet. My papa told me it was 0340. Less than two hours had passed. It felt like I'd been dodging enforcers for days. Now I saw the flashing lights. They were coming from several directions, but they were all converging toward me. Maybe half a kilometer away and not moving as fast as I would have expected. They must have noticed I'd stopped, thought I was trying to hide, and figured that they could sneak up on me. They must have thought I was a bugging idiot, like I was going to miss Enforcer Pod sneaking up on me. The nano cutter softly beeped, finally! A moment later, my papa fell to the ground, taking the soggy wad of glue with it. I rubbed at the sticky residue on my skin and bent to pick up the papa. My wrist felt naked, cold, raw. I guessed the papa would keep working even if I wasn't wearing it, so I could use it to throw the enforcers off my trail. I had to get rid of the papa fast. I cast a fond glance at the rocket cycle, whispering thanks to Roger. Something caught my eye, and I peered closer. A word had been embossed on the left side of the machine in fancy letters. Sijet. He must have done that after I'd gone to Phil's station. I patted the Sijet and broke into a run, pocketing the cutter again. You never knew when a tool like that would come in handy. I stuck to the edge of the house I'd hidden the Sijet behind. I would throw the papa down the street as far as I could and then make for the edge of town. Without the papa, the odds would be evened out. If I found a good place to hide, they'd have to give up. Or something. I took the papa in my right hand and, giving it one final glance to say goodbye, wound up to toss it. The cutter. What if I didn't have to lose the papa entirely? I just needed to deactivate the tracker, which meant I needed to cut open the papa. I fished the cutter out fast, goosebumps covering my neck. I dashed back into the shadows near the house and crouched. A soft blue light emanated from the nanocutter's readout. It was just enough to see by. I set the nanocutter for res stick again, guessing that the papa's case would be no more than a millimeter thick. I had to be fast. Luckily, the nanocutter hadn't cooled down completely, so it beeped gently within 20 seconds of placing it on the side of the papa. I kept the nanocutter activated as I tried to work the casing of the papa open. No luck. I'd have to cut another side, maybe even two more. It felt like forever before the nano cutter finished. I had extremely shallow cuts on three sides of the papa's casing. But the sirens were getting louder, the lights flashing brighter and brighter. If this worked, I would need the enforcers to be as far away from the side jet as possible. I got moving, ducking behind the house and making my way through the yards deeper into the city. After a few minutes, I hid behind another house. Holding the cutter's handle in my mouth, I tried to direct the soft light at the papa in my hands. I could just barely get a fingernail into the cuts I'd made, but wasn't able to budge the case open at all. Had I cut it deeply enough? No time to check. 
I needed something stiff and strong, but very narrow, pointy even. The spoke in my pocket. Pulling it out, I worked one end carefully into a cut and wedged the casing slightly open. A little crack widened. I increased the pressure. So far, so good. An enforcer pod screamed overhead. I ducked instinctively, dropping the spoke. Bugging spam! I hit the ground on all fours, searching for the skinny metal bar. There! I propelled myself to my feet and tried to find a better hiding place to give myself more time. Nothing. Every yard was the same. Two trees and an 8 by 18 meter yard of oxygrass. I had to figure this out fast. I kept moving, trying to keep my hands steady enough to examine the tiny innards of the papa. Saliva dripped out my mouth around the handle of the nano cutter. I fought back the need to gag at having my mouth forced open for so long. I needed the light. I had to be careful not to destroy whatever the side jet was calibrated to sense so it would start, but that was secondary. There had to be a transmitter somewhere in the papa. A tiny capsule caught my eye. That had to be the knockout. Using the spoke, I popped the capsule out and crushed it into the oxygrass. Two more enforcer pods flew by overhead, much slower than before, spotlights probing the yard I was in. I hugged the wall, forcing myself to focus. I knew what a transmitter looked like. I held the papa closer to the light of the nanocutter, sweat and spit mixing into sticky drips that slid down my face and chin. There would be an antenna of some kind, maybe more than one. Using the spoke, I tapped each minuscule component. Needle, slide that out, drop it. Heart rate monitor, leave it. Several incredibly tiny chips and multiple rails of circuit, leave those. On the edge of awareness, I heard several pods land in the street on the other side of the house. I scrubbed sweat from my eyes. No time! My heart thundered loudly in my chest, distracting me. I swallowed around the cutter handle. I blinked. It looked like another needle, but it was pointing up. It had to be the transmitter. I prodded at it, and it wiggled a little. I poked at the solder around its base, scraping it away. If I could keep the transmitter intact, I could still use it as a decoy. I prayed it had its own power source, some kind of fail-safe battery. It was finally loose. I gingerly eased it out of the papa. I heard voices as I stepped away from the house wall. Commands and shouts. Lights flashed from several directions. I took the cutter in my left hand, which still held the papa. I ran across the yard and headed toward the house that backed into this one. Come on, I said to the tiny transmitter, so light I could barely feel it in my palm. Then... I flung it with a grunt. No time to wait and see where it had landed. I took off, praying nobody would come around the house I'd been hiding behind. The shouts were suddenly louder. They'd seen the transmitter signal moving, so they probably thought I was making a break for it. I ran hard, ducking around a house on the street behind the road where the enforcer pods were parked. Then I ran like crazy. Chapter 13 I found the side jet where I'd left it. I was a little surprised that the enforcers hadn't tracked it down so they could take it in. I guessed they were too intent on catching me. And killing me. I'd folded the casing of the papa back into place, but I racked my brain for a way to keep it on my wrist so the side jet would work. That is, if the papa would still start it. I passed my hand holding the papa in front of the sensor, on the left of the console, and pressed the start button. The side jet rumbled to life. Blaze. It had worked. The casing needed to be held closed, and I still needed to be able to wear the papa. In the shadows, I could only barely make out the time. 0350? I guessed I still had a couple of hours of darkness. I needed to be out of the city long before the sun came out. As I took my hand away from the sensor, the side jet settled back down. I briefly thought of wrapping the spoke tightly around the casing of the papa. No way. Even if I could bend the spoke that tightly, which I doubted, even if I could bend the spoke that tightly, which I doubted I could do, it would hurt my wrist when I tied the papa back on. I needed something thin, or some glue. A strap would work. I could make a strap. It took some doing. Two minutes had passed by the time I was able to tear short strips of cloth off the bottom of my shirt and use one to tie the casing closed, and the other to strap the papa back on my wrist. I shook it. The strap stayed in place. 
I got on the side jet and fired it up. The enforcers would figure out what I'd done with the trackers soon if they hadn't already. I needed to go. Staying low, I directed the side jet to the road. In the illumination of the street lamps a few blocks away, I saw two enforcer pods with a lot of movement around them. I'd seen another pod on the next street over. I eased the side jet across the road and started putting on speed, hoping to make it at least to Edge Road before the enforcers got in their pods again. They could easily track me if they were flying above me, and I was sure the pods could get higher than the side jet could fly. Besides, I really didn't want to spend any more time as high as I'd gotten coming out of the engineering dome. Before long, I was on Edge Road, cruising toward Hope Park, and finally feeling like my heart rate was coming down to normal levels. I needed a plan, but for now, I just wanted to find a place to hide and rest. As the adrenaline that had been carrying me most of the night dissipated, exhaustion hit me. I felt almost dizzy, like I was fighting a couple of knockouts. Behind me, the sirens of the enforcer pods shattered the relative calm that had returned to the new Frisco night. I poured on the speed and was soon crossing over the grounds of Hope Park. If I could get out of sight quickly enough, they wouldn't know where to pick up my trail. I remembered momentarily that Hope Park had surveillance sensors here and there, but given the short moments I'd spent exploring past the park, I was pretty sure that the sensors didn't extend into the wilderness beyond the park. And suddenly, I was out of the city of my birth and life. I was moving fast, skimming the ground and dodging trees and shrubs as the sidejet climbed with the slopes of the foothills. I'd never been so far outside the city. What about the earcoms? Were they tracked too? I reached for mine but stopped. If I got rid of it, I'd be completely alone. I'd have no way to talk to anyone. The new chapter's motto came to me. Better safe than sorry. I couldn't risk them finding me by it. But not yet. I pulled the side jet to a stop under a tree and activated my earcom. I paused a second before saying my dad's name. If I started talking to people, the admins might be able to pinpoint where I was. But I was going to be quick. I mentally apologized to my parents and then called my dad. What? Who? My dad's voice was rough. Dad, it's me. I'm sorry. I swallowed past a lump in my throat. I don't know what happened, but I have to go. The bug's gone. I... What else to say? Nick, what are you... I'm sorry. I have to go. I'll stay safe. I disconnected immediately. I couldn't answer questions. I didn't have time, and I had no idea what was really going on. I pulled the ear comb out, but I had another thought. The sweat pouring down my back felt suddenly cold. My face went hot. Bug me, this was bad. But I had to. I put the ear comb back in and whispered Jan's name. Who is this? Her voice was much clearer than my dad's. Jan, this is Nick. I can't stay on. I know it's late. Where's Bren? He's not in bed. How did she know that? Bren must have actually woken her up. Something really bad happened. I'm so sorry. I don't know how... What? Something what happened? I could almost see her eyes go wide from the fear in her voice. It's Bren. We snuck out. We thought the bug was gone. I couldn't stay on if the admins were tracking my frequency. I had to finish this. It's my fault. I'm sorry. The words. I had to say the words. What happened to Bren? Jan's voice broke on his name. He's dead. The bug got him. I don't know what happened because it didn't get me. I have to go. They're trying to kill me. Nick, what? I yanked the ear come out and threw it past the tree I was hiding under. Fighting the pain and fatigue back down, I pulled out of my hiding place and got moving, but I went back the way I'd come. Maybe getting rid of the ear comb would throw them off my trail. After a few kilometers, I veered off and followed a different path between trees and around rocks. As I rode, I tried not to think about my parents and Jan, and Brennan Jan's parents. I tried to focus on the road. I wished the Sijet had a light that would illuminate the ground ahead of me. I should have thought of that, but no, it was probably for the best. The enforcers would be looking everywhere. I didn't want to give them a bright light to home in on. The terrain was rough. Trees clustered thickly here and there with bushes and irregular small hills, so I had to pay close attention to the path in front of me. As I rode, I climbed higher. 
I wasn't heading directly up a mountain or anything, but if I turned more to the right, I would be. There was a place where a few of the foothills crested in front of the larger mountains farther to the east. I wanted to get over that crest. I'd grown up calling everything to the east of New Frisco the wilderness. In ecosystems class, we'd learned that there was more to it than just wild lands. There were remnants of old cities and smaller towns. We'd been taught about lakes, forests, and the animals that populated them. I crossed over several ancient roads from before the infection. Finally, the side jet brought me to the top of a big foothill. I looked around, trying to figure out where to go. I lost a long minute or two just sitting on top of that hill, taking it all in. Behind me, to the west, were the streetlights, regular buildings, and large domes of New Frisco. I couldn't see any sign of the old city that they said was even farther west, or of the ocean they'd always talked about. I'd always wanted to see the ocean. My heart rate had returned to a steady 90 or so. I heard my pulse louder just inside my ears for a moment as I scanned the countryside, seeing signs of the old civilization and how the wilderness had taken it back over. Would New Frisco look like this one day? Would there be a day that all humans were gone and our cities all looked like they'd been ground down, softened, and broken up by some unstoppable force? Old roads and highways, more pale than the rest of the land, crisscrossed the foothills as far as I could see. They looked like paths where huge, ghostly snails had wandered, leaving a trail of asphalt and pavement behind them. Some of the roads were wide and cluttered with what I assumed were old cars. Others were narrower and mostly free of clutter. The pre-infection people drove those machines everywhere. Everybody knew that pre-infection cities were laid out with huge, unbroken areas of homes so isolated from work areas and supply stores that the people had been forced to drive to do even the smallest of tasks. Driving. I wondered what that would be like. The handles of those old cars were circles, not like my cycle's handlebars. Based on what we'd been taught in school, I imagined that if I kept going east— I would eventually get to a place of fewer roads and no towns at all. But for now, I couldn't tear my eyes away from the dark shapes of trees pulverizing their way up through old roads and hundred-year or more old buildings falling to pieces. In the faint light, the buildings, roads, and sagging signs were like ghosts haunting the new world that we'd created, reminders of what had come before. I shook off the strange feeling. The tightness around my eyes reminded me that I hadn't slept at all that night, and it was already past four in the morning. I needed to find a place to hole up and rest. I tossed a final look over my shoulder. The enforcer pods had fanned out over the city. They were probably waking people up with their racket. Two pods were headed in my direction. Leaning forward, I angled the side jet down the hill and aimed for a road that could have fit maybe eight side jets flying side by side. Why had they made these roads so wide? I guessed you could fit ten cars side by side on this thing. What a waste. Once I hit the road, I poured on the speed and let the ghostly path lead me generally to the east. I had to dodge strange, twisted piles of metal and trees regularly, but that didn't slow me down. The longer I was out in the dark, the more my eyes got used to the poor light. Part of my mind wandered as I rode. I wasn't sure how far I had to go before they stopped searching for me. But if I left New Frisco, I couldn't figure out what had really happened with Bren. I thought of Bren's mom and dad and sister, and I shoved the image of their heartbroken faces out of my mind. I couldn't deal with that right now. Then there were the other pushers. When word got out about Bren, Melissa, Connor, and Paul would have no way of figuring out what had happened. The admins would have to say something that kept people reassured and calm, like blaming me. If they did, they'd be right. I knew I was responsible for Bren. I shouldn't have been so careless. I couldn't think about that right now. I had to get away, find a place to stop, rest, and think. I forced myself to watch the side jet's light cut through the darkness ahead, using it to guide me around rotting hunks of old metal. I must have outdistanced the enforcers because for the next hour, I saw no sign of them. By that time, I must have gone 30 kilometers or more. I couldn't believe how far I'd come from New Frisco. The road I was following led me deeper into mountains where trees sprouted thickly, 
Most of the trees had pale trunks that glowed in the moonlight. As I rounded a hill, I saw a road that branched off of the one I was on. The new road headed almost directly east and looked like it cut through thick groups of hills and incredibly tall forests. That should work. My eyes felt like they'd been scraped with sandpaper, and keeping my eyelids open was taking more and more of my attention. I rode maybe a kilometer down this new road, really wishing that the side jet emitted more light than the glow from the propulsion units. The trees had been growing steadily thicker, and the wide, tightly packed trunks cut off the minimal light. These trees were different, too. Their trunks didn't glow, but some of them were immense. Some of the trunks were the size of my room. I pulled the side jet off the road into the darker space under one of the trees. Redwoods. My bleary mind randomly recalled the name of these trees from a memory of some class from a few years back. As I dismounted, I looked around, hoping no wild animals were close and hungry. I found myself standing on a relatively clear patch of ground at the base of the huge tree. There were plenty of leaves, but only a couple of tiny bushes and saplings. I kicked some leaves together, pulled my zip tightly around me, and gingerly lowered myself to the ground, my right arm feeling strangely stiff. I must have had bruises on every inch of skin. Muscles I didn't think I'd ever used complained. Maybe I would just live out here. Find some way to get food. Maybe steal it. Nobody would find me in the middle of this place. Nobody ever came out here. I didn't even remember my head hitting the small pile of flat leaves I'd quickly kicked together. Chapter 14 The Sijet was singing. I was riding along, exploring the gray, overgrown corpses of ancient cities, when the machine began to hum. I couldn't make out the words or see a mouth, but there was no doubt in my mind. I blinked, the dream clinging to me with sticky fingers. The Sijet singing? I fought the strange images back and looked around, sucking in a deep breath. The Sijet was maybe a meter away from my head dotted in scuff marks where bullets and electrodes had pounded it. It made no noise. What was that noise? I lay in the grass, not sure I could get up. My legs and arms, my back too, felt pulverized and frozen. Ignoring the pain, I listened closer, but the sound faded. Was it a bird? It sounded like a person, like a girl. It was gone. I couldn't hold back a low groan as I pushed myself to a sitting position. My back felt like it was made of heated metal. Suddenly, I couldn't stand the stiffness. I needed to get up, stretch it out. I lurched to my knees and nearly fell, but I managed to put out my right hand and catch myself. And I nearly fainted from the pain. Black spots swam in front of me and my head seemed to tighten, squeezing my brain. My elbow flashed in lava-hot agony. Lances of pain slashed all the way to my fingers and shoulder. I gasped and swore, What the bug? Still on my knees, I carefully pulled my right arm closer to try to get a look at it. I could barely move it. I had slept on my left side, my right arm draped over my body in a slightly bent position. If I tried to lift my forearm or lower it, the elbow twinged bright with pain. I thought back through the events of the previous night, trying to track down when the injury had happened. It had to have been when I'd fallen off the bugging drain pipe. I'd landed on my elbow pretty hard. Was it broken? I had no way of knowing. But if it were broken, how could I have done everything I'd done last night? Had adrenaline just kept me going despite the pain? Or maybe I'd been hit by a bullet, rubber or otherwise. I couldn't see blood, but I couldn't move the arm to really check. I decided it would probably be best if I didn't move the arm, so I tucked it against my stomach and levered myself to my feet with my left arm, muscles everywhere screaming at me to forget moving for a long time. I fought against the pain, wobbling a little and leaning against the redwood trunk. At least the papa was on my left wrist, so I could still ride the side jet. An unfamiliar smell caught my attention. It reminded me of the parks in New Frisco, but this was heavier and sweeter. 
and it felt like it filled the entire world. For a moment, I felt like I'd been transported to a different planet. All around me stood massive trees, their deep red bark filled with long furrows and ridges. Among the huge sentinels that surrounded me stood saplings and some small scrub and bushes. The thick canopy of leaves allowed plenty of light in to see by, but it was a strange light, tinted red and green and gold somehow. The world around me seemed wild, free, totally uncontrolled. I knew laws of biology and physics governed the universe, but it was as if those laws had decided to make things as interesting and beautiful as possible. Images of the stark cleanliness and order of New Frisco contrasted in my mind with the seemingly random placements of the majestic trees around me. But even as I looked, I could see that the trees weren't growing randomly. Each had a space that it had carved out where it could get enough sun, leaving plenty of maneuvering space among the house-sized trunks. The bark under my hand felt like rough stone. I pushed myself away from the tree carefully to try to get a better look around. That first step nearly sent me back to the ground, my muscles pulsing alternately between dull aches and deep, flaring pains. I took a few more steps, each a little less shaky than the one before. It still hurt to move, but I felt like I could move enough to get back on the side jet soon. My abdomen felt like it was in a knot that tightened with every step I took. I wondered if I'd been hit in my stomach at some point last night, until my stomach rumbled. I checked my papa. Nearly noon, of course. I would have eaten hours ago back home. Maybe my idea to try to live in the wilderness wouldn't work. I had no idea where I would get food. Or water. Could I eat leaves? If I came to a river or stream, would the water be clean? Before the infection, the water had apparently been toxic all over. That was a hundred years ago. A century. The rivers had to be clean by now. Although that wouldn't really matter if I couldn't find one. Nice work, Nick, I said under my breath. You'll last about a day. If a wandering bear doesn't get you first. Why didn't they teach us how to survive in the wilderness in school? I shook my head at the idiotic question. We weren't even supposed to leave the city for ten seconds, much less live out here. It didn't matter now. I needed to get moving. Maybe I could find an old garden or fruit tree. Maybe old canned food. I considered sneaking back into New Frisco to get some food and other supplies, and then heading back out. Back out to where? I'd just proven to myself that I couldn't really live in the wilderness. I needed to find out if I really was immune to the bug and if I wasn't, why I had lived and Bren had died. Why the enforcers had immediately tried to kill me. Why they didn't want to know how I'd survived. It occurred to me that, honestly, they had no way of knowing what had happened, which meant it made even less sense for them to try to kill me. With flaring complaints from my muscles, I climbed on the side jet and leaned forward. My back screamed in agony. The side jet fired up, and I had to balance very carefully with one arm to get back to the road. The propulsion unit's whine held steady at a low pitch. My mouth felt dry and strained, like I'd been clenching my jaw for days. Even my tongue felt like it was rebelling against all of the abuse of last night. I settled deeper into my seat. It was going to be challenging to ride with one arm. I'd have to keep my speed and altitude under control. Good thing I could control turns with my feet. The propulsion unit scattered leaves, revealing dark earth directly below the side jet. The rich aroma I'd smelled earlier hit me again. The dirt even smelled good out here. When I reached the road that had led me into the redwood forest, I looked left and right, hovering gently over the forest turf. New Frisco had to be on high alert by now. There was no way I'd make it in and out again, what with all the surveillance sensors and cameras all over the city. I'd be caught within minutes, and that would be the end of it. Plus, if I went back, I'd probably have to see Bren's family, and our friends, the other pushers. But if I went deeper into the forest, I would have to find a way out, and find food. I had to find other people who didn't know about what had happened in New Frisco, people in a different... Of course! Angel Town. Teacher Harper had talked about it. 
It was like 700 kilometers southeast of New Frisco and was near the site of an old pre-infection city with the same name. If I could find roads that led that direction, I could try to get there. Maybe talk to doctors there that didn't know what had happened back home. And as I traveled, I could keep my eyes open for food and water. But if I couldn't find anything, there was always Angeltown. I turned left, back the way I'd come. I would head to that bigger road, the one that had probably been a highway, and travel southeast on it, or near it, considering that enforcers might still be out there looking for me. Seven hundred kilometers. I looked over the side jet and tucked my arm tighter against my abdomen. How fast could this thing go? Despite wanting to make it to Angeltown in one day, I knew I had to be careful both to protect my arm and to avoid being seen. Within thirty minutes, I came to the bigger road, checked the sun, and turned south. My stomach seemed to be kicking my abdomen muscles in anger at the lack of food. The side jet was designed to split the wind as it passed, so when I leaned forward enough, I could keep my eyes opened wide without them instantly drying out from the rushing air. Finding the side jet fairly easy to control with one hand and my feet once I got it moving, I coaxed it over to the left of the road, near the woods. I wanted to be able to duck out of sight fast if I saw enforcers. I kept a close eye on the woods and hills around me, the road wound among the huge trees, at one time even cutting through the trunk of one of them. How had I not noticed that last night? Now, in the light of the afternoon sun, the rusted and somehow melted hulks on the road looked less ghostly and somehow more, I don't know, human. More temporary, like somebody had tried to build something that would last, but it just couldn't stand up to nature. The road intermittently led through clusters of old buildings. Sometimes there were single houses, these far more decrepit, built into large clearings in the woods. Seeing the way life had been before the infection made me think of that first day and the bug, like always. But this time I knew what it must have been like watching people drop dead while the biotoxin ate their body's tissues. What had those people felt, the ones who had died? Bren knew, for a minute at least. I clenched the handlebar tighter fighting the tears. My breath came in gasps. I slowed the side jet to a stop as my chest tightened. Tears dripped off my chin. It had been my idea, my stupid idea, and now Brent was dead, and I wasn't. I scrubbed at my face. I had to figure out why. An hour passed, and I knew I had left New Frisco far behind. I'd seen no sign of pursuit or searchers of any kind. As I blasted down the shoulder of the road, I kept my eyes open for fruit trees or old gardens that might have gone to seed, but still had edible plants in them. I discarded the idea of finding ancient cans of food. There was no way that stuff would be good after a hundred years. What's that? I think I asked it aloud because I'd never gone so long without hearing somebody speak. Whether it was admins, announcers, teachers, parents, or even the pushers, it seemed like life in New Frisco was always noisy. Something glittered to my right, maybe fifty meters off the road. A long strip of silver. Water? It ran between the road and the ragged line of deciduous trees that was set back a ways from the road. I guided the side jet across the road, careful to dodge the bent and rusted hulk of what had once been a large vehicle. A stream maybe two meters across at its widest. My heart pounded in anticipation. I parked the side jet and eased myself off, grunting at the pains that flared up in my legs, back, and arms. Getting to my knees felt like it took forever. My legs just didn't want to bend. The grass under my knees felt soft, much less stiff than the oxygrass I'd grown up with. It could make a comfortable bed. The water was crystal clear, dancing and hopping over smooth stones. Finally, I was propped up on my left arm next to the stream. I assessed my situation. This wasn't going to work. I couldn't use my right arm. I lowered myself to the ground with my face just above the water and used my left hand to scoop water, splashing it on my face and down my throat. The stench covering me hit with an almost physical force. An image of Bren struggling on the road, his ragged voice saying my name flashed in my mind. I shook it away. 
I splashed water all over my face and neck again. The day was warm, but the water felt nearly ice cold and more perfect and delicious than anything else I'd ever tasted. I slurped and scrubbed for a long while, but I forced myself to stop before I filled my stomach. That had to be a bad idea. I hadn't eaten in, I checked my papa, 1400. Nearly 20 hours. A stomach full of water would probably turn out to be a bad thing. Pushing myself up, my left hand slipped into the water and the frigid stuff soaked me up to the elbow. It felt amazing. I tried again to get up and succeeded this time. The water would probably feel very soothing on my hurt right arm. I yanked the metal zipper on my zip down and struggled out of the thing. I rolled my still dry right sleeve up and, being as careful as I could, lowered my right arm, elbow first, into the water. I couldn't get it very far into the stream, but the elbow seemed to contract at the sudden cold. The water flowing down from my arm was tinged brown. That had to be my blood. The position I was in became uncomfortable quickly, so I eased myself back up out of the stream and reached for my zip. My stomach growling painfully, I examined the right sleeve. It was caked brown from the elbow all the way to the cuff. It also had Bren's vomit on it. Gripping the zip tightly, I lowered the right sleeve into the stream and swished it around to try to get some of the blood off. I looked up, amazed at the blueness of the sky. I'd never noticed it before, because there was always so much to see at eye level. I never thought to look above me. I scanned the horizon, noting the thin, hazy cloud off to the east and the rolling, uneven swath of trees that blanketed the hills all around me. A person could get lost in a thin cloud. There were no clouds anywhere else in the sky. I looked more intently. Not a cloud. That was smoke. A nearly invisible column of smoke coming from the forest off to the east, maybe a kilometer away. People. There were people out here. Chapter 15. Maybe they had something to eat? My stomach complained noisily, tightening at the thought of finally getting some food in me. I wanted to go find whoever had the fire going, but I didn't know if they would help me. I didn't have much of a choice. I grabbed my zip and eased my arms through the now cold, wet sleeves and then got on the side jet. I rode toward the tree line that was about 50 meters away. These trees were significantly smaller than the redwoods I'd slept under but they were still taller than any of the buildings in New Frisco. The shortest ones couldn't have been less than 40 meters or so. Some treetops were the stretched-out triangles of pines, while others were the rounded deciduous types I'd seen farther north. The sidejet easily coasted over the stream and up the slight rise to the tree line. My thoughts raced as I wondered what was the best way to approach these people. They had to be people who'd escaped from one of the cities maybe even New Frisco. Enforcers could come out here to try bringing them back. If so, was I better off taking the side jet or leaving it? I decided the walk might help my muscles loosen up somewhat, and it was better to be safe than sorry. I laughed at that thought, just like the announcers always said. But they were probably right this time. I didn't want to startle whoever that was in there. I wondered if they knew I was around. Only one way to find out. Bren always said that. He'd always been braver than me, like when we'd first met. I'd never have thought another kid would do something like help me sit up in my desk. They would have been too embarrassed. But Bren was just a good guy. I parked the side jet about ten meters past the tree line, behind a few saplings, hoping to keep it from being noticed by anybody who might come by. I chose a dark, sticky pine tree to hide the side jet behind. I was probably being more careful than I needed to be in the middle of the wilderness. There was no way anyone else could possibly stop by this area anytime soon. This was in the middle of nowhere. A hundred years ago, people had regularly driven by on that road. I wondered if they ever came out and appreciated what the world looked like without people messing it up. As I walked in the direction that I saw the column of smoke rising, I tried to imagine how these people must live, how they slept and ate. It was possible they grew their own food or even killed animals. 
No lights, no nutrition center to make sure you got exactly the right food every day. No speakers blaring into your ears every second that you walked down the rubbery sidewalks of downtown. No long classes or boring shifts in the domes or at the dumps. You could do whatever you wanted, whenever. My path took me around countless trees, and I had to dodge roots almost constantly. The stiffness in my body made the sometimes jarring path hurt. I found myself wincing with nearly every step. At least there wasn't any of the tall grass that had grabbed at my pants as I'd crossed the field between the road and the forest. I'd been wrong, too. After twenty minutes, I was sure I'd walked a kilometer or more, but I still couldn't see or hear any people. I did hear birds chirping and what seemed like an almost imperceptible hum. It wasn't the hum of machinery like the Psyjet or the things in the engineering dome. This hum was almost more felt than seen. If I stood still enough, I thought I could probably feel the hum under my feet and on my skin. It was as if the voices of the birds, the trees, the other vegetation, and whatever different animals called the forest their home, all combined into a faint rhythm I could just barely make out. Was it ever completely silent in the forest? I hadn't noticed any noises last night, but I'd been so tired that I doubted I would have even heard enforcers if they had shown up. As I made my way through the forest, enjoying the strange warm smells that came to me, I realized that the trees were growing more thickly and that there was more brush. I had to struggle pretty hard at times to break through some of the tight weaves of low trees and bushes. I was making so much noise that it shouldn't have come as a surprise when, as I drew even closer to the smoke column, two men appeared in front of me, and I heard another step behind me. But it did surprise me, and my heart felt like it jumped up to my throat. I glanced quickly behind me and then forward again. All three men carried black weapons that looked like weathered keepers. The men wore mottled pants and loose-fitting shirts, all of them in earthy tones. They also wore some kind of boot that I'd never seen, with thick soles and a dull brown finish. Their hair was longer than the rules in New Frisco allowed, and the man behind me wore a beard. Don't move, the one behind me said. I had to stay calm, despite my shock at actually finding people out here. What would they do with me? As long as there was food involved, I didn't really care. I stood still and put out my left hand. It's okay. I said, don't move. Something hard jabbed me on my back. I winced. I'm not. Who are you? asked one of the men in front of me. His hair was dark brown, whereas his companion's was so blonde that it looked almost white. Where did you come from? Nobody. I felt defensive. I wasn't trying to attack them. They could tell I was alone and beat up. Your name? growled the blonde. His voice sounded like the propulsion unit on an enforcer pod, high-pitched, breathy, and with a strange whine on the top end of it. Now! Nick! I looked around. What is wrong with these guys? Nick Granger, I'm from New Frisco. The men in front of me looked at each other for a long moment. The blonde turned to me. What are you doing here? I got away. I had to leave, I said. And why are you doing this? I'm just looking for some help. You've come to the wrong place, the blonde rasped. Go home. The brown-haired one stepped closer to the blonde and whispered in his ear. The blonde shook his head. Not worth it. Look, I can't go back. I tried to keep my voice strong, but last night's events were piling up in my head. My throat tightened. But if you won't help me, fine. I'll go somewhere else. I made as if to turn. Not yet, the one behind me said. He prodded me with his weapon again. First, we get answers. Stan, the blonde rasped. We'll get him here. He gestured to the small clearing where they had stopped me. Come on, the brown-haired one said. He's hurt. Dolfo, he's obviously in trouble. Doesn't matter, the blonde Dolfo said. No chances. He looked over my shoulder. Bind him. I felt the gun shift at my back as the bearded man, who must be Stan, pulled some thick twine from a pocket. Briefly, I entertained the idea that maybe I could make a break for it. 
But there was no point in that. Maybe they'd still help me if they got their answers. Stan reached for my left arm and tugged it behind my back, going for my right arm too. I winced and hissed, dodging his second grab. Hey! he cried out. Dolfo was on me in less than a second, using his weapon as a club on my side and shoulder. Fresh agony lit up my injured right arm and ribs and I nearly blacked out, dropping to my knees. What was wrong with this guy? As I dropped, Stan had let go of my left arm, so now it was free to cradle my right arm tightly to my stomach. Stop! I shouted. What are you doing? Bind him! Dolfo repeated, threatening me with his gun again. Stan went for my arms, and although I tried to dodge again, he got both. He yanked my right arm, and a volcano of white agony exploded. My vision went bright and then completely black. Stan pushed me hard, and suddenly I was on my stomach, the spears of pain flashing through me. Someone was screaming. When my throat felt like it was shredding, I realized it was me. I heard voices shouting as my awareness faded. I couldn't believe the pain. I felt like a wild animal was chewing my arm off. Stop it! Stan, let him go! My arm dissolved into shards of flaming glass, and I blacked out for a moment. When I came to, I was being pushed over onto my back. My right arm had completely stiffened up again, and it was throbbing along the entire length with blinding pain. My stomach heaved, and all the water I drank earlier splattered across my chest. Whoever was pushing me over shouted, Hey! and let go. I felt him jump away from me. Laughter echoed around me. It sounded like a metal brush sliding down pavement. Had to be Dolfo. See where kindness gets you! Shut up! The man next to me said. I opened my eyes. It was the brown-haired one, the one without a beard. He leaned closer. You're injured! I swallowed, trying to open my throat. I felt pulverized, totally empty. The pain in my arm stole any thought before it could solidify. The man lifted my injured arm. The added pain simply made the bright throbbing glow hotter. I groaned and wished I could black out, maybe for longer. No, I said. The simple word sounded odd to me, like I'd heard it through a long tunnel. Stan, Dolfo, this boy's seriously hurt. The man set my arm down, leaving it slightly bent on my torso. Back off! He could be faking, came the raspy voice. He's not. This arm's broken at least a little. You're too trusting, Matt, Dolfo said. I tried to crane my neck a little to see where the blonde man was standing. The movement tugged my shoulder too much and another pain flared up. Would the throbbing ever go away? Shut up, the man kneeling next to me said. Then he turned to me. It's okay. I can see you're hurt. His eyes moved away from mine and took me in from head to toe. Badly. You're a mess. I grunted. I knew that. Did they have anything that would stop this pain? I would almost go to New Frisco right now just to get some of the painkiller that the meds handed out. I needed a huge dose. My name's Matt, the man said. Sorry about that. We'll help you, he looked up. I wished they'd move faster. Tendrils of pain made their way from my arm into my chest. I felt like my whole body would be consumed. It had to stop. Maybe the arm just needed to be cut off. Stan, Dolfo, come on. Let's get him up. I watched as Matt stood and moved to my left side. But don't touch his right arm. Being manhandled to my feet felt almost as bad as getting hit by rubber bullets. Matt pulled my left arm across his shoulders. You can stand, so do it. I planted my feet, gritting my teeth. The throbbing wasn't fading. I'd never felt this kind of agony before. I couldn't catch my breath, and my heart slammed loudly in my chest and behind my eyes. I felt tears streaming down my cheeks, but I didn't care. Hold him! Dolfo grunted. Matt's grip on me tightened, but not painfully. Dolfo padded under my arms, then down my sides and legs. When he got to my zip pocket, he found the nano cutter and pulled it out. He examined it. Looks useful. Hey, I said, that's mine. Dolfo stopped for a moment and fixed me with a bemused expression. Not anymore. 
He shoved it in a pocket of his light coat and finished whatever he was doing. Did he think I had weapons? When he was done, he turned and nodded to Stan. Come on, Matt said. It's not far. He took a step. He nearly dragged me the first few meters, but I was finally able to get my legs to listen to me. Matt was a few inches taller than me, so I felt like I was being pulled and stretched the entire time. I gulped air. Stan was walking ahead of us while Dolfo took up the rear. Did he think I was going to try to get away? Was he insane? Couldn't he see the shape I was in? Anger at the treatment I'd received flared in me. Tucking my arm tightly to my abdomen to keep it from being jostled, I tried harder to keep up with Matt. Dodging brush, roots, and tree trunks became more difficult as Matt tried to support me through the walk. A couple of times I felt him nearly lose his grip. Once I stumbled and slipped nearly free of him. I went to a knee, resisting the urge to stop my fall with my right arm. Sorry, Matt said. He grimaced and helped me back up. Sorry, you're heavier than you look. I grunted. After walking what felt like at least a kilometer, we rounded a hill and came to the camp. This deep into the trees, I hadn't been able to see the column of smoke anymore, so I was surprised to suddenly see at least twenty people working around a fire and several structures. Our appearance brought the camp to a momentary standstill. Then voices were raised and people burst into motion. Several men approached at a run, grabbing guns from a row of weapons leaning against a rock. Women called to children, and it looked like they began to tear down the camp. It's okay, Matt called. It's all right. He's not a ranger. He's hurt. He's alone, Stan chimed in. Broken arm. Dolfo appeared, walking around us and toward the fire. Unless it's a trap. I wanted to punch the raspy-voiced blonde man. What a bug-eater. Stan called three of the men with weapons and sent them back out to patrol the forest. I assumed they were to take the place of him, Matt, and Dolfo. Matt helped me sit on a small chair that looked like it folded up. Wendy, he called out. Bring your kit! He helped me out of my zip and dropped it to the ground. A blonde woman, her hair just short of her shoulders, jogged over a moment later. She was young, maybe three or four years older than me. She carried a black case with a soft covering. Snapping it open, she kneeled in front of me. What's the damage? Not sure, Matt said, touching the woman gently on her shoulder. His right arm might be broken. He bent and examined my elbow. It's torn up pretty bad, he grimaced. We didn't help. Tried to bind him until he collapsed, screaming. As Wendy bent to examine my arm, I felt myself start to shake. The adrenaline from the pain and fear of the last half hour had obviously faded. I clenched my jaw, trying to hold myself together. What happened? Wendy asked. She was trying to be gentle, but every movement of my arm felt like I was being stabbed. I tried to explain, but couldn't get the words out. I cleared my throat, swallowed. I fell, hit my elbow. What else? I met her gaze. She had lifted my shirt. Black and purple spots the size of small fists covered my torso. Wendy moved behind me and pulled the shirt higher. Pull your left arm through. She sounded like the meds in New Frisco. Zero sympathy. Wendy worked my shirt over my right arm and dropped it to the ground on top of my zip. You're covered in bruises. Scrapes too. A couple of cuts. Bullets, it looks like. I hissed as she touched a few spots on my back and neck. Good to know, I said. Any painkiller? Sure, Wendy said. But what happened? Was she serious? She was going to keep me in pain until I told her the story? I had to get out of New Frisco. The enforcers didn't want me to. Why? What'd you do? Kill someone? Wendy had made her way all the way around me and now crouched in front of me again. A beat then another heartbeat. Bren. Again, I couldn't speak. My face heated up as the image of Bren's dead face hit me. Yes, I'd killed someone. Grief and guilt made me want to curl into a ball. I looked away, my vision blurring. Hey, no, no, sorry, Wendy said. Her hand, hot and gentle, touched my knee. I looked down at her arm. It 
looked strange. I'm sorry. It's okay. I heard her pull something from her open case. Here, this will help the pain. The sharp jab of the needle was almost undetectable against the flood of agony that still throbbed in my arm. Can you move it? I was glad that her questions had stopped and that she had given me the shot, but I almost regretted that she didn't ask more. The need to unload the burden of last night was suddenly almost too much. No, not much. There's a lot of swelling. Do you still need me? Matt asked. I glanced up at him. He was watching a group of men, with Dolfo and Stan at the center, who were talking near one of the tents. Not for now. Wendy offered Matt a warm smile. He touched her shoulder again and moved away. She searched my face. Is that kicking in? Miraculously, the painkiller she'd given me had brought the agony in my arm down some. I didn't dare move the arm for fear the pain would come back. I think so. We'll give it another few minutes, and then I'll image it so we can figure out what's going on in there. Okay. Her eyes, dark green, held mine tightly. You're going to have to tell us what happened sometime. You need to be ready. I nodded. The pain dropped another notch. Okay. Let's start with your name, Wendy said. Nick. I glanced around the campsite. People had gone back to their tasks, but were no longer taking down the campsite. They were moving slowly, and everyone looked my way every few seconds. Nick Granger. Wendy put her hand back on my knee. There was still something strange about her arm, and she stood. I'm Wendy. She followed my gaze and then turned to me again. We're wanderers. The way she said the last word was how people of New Frisco said they were Friskins. The wanderers? You're real? I asked. I sighed as the pain in my arm settled to a dull throb. Yes, we're real. Wendy gestured around us. We don't belong to a city or any person. We live the way we choose. That sounded incredible. But they let you? They try to find us. She held up her left wrist, and I realized why her arm seemed so strange-looking. She wasn't wearing a papa. But no papas means no tracking device and no knockout. I glanced at my left arm. I don't either. Have the tracker, I mean. I know. We scanned you. If you did, you wouldn't be here. I took it out before I left New Frisco. Her eyebrows rose. Really? Good with tech? You might come in handy. A little seed of hope planted in me. I can stay? Wendy pulled a complicated-looking device from her bag. She unfolded a cuff and slid it up my arm, widening it as she pushed it. I don't know. That depends on a lot of things. She held the cuff just above my elbow. The device activated with a soft beep. This was her imager. I'd never seen one so compact. The ones that the med techs in New Frisco used were much larger. The group of men, now including Matt, Stan, Dolfo, and three others, approached and stopped in front of me. Who are you? This was asked by the shortest of the men. He had to be shorter than me by an inch or two. His reddish-brown hair was long but well-kept. He had a narrow beard just under his lip that went in a straight line down his chin and stopped right above his Adam's apple. Nick Granger. You came from New Frisco? I wondered if this guy was the leader of the group. Yeah. Why? His blue eyes were the color of an early twilight sky. Why did you leave? I swallowed, fighting back the image of Bren on the street. Something happened. I couldn't stay. What happened? Small stress fracture in the ulna, Wendy said, standing. That's why it hurts so much. But it will heal okay if you keep it immobile. Her eyes met mine. Grateful for the moment she'd given me to gather my thoughts, I decided to tell the whole story. I might be immune to the bug. Chapter 16 Several of the men exchanged looks, their expressions unreadable. What? I asked. Wendy was studying me with a strange expression, almost pitying. What's your name again? Matt said. Nick. Nick? Matt let out a breath. Ha! <sighs> Look, there's no bug. 
It's gone. No, it's not. I tried to keep the tremor I felt in my chest out of my voice. It's not. Yes, it is, Wendy said. She crouched again and started working on my injured arm. You saw that we don't have those festering papas. No papas, no knockouts. Nobody out here dies of the bug, and we don't care about our heart rate. Forget it, Dolfo rasped. Tell us why you're here. I leveled a glare at him. The bug had to still be in the air. Why else would Brent have died? Nick, the short man said. We need to know what brought you out here. It's a dangerous thing to trust people here in the wilderness. He talked funny. He didn't sound natural, more like the way a programmed bot would speak if the programmer wanted to make it sound human. The leader crouched next to Wendy, using a penetrating gaze to try to get my attention. My teachers had been trying to do that for years. It didn't work. I didn't mind telling these people my story, but this guy kind of got on my nerves. My name is Gabe, he said. I'm the leader of this triune. It's my job to keep everyone here safe. I want to help you, but these people, he gestured at the campsite, are my family. They come first. I nodded. It's okay. I'll tell you what happened. I launched into my story. As I spoke, Wendy continued working on my arm, cleaning it carefully and running her fingers around my elbow for a while. She stopped for a moment, giving my leg a squeeze as I related what had happened to Bren. I tried to keep that part brief, but I still had trouble getting through it. More of the people had come, some of them bringing extra chairs. Everyone was sitting by the time I got to breaking into the engineering dome. A few children played near a big tent. One of them glanced at me with the greenest eyes I'd ever seen. I looked back at my audience again. I decided to leave out specific mentions of the Psyjet. I wanted to trust these people, and most of them seemed nice and even normal. But Gabe made me nervous. He'd even said that trust was dangerous. Having the Psyjet as my secret backup felt like the smart move. So I found another way out and ran for it. I got on my cycle. The lie hurt a bit, but there was no other way to explain how I'd come so far. I talked about finding a place to hide and taking out the tracker and the knockout from my papa. Why didn't you just take the whole thing off and toss it? Stan asked. Easier that way. Yeah, I said slowly, thinking fast. But I thought they might take a while looking for the tracker, since it's so small, before they realized they weren't following me anymore. I stopped. That made sense, right? It only took me a few more minutes to tell the rest of the story. I rode fast the entire night. I haven't slept or eaten. My cycle died a ways back. I hoped they wouldn't ask too many more questions. By the time I was done, my right arm was wrapped tightly in a bandage that seemed to be hardening by the minute into a light cast. The cast went all the way up past my elbow, locking my arm into a bent position. Wendy had also tied a sling around my neck to hold the arm up. You rode nearly a hundred kilometers in one night? Gabe's voice dripped with doubt. I looked at my papa. A night and half a day, yeah. I didn't want to be caught. I swallowed, taking a slow breath to calm my pounding heart. I still don't. With a broken arm? Dolfo smirked. I glared at him. I don't pedal with my arms. A moment of silence lengthened into a minute. Some of the men glanced at each other, but everyone waited, clearly deferring to Gabe. He finally sighed. And why did you come south? Angel Town. I thought I could figure out if I was actually immune there, where nobody knows me. It was nice to tell a simple truth. I was glad I hadn't lied much and wondered again if I should have lied at all. Gabe just gave me a bad feeling. And you just happened to find us? I saw the smoke. It wasn't hard. I was at the stream over there. I pointed with my chin back toward the road. If you don't want people to find you, maybe you shouldn't have a fire. Gabe's eyes widened. Then he smiled, although the smile got nowhere near his eyes. It's certainly true that our fire was not up to our normal standards earlier. He gave a boy a couple years younger than me a pointed look. Not everyone has mastered the art of the smokeless fire yet. 
Now that the story was over, people had started filtering off. Soon, only Gabe, Dolfo, Matt, Stan, and Wendy remained. Well, Nick. Gabe reached for and grabbed Stan's arm and nodded at the bearded man. Stan walked toward one of the five or six tents. We have no reason to disbelieve your story. I had no idea how to respond to that. Uh, good? You must be hungry, Gabe said. Matt, Dolfo, would you please get Nick some lunch? Matt gave Gabe a quizzical look, but obeyed. He and Dolfo made their way to the fire. Thanks, I said. Wait a second. But if the bug isn't around anymore, why did it kill my friend? Gabe shook his head. I have no idea. But we are proof it is not in the air. All of this was making my head swim. I needed to figure out what was going on. How was his arm? Gabe turned his strangely insincere gaze on Wendy. It's not a bad break, but it will take a while to heal all the way. The cast should stay on for a couple of weeks. He had a pretty bad gash on the elbow, but that's clean and closed now. Wendy walked slowly around me. He's covered in all kinds of bruises, a few from rubber bullets, others from who knows what. A couple shallow cuts from what I guess were bullets. The real thing. Nothing to be done for those, and they'll heal soon enough. Gabe extended his arm expansively. Welcome to the Wanderers. We are the Hawk Triune. Triune? My legs were beginning to cramp up, so I extended them, needing to adjust my balance so the small chair didn't fall over. That's right, Gabe said. Wendy, thank you. If you would help break camp. Wendy took her satchel and headed off, giving me an encouraging smile as she went. Gabe turned back to me. The triunes are how the wanderers organize themselves. Triune means three in one. We are three families who have come together to live our lives with one purpose, to live our way free of the oppression of the new chapter. It sounded like paradise. As Gabe continued, I watched everyone pitch in to break the camp. They must have moved to their campsite every day. The tents were incredible. They were all the same, and each one stood at least two meters tall. At their base, they had to be at least six meters on each side. They looked like the back of an old creature called an armadillo, with long, curving, articulated panels extending from one side to the other side. The pieces gave the tent a domed appearance, which must have been great against rain. It looked like one tent had been completely emptied because, as I half-listened to Gabe go on about the freedom of the wilderness, a woman closed the front of one of the tents, and all the people moved to start unloading the others. The woman stepped on a small, hand-sized pad attached to the front of the tent. The tent shook a couple times. Before doing so, she had closed the front of the tent so that it was all smooth, curving pieces of some kind. It wasn't just fabric. It had to be some kind of synthetic material that could stiffen up somehow. When the woman stepped on the pad, the tent shook a couple of times. The articulated panels seemed to loosen, and then the bottommost front panel slid upwards. As it passed the next panel, they stuck together and kept sliding, slowly collecting all the curving panels. When it was done, the panels lay on the ground, looking like one much thicker panel. Then the last panel folded in on itself twice. All that was left was a rectangle the size of a cycle wheel and a ground cloth. The woman seemed to have no trouble lifting the tent rectangle, and she stowed it in a nearby pack. What all of this means, Gabe said, is that wanderers are very protective of their freedom. We get together once every year to council, and sometimes we cross paths with other triunes. But usually we are on our own, which is how we like it, and we stay under the radar of enforcers and rangers. He wasn't even looking at me. What's a ranger? I wanted one of those tents. Maybe I could live like them, eventually even start a family, and become part of a triune. I couldn't imagine a better life. No blaring speakers, no admins, no boring classes. An enforcer whose job is, specifically, to patrol the wilderness, looking for wanderers and escapees from their cities. 
Dave's expression said a lot. Escapees like me. They were more like me. Dolfo showed up then with a lightweight plate carrying what looked like tomatoes, what I guessed was cheese, and a dark, glistening lump. A fork and knife were stuck in the dark material. Dolfo handed the plate to me with a smirk, lifted his eyebrows at me, and then departed again. Please, Gabe said. Enjoy your lunch. We will be leaving shortly. He wandered away. Stan was right behind Dolfo, with a cup in his hand. Here you go. His voice was soft, as if it somehow had to fight through his thick beard. I sipped the drink. It was sweet and tart, and really good. I took a few gulps and had to fight the urge to slurp it all down. I blinked drowsily. I needed more sleep. I set the cup on a flat rock near me and gobbled the tomatoes and cheese. The tomatoes were strong and so full of tomato water that some dribbled down my chin. The cheese looked like a basic protein paste block, so I was surprised by how thick the flavor was. I poked at the dark stuff. It looked and smelled like it had been cooked over a fire. I stabbed it with the fork again, and pale pink juice dribbled out. Awkwardly using my left hand, I cut the thing with the sharp knife. Spearing the chunk I'd cut off the weird stuff, I popped it in my mouth with a little fear. Kind of salty. Firm, yet easily chewed. I'd never had anything like it. What is this? I asked nobody in particular, since everyone in the camp was occupied with other tasks. A little girl, who was passing by just then, glanced at me. Deer, duh, she laughed. Didn't you ever eat deer before? I coughed, so surprised that I almost choked. Deer? I knew what a deer was. We'd learned in ecology. Sure, it's too salty today, but that's because Anna made it, and she cooks bad. I was eating deer meat. It was good. Nothing like the protein pastes we got in New Frisco. I took another bite, chewing around a yawn. I hoped I could stay awake long enough to finish it. The little girl dashed away. I swigged more of the drink and cut the deer meat into a few more chunks, wolfing them down between tastes of the sweet liquid. Why was I suddenly so sleepy? Must have been because of last night's insanity. Maybe if I just leaned back on the tree trunk behind me. I popped the last morsel of deer meat into my mouth. It was just as delicious as the first. Chapter 17 I blinked heavily, tasting a strange combination of sweetness and deer meat. The last bite of deer meat was still in my mouth. Turning my head, I spat out the partially chewed chunk, confused. I didn't know how I could have been tired enough to fall asleep on that uncomfortable chair, especially while I was eating. Ridiculous. And how had I gotten on my back? I blinked again, cool awareness somewhat dissipating the fog in my head. Trees stretched tall and intertwined many meters above me. Beyond them, the sky glowed the blue of late afternoon. The pain in my right arm had returned somewhat, but it was more of an insistent throb than the stabbing agony of before. Birds were singing, and there was an unidentifiable creaking and whispering. The leaves overhead shook back and forth in the breeze. That had to be the whispering. I pushed myself up, having to roll a bit to the side in order to do so with one hand. New confusion arrived, bringing sudden fear. I was alone. All I could see were countless trees, brush, and saplings, forest flowers, and small rocky hills. I saw no sign of the wanderers and no sign of their camp. Gaining my feet, I looked closer. They may have carried me off somewhere away from their camp, hoping I couldn't find my way back. I took a somewhat shaky step, kicking something. I bent to investigate, shaking my head to finish clearing it. I found a pile consisting of my zip and a small pouch. I looked around again. As I turned in place, I felt an eerie sense of familiarity. That rocky mound and that particularly fat pine tree? I'd seen them before. Grabbing my zip and the pouch, I hurriedly walked to the other side of the mound and stepped back from it a few paces. Yes, that was the pile of rocks we'd come around, 
on our final approach to the Hawk Triune's campsite. I headed back to where I'd woken up. This was the campsite, right here. But the wanderers were gone. I walked in a slow circle where I was sure the campsite had been. Fear and confusion welled up. Had I dreamt the entire encounter? The cast on my arm proved they had been real. Wendy had really been there, Matt too, along with the others. Now there was no sign of them. The campsite had been fairly big, and there had been at least five of those amazing tents, and a fire pit. All that I saw now was a clearing populated by moss-covered rocks, small brush, and one or two saplings as tall as me. Old brown and yellow leaves from the previous fall, I guessed, littered the ground haphazardly along with dry twigs here and there. This was completely impossible. There had to be a sign of them somewhere. I estimated where the fire had been, cleared the ground of leaves, and then dug somewhat with my heel. Just dry dirt with moist, dark earth under it. I dropped to my knees and grabbed a thick nearby twig. Using the twig, I dug a few inches deep. Nothing. How could they have left me? Why would they feed me then disappear? I put my hands on my knees to catch my breath, blinking away the last of the sleep. How could they have gone without leaving any sign of their presence? I moved a few feet to the left and dug into the ground again, desperation filling me. This time I found it. About ten centimeters down, the twig cut through a layer of ash. I wasn't going crazy. I dropped the twig and filled in the small hole, standing quickly. I grabbed the nearest sapling and tugged hard with my left arm. This sent twinges of pain from my right arm into my neck, so I stopped. But the small tree hadn't budged. I remembered Gabe saying that they made sure that they never left any evidence of where they'd been or where they were going, since the rangers could follow even the smallest of trails. I hadn't imagined that they could completely eradicate all signs of their existence, disappearing like fog in the hot sun. And I hadn't expected to be the one they were hiding from. Bitter anger, tasting of the sweet drink I'd been given, tied my stomach into a knot. They'd said they would help me. It didn't matter. I was alone again. If the wanderers were so good that rangers, who sounded somehow meaner than enforcers, couldn't find them, there was no way I could either. The brief glimpse of freedom had disappeared. Just great. Now I had nowhere to go. They'd said the bug was gone, and I had to believe them. None of them wore a papa. They wore brown and green clothes, whatever they wanted, I guessed ate whatever they wanted, and did anything they liked. They ate real meat, lived free of the constant monitoring of the new chapter, and I dropped to the ground, my chest tight. And they hadn't wanted me along. They had left me even though they knew I needed help. When Wendy had been so kind, and Matt as well, I'd thought it was over. For a few minutes, I'd thought that I found a new home. I knew my parents might have missed me, but living as a wanderer would have been better than going back to New Frisco and letting them kill me. The bug was definitely gone, or it was somehow just in the air around the new chapter cities? That was dumb. It had to be gone. That made sense, but the only problem was Bren. The bug got him. It got my best friend, but not me. Tears blurred my vision, my chest squeezing tight so I had trouble breathing. And now I was alone, again. I'd somehow killed my friend, and now I was in the middle of nowhere with a broken arm. The forest said nothing as the guilt swept over me. I'd never see him again. The storm that had threatened every time I thought of Bren's last moments finally broke. I cried. I felt the tears run down my cheeks, hot like the molten grief inside. I'd done it. It was my fault. His family would blame me, and they should. I wanted to break something, break myself, go back and tell yesterday's me not to do it, not to push. I bent forward and clenched the side of my head with my good hand. They should blame me. It was my fault. A few minutes later, I sat up and scrubbed my cheeks, grateful for the solitude. I was such a baby, fifteen years old and crying in the middle of the forest. I sucked in a slow breath held it for a moment, and then let it go. My chest cavity felt carved, 
cleaned out, scraped raw, but cleaned out. This was my fault, but it couldn't be entirely my fault, because the bug was gone. The Papa-less wanderers were proof of that. I needed to know why my friend had died when both the wanderers and I were still alive. I had to go back to New Frisco. But for a moment, I wanted to sit in the stillness, letting the peaceful noises of the forest wash over me. Some kind of tapping or knocking sounded from high above me and some distance away. I wondered briefly what made that noise. I sat up straight, straining my ears. This new noise sounded different, had a different pitch to it. Man-made. I pushed to my feet. It was like the sound of propulsion units, but muffled. It had to be rangers or enforcers. Had they seen the wanderer's smoke too? If so, what had taken them so long? Not that it mattered. I would never find out what had happened to Bren if I let myself get captured. Holding the pouch, which I really wanted to open, I threaded my stiff right arm through the zip and then struggled the rest of the way into it, already jogging away from the campsite. I needed to get back to the side jet, but I also had to avoid the rangers or enforcers. They were either going to kill me here in the middle of nowhere or take me back to New Frisco. They would probably be looking for a big group, a triune, not a single person. But Gabe had said that the rangers could follow even the smallest of trails. I glanced behind me, unable to detect any sort of trail. I guessed I should try not to leave broken leaves or twigs behind me. I debated whether to try to find a hiding place or just make it back to the side jet and try to get away before they could catch me. Hiding seemed like a dangerous risk. These rangers, if this was rangers, had to know their way around the forest better than me. With painkiller blurring the injuries of the night before, I felt strong again, albeit pretty stiff still. If I could stay out of sight and get to the side jet fast enough, I could be long gone before the rangers followed my trail, and then I could go back to New Frisco and figure out what had killed Bren. I broke into a run, dodging trees and hopping over low bushes. For a minute or so, I jogged along a shallow ravine that seemed to be all that was left of an old stream. Rocks, leaves, and spindly brush coated the floor of the ravine. The whine of the vehicle grew louder as it approached the abandoned campsite. I had to move faster. I turned left, hoping to take a straight shot toward the side jet. I rounded a tight group of pines and had to grab a tree to help me stop. Movement ahead of me! I ducked behind the tree I was holding and craned to see. Phantoms in mottled green and brown uniforms emerged from the forest, appearing to somehow float. They wore masks with dark lenses. They carried guns like I'd never seen, with multiple short barrels, very short handles in the back, and metal painted to match their uniforms. And they were coming toward me. Chapter 18 Bug me, I was an idiot. But the rangers knew what they were doing. They knew any wanderer would hear their vehicle so they had set up this ambush, hoping to herd the wanderers into the arms of this group. But the wanderers were long gone, and I was the one being herded. I wanted to stop and figure out why the rangers had taken so long if they had seen the smoke. Something about their strange delay tickled the back of my mind. But I had to get out of there. Had to get to the side jet. Scanning the area, it became clear that the eight or so rangers ahead of me had been doing this for a long time. They were fanning out, but they hadn't yet circled around me. I guessed that the ones in the vehicle I'd heard were probably on the ground by now and were coming my way. I had to move. Staying low, I squirmed backward, hoping to keep the trees between me and the rangers. The cast on my right arm got in the way, but I was able to make slow progress. After about five meters of this, I felt my feet start to dip downward. The ravine. The plan came to me in the space of a blink. I scooted further backward. As I started going downhill, gravity helped me. Gaining the bottom of the dry stream bed, I took off, bent low in a crouch. My feet told me that under the layer of dirt and leaves, there were rounded rocks lining the path. I would need to be careful. 
or I would twist an ankle. I hoped this ravine went a long ways. If I could get beyond the line of the rangers, I could circle back around toward the sidejet. As I scampered down the ravine, gratitude at Wendy's painkiller filled me. Moving didn't make me want to scream in agony, and the sudden nap, combined with the long rest I'd gotten earlier, had renewed my energy a lot. I didn't feel great, but I did feel like I could manage. Thinking of Wendy reminded me of the pouch I still gripped in my left hand. I continued jogging in kind of a rough lope, pulled the drawstring on the pouch open, transferred it to my right hand, and rummaged around in the bag. The first thing I found was a small orange container that rattled when I moved it. That must be painkillers. Next, I found a few small silvery packets. I pulled one out. Blocky black print on it said, Emergency rations, just add water. Nice. It was probably protein paste. I thought that would be all there was in the pouch, but when I put the silvery packet back, my fingers brushed something that crinkled. I pulled this out and was surprised to see it was paper. Wood fiber paper had been banned in the new chapter since its beginning. The paper was folded small. I stopped, grateful for the chance to catch my breath. I dropped to my knees, instantly regretting it. The rocks did not feel good. I unfolded the paper. I'm sorry. The hair on my neck stood up, tingles crawling like claws down my spine. Sorry for what? The handwriting was nearly illegible. I had to give the last couple of lines a few tries before I decoded them. Don't take the painkillers. One's a tracker. They're scared the enforcers will come after you. Sorry, Wendy. She had spelled plenty wrong, but I got the message, despite the obsolete C's. Now my sudden nap made sense. They had drugged me. And the rangers? The wanderers had set this whole thing up. I swore. Unbelievable! The festering, buggy pieces of infection had not only abandoned me, but they'd also tried to deliver me right to the rangers. I yanked the small container of large pills out of the pouch and flung it as far as I could into the forest. I ducked immediately but heard what sounded like the thing hitting the trunk of a tree. Good. Maybe the pills scattering would confuse the rangers for a minute or so. I broke into a jog, moving faster now and muttering to myself what I would do to Gabe if I ever saw him again. At least Wendy had remembered that she was a human. Oh, there wasn't time for this. I needed to focus on getting away. I slowed a little and glanced to the right and left and then behind me. No sign of rangers. A few seconds later, I realized the banks of the ravine were getting lower and that I was going slightly downhill and turning slowly left which I felt like was taking me farther from where I'd stood the side jet. Fifty meters later, the ravine had disappeared, and I was running along a narrow valley between two long, gradually sloping hills, with forest stretching up the hills as far as I could see. I hoped that I'd gone far enough and that the rangers were closing in on a pill. I glanced behind me and the taste of betrayal was swallowed up in sudden fear, not more than fifty or sixty meters behind me were three rangers moving fast around trees and coming right at me. Darting up the hill to my right, I poured on the speed as much as I could, using tree trunks to help me change directions fast. I couldn't help tossing another look behind me. My sudden burst of speed had widened the gap, but the rangers were coming fast. Their strange, smooth movement and completely covered faces and those dark lenses gave me the feeling that they weren't quite human. Or were more than human. Were they even running? I should be able to run faster or at least longer than they could since I'd been pushing for so long. Rangers had to have the knockout too, didn't they? I took another long look at them. Their legs were only moving slightly and they weren't facing me. It was as if they were moving toward me, sideways, and closing the gap. Go. I had to go. I tore up the hill, breath coming in ragged gasps. I needed my side jet. Ahead of me was a particularly thick cluster of trees. I made for it, hoping it would slow the three rangers down whether they decided to go through it or had to go around. My left shoulder banged painfully into a rough trunk, but I was through the cluster and near the top of the hill. I fought the urge to check on the rangers. 
Not stopping, I crested the hill and ran along the top for a moment, trying to get my bearings. The top of the hill ran wide and flat for quite a ways, but sloped back down, although this slope was even more gentle than the one I'd come up, which meant I wouldn't be able to get over the top of the hill and down the other side without being wide open. If my sense of direction wasn't betraying me, I needed to make my way left in order to make it back to the road. If I could get back there, I would find the stream and then follow it to the side jet. But for now, I stayed on the wide top of the hill. There were fewer trees here, and I felt like I could make better speed. I risked a glance backward. One ranger was maybe 30 meters back, and he was, at that moment, raising his weapon to point it at me. I didn't see the other rangers. I turned back and heard a loud bang, and my foot caught on a root I didn't see. I went down painfully, but I was moving so fast that I tumbled down the hill I'd come up. I slammed against a tree trunk, luckily on my left side. I cried out, but pushed myself up and kept going. Another ranger was coming right at me, angling up the hill and totally silent. He fired his gun. A line of fire cut across my left shoulder. Not a rubber bullet. I dodged and ducked, instinct telling me to keep the trees between me and the ranger. The other two rangers had to be coming up behind me. I was trapped. They moved so fast, and they had to know I was completely overmatched. I poured on some speed, angling to try to get in front of the ranger that was coming up the hill. Whatever he was using, or riding, that helped him move so smoothly seemed to go slower up the hill. Shoving the pouch I'd been given into the left pocket of my zip, I made as if to turn back up the hill, still keeping the trees between me and the ranger, who was maybe eight meters back now. I grabbed a low branch and whipped myself back the other direction. I hoped my sudden change in direction had thrown off the ranger's shot, because I launched myself directly at him. He must have been surprised because he still had his gun high, even as I hit him low, right at the knees. My head banged painfully against the armor on his calf, but I heard him grunt as he hit the ground. The weapon clattered against a tree trunk a meter away. I flung myself to my feet and aimed a kick at his face. But the guy wasn't moving. His back was angled against the bottom of a tree. He must have been knocked out cold. Triumph lasted maybe a second. A shout. Another ranger hurtled down the hill, maybe twenty meters away. I looked toward the unconscious ranger's feet. His boots were attached to a strange-looking device. It was maybe a meter long, flat on the top, and had small propulsion units bristling all along the bottom of it. Somehow those units ran completely silently, making the rangers even creepier. It was some kind of hoverboard. I wanted to take it, but wasn't sure I'd be able to use it without the boots. No time. I spun and took off again. Another loud bang echoed among the trees, a huge divot exploding out of a tree trunk to my right. Definitely not rubber bullets. That trick wouldn't work again. I just had to keep moving, see if I could find some way to outdistance these guys. If I could get out of their line of sight, I might be able to hide. Not much chance of that. All around me were low, slow hills and trees. The trees clustered here and there but were widely spaced in other areas, and I couldn't keep this up for long. The rangers didn't have to expend much energy with those hoverboard things, but I was already having trouble catching my breath and my heart felt like it was trying to escape through my throat. I had to get out of sight for a few seconds at least. I also had to slow them down somehow, try to get away from these two before the others caught up. Up the hill, they were slower going up hills. The thought had barely formed, and I was already dashing up the nearest hill. I wished the slope were steeper. That would slow them down. That was it. I had to find the steepest hill. That would be my only chance. At the top of the small hill I'd come up, I scanned the forest frantically. My heart thundered in my ears. This was insane. I pushed myself into a run again, trying to will a steep hill into existence. A bang, then fire along my thigh. I'd forgotten to weave around trees. I threw myself down the hill, spotting a possible slope maybe a hundred meters away. The rangers couldn't be far. I needed to move fast and dodge the bullets they were shooting. Then another bang, 
followed almost immediately by an explosion about ten meters ahead of me. Smoke expanded from the brief bright flames at an incredible rate. What had they just shot? Another bang, with the explosion sounding like a louder echo. More smoke. I dodged left, then right, then back again. Two more explosions, and suddenly the entire hillside was filled with smoke. It curled around tree trunks wetly, almost like a living blanket. I caught a whiff and instantly started coughing. That was not normal smoke. My eyes stung and tears poured down my cheeks. I tried to dodge around the smoke, but it had covered everything in sight in the moment I'd slowed. Coughs clawed through my suddenly burning throat. I heaved, losing part of my lunch to the forest floor. I didn't remember dropping, but I was on my knees, hacking and confused. I slid to the side, blinking furiously. My confusion thinned considerably when I realized I could see the leaves and dark earth under me pretty easily. Whatever the smoke was, it didn't stick to the ground. It was much thinner down here. I lay on my stomach and scrabbled forward, deeper into the thick, grayish-white soup. If I couldn't see, did that mean the rangers couldn't see? I put my face on the earth, sucked in nearly fresh air, and leapt to my feet, holding my arm against my mouth and nose. I darted forward, nearly blind from tears in my eyes. A bullet zinged past me, then another. They saw me. Those lenses they wore must give them some way of seeing people through darkness or whatever. Maybe body heat. I threw myself down again, sucking in fresh air. I had to do something, so I crawled to the nearest tree. They couldn't see through trees, could they? Blinking furiously, I peered through the smoke. Two dark figures floated toward me, not five meters away. These guys couldn't be stopped. Those stupid masks must filter gas, too. Had they seen me crawl behind this tree? I darted behind another tree that was an arm's length away. Maybe another meter off was another tree. I crouched and sucked in clean air, catching a bit of the smoke. I had to choke off violent coughs. I muffled them against my arm and slipped to the next tree, angling around it. Through the tears and haze, I saw the rangers float past the first tree I'd hidden behind. They kept going. No way! It had worked! I crouched again, careful to suck air from a couple centimeters above the dirt and leaves. My knee hit a big rock that was stuck under a root, pain flaring quickly but fading just as fast. An idea completely idiotic, but maybe my only chance came to me. I lifted the rock and tried to catch sight of the rangers again. They were moving slowly, maybe six or seven meters separated us. Better yet, there were four trees between us. I hefted the rock and darted to the first tree. They were going to see me. This was stupid, but I wasn't going to get away otherwise. I crouched, sucked in a breath, stood, and darted to the next tree. I did this two more times and had to blink and shake my head to clear my vision a little. Two figures, now maybe three meters away, floated. I could just make out their feet moving slightly up and down in smooth motions. That must be how they controlled the hoverboards. If I was lucky, the headgear with the masks didn't enhance the ranger's hearing. I waited until they passed another tree, counted a few heartbeats, and then quietly dashed to the next tree. The smoke had to be obscuring their vision at least a little. I had to be even luckier now. I crouched low, my cheek pressed to the ground, and took a few deep breaths. My heart pounded so hard I felt it between my ears and behind my eyes. I squeezed the rock. I'd never hurt anyone before, on purpose. Except for that other ranger. But that was just something I'd done in the moment. I'd had time to think about this. I was about to attack a couple of grown men and try to knock at least one of them out. I needed to act. Now. I sucked in a breath, held it tight, and hurled myself at the backs of the rangers. Jumping as high as I could, I swung the rock at the back of the head of the one on the left, aiming just under the man's helmet. A sick, wet thud came. The man cried out, spinning, but his movements had no control. He fell after a moment his hoverboard turning off after another second. Something hard slammed into the top of my head. My held breath exploded outward. Black spots swam in my vision. 
My brain expanded, trying to squeeze out my ears. I turned, involuntarily taking a breath of the toxic smoke. My throat burned. The other ranger was rearing back for another blow. I tried to make my arms reach out for him, maybe to throw the rock at him or hit him, but he was suddenly too far away. I was on the ground, but I didn't remember sitting. I kicked out weakly, but the ranger just floated up a little on his board. He suddenly darted around me. I tried to keep up, but my head was swimming. Another blow fell just behind where the first had landed. White, hot pain as my skull felt like it had been cracked wide open. I welcomed the blackness. Chapter 19 when I came to, I was lying on my front on the forest floor. I tried shaking away the fuzz in my head, but moving like that made two tender spots up there throb painfully. One side of my face was pressed to the ground, and I saw a bunch of pairs of booted feet to my right. Beyond them were tree trunks and only a faint haze of smoke. How long had I been out? I lifted my head carefully, suppressing a groan of pain and looked to my left. More boots, more trees, no haze. Sir, a voice dropped down on me. Prisoners moving. The voice sounded filtered and mechanical. Bind him, Corp, another mechanical voice said in a higher pitch. I thought that one was a woman. Sir, a hand grabbed my hair and pulled. Get up. I struggled to get to my knees, gritting my teeth against the waves of pain from my head. I couldn't tell for sure, but I didn't think my skull was broken. The ranger pulled harder and I dug deep, forcing my feet under me. The moment I was standing, the ranger who'd been pulling on me stood in front of me. He was extremely tall, and slapped a strange-feeling strap around my left wrist, pulling it closer to my right arm, which of course still had a cast on it. He wasn't too rough with me, but he tugged my left arm closer to the right one, put a strap around what he could see of my right wrist, then pushed a button on the left strap. My wrists drew together with the audible click of a magnetic lock. I'd never seen the enforcers use anything like this. The ranger wasn't done. He put another, larger strap around my neck. It felt cold and how I imagined a snake would feel as it tightened. He pushed another button and I felt my neck pull downward. The straps were connected somehow. I was completely helpless. Ready, sir. The ranger's metallic voice sent chills down my side. It was as if these people weren't, well, people. As if they were machines. But I'd beaten a couple of them, so they weren't perfect. Though I'd been really lucky. And desperate. I doubted that would happen again. Transport's on the way. Frisco wants this one. The commander of the rangers really sounded like a woman. She was almost exactly my height. She turned to me. I stared at my reflection in the lenses of her mask. She lifted her mask and helmet, revealing a pale face, dark green eyes, and short cropped dark hair. Which is lucky for him. She glared at me. Her fury and the totally stony expression couldn't hide how beautiful she was. You hurt two of my people. They were trying to hurt me. I tried to match her stare. My heart hammered fast in my chest. Fear combined with how close her amazing eyes were. What is wrong with me? You got lucky. I know. She maintained her furious stare and then spun away. Men, look alive. Transport will be here in five. It felt like an hour. More. The commander had stalked off through the trees, leaving me with a group of at least ten rangers, all of them burly and completely silent. Even seeing the commander's face, angry though she was, would have been better than being surrounded by a bunch of faceless robot types. Very creepy. By the time the whine of propulsion units could be heard, my neck was stiff from the pull of the strap. I would hold my hands up a bit occasionally to relieve the pressure, but with my right arm still in a cast, I couldn't hold the position for long at all. The rangers pushed me backward as an enforcer pod dropped out of the sky. It looked like the pilot was trying to avoid the trees, but he pushed a young one over on his way down, cracking its trunk with a loud snap. Then the pod was on the forest floor, and four enforcers spilled out immediately, all of them making for me. 
The female commander of the rangers appeared from behind me, marching right at the enforcers. They drew up. What's this all about? The commander's voice was easily heard over the idling pod. Can't say, one of the enforcers said. He wore a helmet but no mask, just like the other enforcers. You interrupt my normal patrols, order me to stand down, and hold this kid for you, and you can't say? It felt kind of good to have her fury directed at someone else, but I wasn't a kid. Commander, this is from the Prime Administrator. The enforcer's eyes flicked over to me and then back to the ranger. I can't say. From the set of her neck, I thought the commander was going to say more, but instead, she stood for a beat and then stepped back, turning. She gestured my way, and the tall ranger pulled me forward. He's all yours! The commander's glare hadn't softened even a little as my gaze switched from the enforcer to her. One of the other enforcers took my left arm, glancing down at my right. What happened? Unknown. It was like that when we got him. The commander seemed like she was made of stone. Nothing on her face moved when she spoke, except for her mouth. This happened out here. Someone helped him. This from the first enforcer who talked to the commander. You have to find them and deal with them. Now the commander's face showed an expression beyond fury. Her eyes widened. She was clearly surprised. I have to find them? I don't take orders from you, city cop! The enforcer glared back at the commander, but seemed to think better of getting in a fight with her. He nodded at the man who had my arm and led the way back to the pod. Wait here, then. I'll get command online. I'd been in an enforcer pod once before, when my class had gone to an enforcer depot, and they demonstrated what they did. We did a few simulations in school, and everybody was taught the basics of how the new chapter's flying pods worked. But it wasn't as if people wanted to be in an enforcer pod. The vehicle was one long space with the cockpit in the front and bench seats lining the walls, leaving the center empty. Cords, headsets, and all kinds of electronics with multiple screens here and there lined the walls above the benches. Everything was gray and black with the screens glowing dully in the light from two sets of track lights in the roof. The door we'd entered had folded down from the wall of the pod forming a simple set of steps that led down to the ground. I thought I remembered that the back of enforcer pods opened as well. The enforcer, who must have been the squad's leader, stepped to the cockpit, addressed the man in the left seat, and waited for a moment while the man hit a few buttons on a large central console. As the man who had my arm pushed me to a bench and strapped me in, I tried to overhear what was being said. Orders, rangers, immediately. Others, problem. The squad leader straightened, tapping the side of his helmet, and went back outside. I guess that command, or whomever the squad leader had been talking to, was going to give the ranger commander her orders through her comms. The rangers must have warned them too. Whatever happened, the squad leader was back in the pod in moments, and I felt the ground drop from beneath us almost before the door had finished folding back up into the wall. Throughout the exchange and boarding the pod, I'd felt strangely detached from what was happening. I shook the feeling away. I needed to try to figure out what was coming and what I could do about it. They were taking me back to New Frisco, obviously. And they'd roped the rangers into helping find me, specifically. And then it sounded like they'd given the rangers orders to go find the Hawk Triune and kill them? Horrible as it sounded, I felt sure that's what the orders had been. Their orders concerning me were more confusing. First, the enforcers had acted like I was resisting and had tried to kill me. Now they were keeping me prisoner, but also alive. So they'd moved beyond just wanting to kill me? This couldn't be good. Were they going to act like I was gone, not tell my family that they had me? Was I going to become a lab experiment? I felt a desperate need to get away again. Maybe I could think of something before we made it back to New Frisco. I looked around the pod, noting that there were two men in the cockpit and six other enforcers in the pod. I didn't know why I hadn't noticed the others in the pod when I'd first boarded. There were a few windows in the walls of the pod. Through one directly across from me, I could see trees heading off toward the horizon. For a moment, as we took a wide turn high above the treetops, 
I saw far off in the distance some dark, hulking shapes. That had to be the original Frisco. I strained to see more of it, but I only made out what looked like jagged, rotting mountains. I remembered the side jet, still hiding under a tree. A moment of regret for the lost machine came and went. It had served me well. I felt bad that I'd taken Rogers and my creation, but I couldn't deny that I wouldn't have made it as far as I had without the incredible invention. The squad leader had said something about the Prime Administrator. It was hard to believe that they would really take me to Prime One, but maybe all this trouble meant that they really would. I'd never been in there. I didn't personally know anybody who ever had. There were doors to it, of course, but they were always guarded. I'd only seen enforcers and people who did broadcasts go in and out. Less than 30 minutes later, the pod, which must have been flying at top speed, banked into a turn and I was able to see the city laid out through the window across from me. I expected us to descend, but we kept our altitude and came to what felt like a standstill. Through the window, I could tell we were above Prime 1. Then we dropped straight down. It was a slow descent, but my stomach still rolled over a couple of times. The light changed, and I saw through the window that we had somehow entered the dome of Prime 1 through the top. Walls stretched out long and wide as we continued going down. I'd never seen a pod go into a dome, much less Prime 1. I hadn't even known that was possible. The roof must have opened. We settled to the ground inside Prime 1, and the pod powered down, the track lights flipping off. But almost immediately, the Enforcer pod shuddered once, and we were dropping again. This time the motion was choppier, like the platform lowering us kept catching on something, making us stop and start. I stared through the window. We were going down some kind of shaft, or pod elevator. My heart skipped a few beats. Nobody knew I was here except for the enforcers. The admins could make me disappear. Who? Nick Granger? Never heard of him. I wished somebody would say something. I considered asking what was going on, but didn't want to make them angry. I looked around, finding that the lack of lighting in the shaft made it hard to see the interior of the pod. I wished I had some kind of weapon that I could hide on me, regretting not pocketing the knife I'd used at the Hawk Triune's campsite. The nano cutter! I realized that I hadn't felt its weight in my zip pocket at all since I'd woken on the forest ground. I shifted enough so that I could tap that pocket with the inside of my cast. Nothing. Then I remembered. Dolfo had taken it when the three wanderers had found me. Great. I knew the other pocket held the pouch the wanderers had given me, but no weapon. Wait a minute! The bent spoke from my cycle. Moving my arms in the direction of that pocket put painful strain on my right arm and yanked my neck uncomfortably but I was able to find the metal zipper that held that pocket closed. I felt the outside of my zip. Yes, the spoke was still in there. I had to keep it. I wasn't sure what the Prime Administrator wanted with me, but the fact that we were still going down felt like a bad sign, like I was closer to a grave than I wanted to be. The spoke wasn't safe in my pocket. They would search me for sure and would find it, especially if they used a metal sensor on me. Metal. The zippers on my pocket were metal. Maybe the spoke would blend in. Not in my pocket. The spoke was too long. I tried to get at the spoke, but it was hard to get enough movement, particularly in a sitting position. I felt like I was going to have to practically tear my right arm off to get in my pocket. But I didn't know if I would have a better chance at this with the poor lighting. I coughed, pushing hard to make it sound violent, and forced myself to hack hard and loud. I tried to stand, but the straps reminded me I'd been belted in. I coughed more, acting like I wanted to put my hands to my mouth. Shut him up! The squad leader's voice was loud and icy. I shook my head. I'm okay! And then I coughed more, twisting to get up my pocket. My right arm screamed at me, but I got the zipper open a little. I settled back. How deep were we going? How much time did I have? In the darkness of the enforcer pod... I sucked in a slow, deep breath, and then, gritting my teeth against the pain I was about to inflict upon myself, I reached for my left pocket. The pod elevator must have hit the level it was aiming for because it felt like how I imagined a small earthquake felt, and then the sensation of dropping slowed considerably. 
I wrenched my wrists toward my pocket. The strap on my neck felt like it was breaking the skin, and my right arm felt like teeth were digging into it. There! I got two fingers into the pocket and reached desperately for the spoke. The elevator stopped. My finger brushed the tip of the spoke. I reached again, the incredibly awkward position feeling like murder on my right side. Got it! I yanked the spoke out of my pocket, hiding it between my hands. Lights blasted through all of the pod's windows. While the squad leader waited, the enforcer closest to the rear door punched a round red button, and the pod door vibrated, popped outward a little, and then whirred upward. Within moments, a space the width and height of the pod had opened. One of the enforcers removed the strap around my neck and the cuffs on my wrists, and led me out of the pod toward a door guarded by two... things. They were a little taller than me, made entirely of a material that looked very hard, but wasn't exactly metal, and had heads with optical sensors all over them. Their legs extended maybe a meter, but the legs ended at a triangular-shaped track. They reminded me of the tanks in the history textbooks. Between the two tracks was a variety of machinery, with a few wheels. The robot's torsos were completely smooth and matte black, like the keepers. My stomach lurched, but as we approached, the material covering the torsos opened up, and two long metal arms extended. A long barrel extended from one arm, and an oblong tool with a few gold lights on it folded out from the other. The pod elevator had dropped around 50 meters and was now level with a narrow platform. If I was going to be searched, now was the time. I scanned quickly. All of the enforcers were watching the guard robots as we approached the door. I quickly straightened the spoke as much as I could and then, using my right hand to hold the bottom of my zip, jabbed the spoke up just inside the cloth. If I could slide the spoke up next to the metal zipper, a sensor shouldn't be able to tell the difference. We advanced. The enforcers weren't being scanned, but they were hurting me right at the robots. My heart hammered wildly. I finally succeeded in pushing the spoke up inside the fabric of my zip and slid it up as fast as I could. No more time. The robot on the right lifted its glowing tool in front of my face. Thin arms shot out from either end of the tool, making me jump. They slowly began circling my head. I gripped at least ten centimeters of the spoke in my hand still and tried to push it up some more without showing any movement. I heard the arms of the tool connect behind me. As the sensor tool lowered, the arms extended and retracted, following the contours of my shoulders, arms, and torso. The sensor beeped softly when it got to the top of my zipper and continued beeping. By the time the sensor got to my midriff, I held just a little of the spoke in my hand. I hoped it was enough. Beeping softly, the sensor continued down all the way to my feet, the arm of the robot extending with a low whir. The sensor arms retracted and folded back into the arm of the robot. Clear. The voice was metallic and cold. I let out my held breath quietly. Non-metallic substance, left midriff. The artificial voice sent tingles down my spine. Very creepy. The nearest enforcer to me stood in front of me and roughly patted my left side, coming to my pocket quickly. He yanked out the pouch, opened it, and pulled out one of the silvery packets. Just food packets. He handed the pouch to the squad leader and then headed back to the enforcer pod. The door slid open, revealing a long hallway lit with lights the color of the snow that we sometimes saw on mountains. Another robot guard, which had obviously just arrived, whirred to a stop just inside the corridor. I was pushed roughly forward through the door. Follow! The new robot's voice was the same as that of the other. The small triumph of having hidden the spoke was totally swallowed in the fear that filled me at these smooth-moving, transforming machines. I'd never heard of this kind of thing. The new chapter had plenty of machinery and used robotic tools but I had never seen anything that could transform its arms into sensors like this. What else was in those arms? They reminded me of some kind of vicious insect. The door back to the elevator shaft slid closed, trapping me in a very long hallway, following a freaky-looking robot that rolled forward in almost complete silence.
Chapter 20 One thought chased another around my head, and I was unable to dislodge the cold knot of fear that had settled into my stomach. I was being taken to the prime administrator, or maybe someone else high up in the ranks of New Frisco's bosses. The hallway felt cold, impersonal. A few doors lined the walls to the left and right, but they were almost unnoticeable in that they were the same pale white color as the walls, floor, and ceiling. If I squinted, I felt like everything would blend into a colorless blur. Couldn't the prime administrator afford to decorate a little? A little paint? The robot escort drew to a whirring stop in front of the door that was the end of the hallway. For a moment, the complete silence left me feeling suspended, in some kind of stasis. Then, the door disappeared into a wall with a soft hiss, and yellow light spilled out. Proceed! The robot's voice clanged metallically. I was almost happy to obey, despite not knowing what was coming. I passed through the doorway and found myself in a medium-sized room that couldn't have been much bigger than my bedroom. Only where my bed would have been was a glass-looking table that seemed to sprout from a wall. The table doubled as a screen, and countless icons and images and lists fluttered across its surface. I looked around as the door slid shut behind me. The walls of this room were pale to the point of almost having no color, but what color was there was green. Recessed yellow lights illuminated several doors, one of them looking a lot like an elevator's doors. Proceed to the desk. The voice came from above. I looked up, noticing small circular spots of mesh, maybe six of them, scattered about the ceiling. Speakers. I obeyed, confused. It seemed like there were no humans down here. The moment I stood next to the desk, a panel opened in the nearby wall, and a skinny, polished metal arm extended. It was shinier than the chrome I had seen sometimes in the engineering dome. An optical sensor opened at the end of the arm, casting a gold light on my face, making me blink. The sensor slid down, maybe ten centimeters in front of my body, until it came to my hands. Had it noticed the spoke? Nick Granger, identity confirmed. The voice came from the speakers again. Personal assistant inoperable. I felt a brief wave of relief, but couldn't dispel my growing sense of unease. I was sure the Prime Administrator was supposed to be down here. Another panel opened in the wall to my right, and another glowing arm extended. This one was fast. The optical sensor stopped at my papa. It paused briefly, then the sensor flipped back into the arm, and the whole thing swiveled and retracted almost noiselessly. A moment later, another tool flipped out of the arm and glowed for a moment, then the arm slid back into the wall. Proceed. This voice was accompanied by another soft hiss, and a door a few meters along the wall from the desk was swallowed into the wall. I swallowed, my heart thudding heavily. The open doorway seemed to beckon me forward, but I hesitated, tempted to turn and run. The enforcers had started by trying to kill me, but if the new chapter wanted me dead, you'd think the enforcers wouldn't have gone to the trouble of bringing me back to New Frisco. They had to want me alive now for some reason, but I had no idea why. A sour taste filled my mouth. I couldn't go in there, but if I ran, they might actually kill me. Proceed, the voice clanged. I'd rather not. The words had to squeeze through my tight throat. I forced a laugh. I was arguing with speakers. I couldn't just stand there. I stepped forward, my legs shaky. No. They'd been controlling my life, the life of everyone I knew, for as long as I remembered. In a way, they controlled the wanderers, too. I couldn't let the fear that bubbled up in my chest control me now. Besides, if I was immune, I could help everyone, right? No, that was stupid. The wanderers couldn't all be immune. Well, either they were, or the bug was gone. But then there was Bren, dead from the bug. I tried to make my next step firmer. By the time I passed through the doorway, the strength had come back to my legs. I straightened my back and looked around. I was in some kind of closet-sized space, 
but it was shaped like a cylinder and lit by only one inset light directly above me. Colored lights flashed all around me with soft pops and hisses accompanying the blinding explosions. Proceed. A door in front of me slid into the wall. The room on the other side was well lit. I stepped through and glanced left and right. The room had four walls, three of them covered with multiple flat screens. A wide desk sat in front of a wall that looked to be one big window. The desk was made of the same clear material I'd seen earlier, kind of like glass, but not as glossy. The view outside the window was of trees and mountains with a sky of a perfect blue. But we were at least a hundred feet below ground. That had to be one giant screen, not a window. I had avoided looking at the man behind the desk for as long as I could. The Prime Administrator. He sat there looking at me through narrowed eyes. I'd seen his face plenty on screens around the city, but in person he seemed a little thinner, his low, flat cheekbones more pronounced. The way he sat in his white chair staring at me, his head thrown slightly back, made it seem like he was literally looking down his nose at me. He stood. Mr. Granger. His voice was instantly familiar. I'd heard him explain directives and rules hundreds, maybe thousands of times. He sounded younger than his years. He had to be around 50. The prime administrator held out his hand. I am glad to finally meet you. What? Why was he being so polite? He smiled. I see you are confused. No surprise, of course. There's just been the most dreadful of communication breakdowns. His hand dropped to his side. He sat. Please, join me. It sounded like he'd practiced each word a hundred times. His hand brushed a spot on his desk, and a section of the floor bulged upward, resolving into the shape of a chair. Bug me, that's amazing, I thought. I'd never seen morphing material like that. My mind raced. Nobody had tried to kill me in over an hour, or betrayed me for that long. Something awful had to happen soon. I scanned the room, noticing another door on the wall with the doorway I'd come through. This new door was in the opposite corner, and there was another door behind and to the Prime Administrator's right, also in the corner. Mr. Granger, I assure you nobody is going to hurt you. I met the man's gaze, took a breath, and sat on the incredible chair. That would be new. He laughed. No, he actually chortled, his hands going to his stomach and his mouth stretching wide. I felt like a cold, oily drop of something slithered down my spine. Yes, again, that is all due to a very unpleasant breakdown of communications. I stared at him. Being shot at? By real bullets? And being attacked by a bunch of rangers? And then being kidnapped and brought here? I had to take a ragged breath, try to slow down. I felt my pulse behind my eyes. That's either a major breakdown of communication or... I had no idea how to finish the sentence. I glared at the prime administrator. My friend's dead. Yes. The man's face changed somewhat, the ends of his mouth turning down a little and his eyes closing once, briefly. What a terrible thing. Every word, every movement of the man seemed completely rehearsed. There was something very wrong here. Well, how'd he die and not me? How'd the bug get him and not me? A moment passed. We are still unsure. Perhaps you are somehow immune to the virus. If I'm immune, then so are all the Wanderers. The Wanderers are a myth. The response came rapid fire, automatically. Fury pushed me to my feet. I felt my face grow hot. Spam! I was with them, met them. They gave me food! The Prime Administrator didn't react to my shouting. Impossible. Anyone living outside of the new chapter would be unsafe and would die within days. He said this as if it were fact. He had to know I wasn't lying. I opened my mouth, trying to figure out what to shout at him next. Wait, I'd heard that before. I'd heard his voice say those exact words before, at least once or twice. 
The oily feeling slid further down my spine. Wrong! That's just completely, stupidly wrong! I just survived for almost a day out there! A moment of silence. We would like to understand why. We think you can help us finally destroy the bug. That set me back, and I sat again. I don't believe you. I assure you I am speaking the truth. Why should I believe you? Mr. Granger. The prime administrator stood and strode out from behind his desk, sliding his hand along one edge. A wall of screens turned on, with images of people clarifying almost immediately. I recognized the exterior of the school dome, and even felt like some of the faces I saw were familiar. Other images from all over New Frisco filled the rest of the screens on the wall. You might have the opportunity to change the lives of these people significantly, but we need you to cooperate and help us keep everyone calm. Keep them calm? Better safe than sorry, better calm than dead. The motto of the new chapter flashed through my head. What do you mean? People are aware of Bren Radcliffe's death. There are rumors that the knockout didn't work and that the bug killed him. Those weren't rumors. The knockout didn't work because of me. I shook the grief away. He did die of the bug. Certainly. The prime administrator raised his arm toward the wall of screens. But these people, your friends and family, are worried they are in danger now, too. They are not sure they should trust the knockout, but of course they should. He gestured at the screens. Here they are, living productive lives. I see them each day of their lives here in my office. I know that they need to trust that we, as the leaders of the new chapter, have their best interests in mind and are trying to keep them safe. I wanted to argue with him, but couldn't find anything to say. So? We know you were there with Mr. Radcliffe when he died. We have talked to the others in your little group. A memory of Paul, Melissa, and Connor, all of them staring at me in surprise last night, flashed behind my eyes. What? They were very forthcoming about your activities of that night. They have returned to their productive and calm lives. But you had to know we'd been doing that for a while. The Papas tell you where we are. I stared at the man. Don't they? Of course. It was harmless play until you found a way to endanger yourselves by avoiding the knockout injection. He stared at me. The people of our new chapter need your help now, Mr. Granger. Feeling antsy at having to look up at him while he strode back and forth in front of the screens, I stood too. With what? A moment of silence passed, then stretched uncomfortably while the man looked at me with his brow furrowed. Finally, he spoke again. The people of our new chapter need your help now, Mr. Granger. They need to be reassured. What do you mean? We want you to tell them the story of that night. Tell them that the knockout injection works, but that Mr. Radcliffe found a way to avoid the injection. What about me? I couldn't believe they seriously wanted me to just tell the truth. Something else had to be going on. I glanced at the screens, the images of people going about their ordered, calm lives in New Frisco. In several images, there were small clusters of people gathered around public screens, obviously listening anxiously to whatever the speakers were saying. As the prime administrator spoke, I scanned the rest of the screens, noting the familiar faces. I couldn't deny the fact that I wanted the world to know how Brent had died. Maybe revealing the secret would take the guilt away. That, unfortunately, is where we must bend the truth a little, for the good of the new chapter. We would ask you not to talk about your experience. Your friends have agreed to this for the good of our society. We ask that you tell this helpful untruth to help your people. In addition, we need to study you and discover whether you really are immune to the bug. A screen about halfway up the wall Toward the right side caught my eye. Hope Park at night time. The surveillance camera must have been panning because the image moved steadily left. What I saw next took my breath away. I fought to control my expression. I floundered for something to say to fill the silence. Uh, study me? You mean cut me open? Of course not. 
A genial smile spread across the prime administrator's face. Beyond him, the image of Hope Park panned some more, revealing a group of familiar people standing at the base of a tree. Apparently, the screens on the prime administrator's wall looped footage from all over New Frisco, and from more than just the present. The group of people standing under that tree were the pushers. I watched myself walk toward my cycle. The clip was of last night in Hope Park with my friends. I tore my eyes away from the screen. We simply need to do some blood work. We need to run some preliminary tests. His flat eyes met mine. We will see where we go from there. I thought fast. Something was going on here. Something strange. But I might be able to figure out a way to expose the complete truth. I had to be careful. And I had to be sure. But if I'm immune, so are the Wanderers. The Wanderers are simply a legend. You already said that. Another strange moment of silence passed. We must keep you here for now and find out why you were able to avoid infection. But we need your help, Mr. Granger. We have no wish to harm you. If I stayed here, they could do whatever they wanted with me, especially since nobody who cared even knew where I was. The Prime Administrator knew I knew he was lying. He had to. How much more of this was just a big lie? This was bad. A knot of fear in my gut sent tentacles crawling up into my chest. Will you help us? Will you reassure the people of New Frisco that the knockout injection is their best defense against the bug? The man looked directly at me, his face set in a sincerely pleading expression. His eyes didn't move from mine. I had to stall. I needed more time to figure out what to do, what I'd just seen. I felt like it could help. I just needed time to come up with a plan. Yes, I'll help you. I figured that if I appeared cooperative, they might not guard me as well as they would otherwise. That might give me more opportunity to get out of here, too. The Prime Administrator smiled. What excellent news. I appreciate your willingness to be of assistance. He stepped forward and extended his hand. I grimaced inwardly, gritted my teeth, and took his hand, shaking it. His hand was surprisingly warm to the touch, warm and dry. I stared at him, wondering what was really going on behind the man's dark eyes. I would find out. I was going to find out exactly what was going on, and then I was going to bring it all down, because the bug had to be gone. It had to be. No matter what had happened to Bren, the wanderers were real and they were alive. Something else had happened to Bren. The Prime Administrator took two long steps to his desk and touched a spot near his chair. The door to his left slid open without a noise. One of the treadmill robots appeared with a metallic whir. Please follow my assistant to a room we have prepared for you. I'm sorry, but in the interests of our tests, we can't have you eating or drinking for the next twelve hours. He lifted a hand toward the robot. Furthermore, we will replace your personal assistant after the tests. We don't want the knockout injection to skew our tests in any way. I wondered what that meant, but doubted he would be forthcoming if I asked anything. Okay. I followed the robot, stealing another glance at the screen that had caught my eye. The image had changed to a busy walkway. As the door closed behind me, I looked back. The prime administrator was already settling back into his chair. The robot hummed gently down the hallway, also totally blank of anything but pale gray. I guess, if I liked gray, I would be in paradise. This hallway ended at elevator doors. When the doors closed, we descended for about ten seconds. I stood still, studying the robot, but also letting my thoughts race. What I'd seen on the screen had sparked the beginnings of a plan. I would still have to find out the truth about the bug, and how Bren had died, but there was a simple way to prove to New Frisco that something was wrong about what the new chapter's leaders were telling them. I needed to reach my friends, contact Melissa or Paul or Connor. I needed to get my hands on the clip of last night and show it to everybody. But that was only part of the plan. I was going to find out why the new chapter was lying to the people of New Frisco, and maybe the other cities too. Then, I was going to bring the whole thing down. Chapter 21 
The pale door slid quietly closed behind me. Immediately, I felt as if I was being squeezed, not hard or anything, but by the pressure of an enclosed space. The room was about the size of my room at home, with much of the same arrangement. A bed, a small table next to the bed, a bathroom through an open doorway, and what looked like a clothes jenny. I wondered if, in the morning, I would find the same outfit I'd always found in my own jenny at home every day. I'd grown up wondering how it worked, but soon after starting work in the engineering dome, had learned that it wasn't all that complex. Bots, very similar to the maintenance bots that ran throughout the city, visited each house and accessed the clothes jenny, switching out dirty shirts and such for cleaned ones. Since everybody wore pretty much the same thing every day, and many people wore the same thing as each other, it was impossible to know if you were getting your own things back, and really, it didn't matter. What mattered now was finding a way to get out of this room. Then, I needed to figure out where in Prime 1 they stored the archival footage from the surveillance cameras. If I could find that, well, that would be a good start. Later, I'd have to find a way to show everybody in New Frisco, or even all over the new chapter, the clip. Then, everyone would know something strange was going on. Maybe then, I could bring the Wanderers in, to show that I wasn't alone in not dying from the bug. I had to find out the truth about the bug. And when I did, I had to tell everyone. Everyone. I wandered the room, finally settling on the bed and lying back on the soft, cool blanket. Don't fall asleep. I kept my voice quiet, but then realized that there was another similarity between this and my room at home. No cameras. I sat up, the new piece of knowledge coming as a surprise. In fact, I hadn't seen any surveillance cameras anywhere in Prime 1. I puzzled over that for a moment, but the answer was pretty obvious. The cameras were there to keep people under control and catch people breaking rules. No one would break rules in Prime 1. The Prime Administrator might even live in that office or in an apartment through that other door I'd seen. I got up and wandered toward my door. For a brief second, I thought it might just open when the sensor in the ceiling saw me. Nope. I examined the door. It was just like doors in all of the other domes. A two-meter-tall, one-meter-wide panel of plasteel. The recycled polymer was everywhere and was always touted as a sign that the new chapter was far better than the world before the infection. The panel moved on runners that were set into the floor, and I imagined that there were runners on the top part of the doorframe, too. When the door opened, it slid into an opening in the wall that was fabricated so perfectly that when the door was all the way open, the doorframe seemed almost unbroken by seams or cracks. How was I supposed to get out of here? No magnetic locks to fool, and no way I could damage the door itself. In fact, I had no idea how this kind of door locked. I doubted I could break it open, especially with one arm in a cast. That meant I needed to find a way to get someone else to open it. Or I had to wait until someone, or some robot, came to get me tomorrow, or whenever. They would come tomorrow. They had to. If they were telling the truth about wanting me to help reassure the people of New Frisco, they'd want me to talk to them soon. As soon as I did, my parents would see me on the screens. I wondered whether enforcers had already been talking to them, telling them where I was, or if they would come looking for me once they saw me on the speaker screens. I needed to talk to my friends and my parents, somehow tell them the truth, at least about the Wanderers and how they were proof that the new chapter was lying. I coasted through the bathroom, noting the shower and toilet and seeing that there was no cup, which made sense, since they didn't want me to eat or drink before they took blood. I wondered how the knockout would skew the tests. It had to be a matter of just removing the sedative chemicals from the blood in order to test it. A thought tickled my brain for a moment, and I stopped, dead in the center of the bathroom for a minute, trying to catch it. Something about the knockout. <sighs> Nothing. Shaking my head, I headed back into the bedroom. I couldn't believe it had really been less than 24 hours since this had all started. I ran over the timeline, meeting the pushers, the cycle ride, Bren, the engineering dome. 
All things considered, I could use some sleep. I lay back on the bed, staring at the big vent above me, unsurprised at its presence. They would have to pipe air down this far underground. I don't know how long I slept, but the light had shut off on its own, leaving the room pitch black. I sat up and the light came on. Nothing in the room had changed. I stepped to the door, entertaining the idea that it might have somehow come unlocked. No luck. My papa said that it was just after 0100. If I could find a way out of the room, this seemed like it would be the perfect time to snoop around Prime 1. But what was that smell? I looked around, back at the bed, then toward the bathroom. Understanding dawned. It was me. I'd been running, bleeding, and crawling through dirt for hours. I hit the button next to the clothes, Jenny, hoping. Yes! A full set of clothes sat folded in the space that opened up, down to underwear and socks. There was even a new zip hanging from a hook. I grabbed everything with my left arm and made my way to the bathroom. Twenty minutes later, I emerged, using my teeth to help me tie my papa back onto my left wrist. The cast had gotten wet, and I'd felt water sliding down inside it, but that was unavoidable. I felt clean, refreshed. The rumbling in my stomach wouldn't go away, but there was nothing I could do about that. For now, I was just glad I couldn't smell myself anymore. I tried the door again, laughing at the stupid hope that flared each time. Again, of course, no luck. I pulled the spoke out of my old shredded zip and poked at the edges of the door with it. There was a slight gap between the bottom of the door and the threshold. Maybe I could somehow pop the door off its runners and maybe even knock it down? Worth a try. I yanked my sleeve over my left hand like a glove and gripped the spoke tightly, jabbing it hard at the gap. It stopped before it went even one centimeter. I kept up the pressure and slid it the length of the tiny space, hoping there was some place it would slide deeper. Nothing. The door was perfectly made and built. I got up and wandered the room, thinking about the jenny. I grabbed my old clothes and made for the jenny, opening it. I tossed my clothes in, but kept it open by reaching up into it with my left hand and gauging the space. I couldn't fit even half of me in there. I dropped onto the bed. Bug me. Maybe there was no way out of here, especially if I had to escape from one of those guard robots. They had to have all kinds of weapons hidden away in those complicated mechanisms. I didn't want to mess with them, at least not if I could avoid it. Fingering the spoke, I lay back on the bed. I needed to get out of here. I was done being confused, done wondering what had happened to Bren. I was going to find out what was going on, and if someone, some person, was responsible for Bren's death? Cold anger coursed down my back. If someone had done that to him, had murdered Bren, I was going to find that person. I ran my left index finger up and down the spoke. I looked closer at the vent above the bed. It was maybe half a meter long by a quarter meter wide. I felt the spoke again. If I could reach the vent... I rolled off the bed to my feet, then got back on, stretching as high as I could. I could just barely place my palm on the vent. Perfect. I immediately set to poking at the vent's edges, my stiff right arm out slightly to give me better balance on the soft bed. I slid the tip of the spoke along the seam between the vent and the ceiling, but couldn't find a gap at all. Then I tried jabbing the spoke at the seam to see if I could work a space open. No good. I felt like if I could just get a good grip on the vent somehow, I should be able to pull it out since I couldn't see any kind of fastening clips on this side of the thing. It must have basic tabs that slid into receptacles built into the air shaft. I'd seen plenty of hardware like that in the engineering dome, so I was pretty certain that I just needed to give the vent cover a good pull and it would come free. But I couldn't get the spoke under the vent's edge. If I had a thin clamp, I could probably grab one of the slats on the vent and just tug. I examined the spoke, then the gap between the narrow slats on the vent. That's it! I bent the top of the spoke down, basically forming a hook. Then I slid the hooked end of the spoke through a gap in the slats, 
turned it slightly, and brought the hook back through another gap, hooking a slat in the process. I gave it an experimental tug and felt a slight movement from the vent cover. I stopped, listened carefully, and, hearing nothing, grabbed the spoke tightly and pulled as hard as I could. The vent cover popped off with a grating noise, hitting my shoulder before landing on the bed under my feet. My spoke was magical. What couldn't I do with this thing? I kissed my skinny metal savior and shoved it into my zip pocket, then reached for the shaft that the vent cover had been hiding. The shaft went straight up for about a half meter, then looked like it ended at a T, with another shaft heading in the direction of the bathroom and the other arm of the T going toward my room's wall. I peered at the shaft, estimating its size. I was pretty sure I'd be able to move around in there, even with my arm in a cast. If only I could get up into it. My arm was not long enough to reach where the shaft made a T. I needed more height. I jumped half-heartedly. The bed absorbed most of my force, and I didn't come anywhere close. Which was probably for the best, since my left arm was nowhere near strong enough to pull me up into the shaft. I needed more height. At least a half meter. Still standing on the bed, I looked around the room. My eyes settled on the table. Please don't let it be bolted down. It wasn't. I set it on the bed and carefully eased one foot, then another atop it. It wobbled crazily. I jumped onto the bed before the unsteady table dropped me. I looked at it for a minute. There was no way I could stand on it and work my way into the shaft without falling off. Or was there? I grinned at the revelation and flipped the table upside down. The table was made of plasteel and its four legs were connected to each other by strong crossbars. If I could stand on the crossbars, this way worked much better. The table didn't wobble at all as I eased myself up. I'd gained nearly a meter in height. I eased my head and shoulders into the shaft. My head reached past the junction of the T, and I had no trouble seeing in both directions. I wanted to get back into the prime administrator's office, so that meant I needed to follow the shaft that passed through the bathroom ceiling. I hoped this tiny tunnel opened up in the elevator shaft. I snaked my good arm up and reached as far as I could down the shaft, then pushed off the table and tried to get a grip on the smooth, plasteel surface of the vent. I slid back down and only just hooked my feet on the crossbars of the table before I almost fell all the way back onto the bed. I needed some leverage. I also needed even more height. With my left hand still in the shaft, I scanned the furniture in the room and bathroom. Nothing left that would be able to move. This was all the height I was going to get. I reached again, but this time propped my hand against the top of the shaft I was aiming for and squeezed the top of my back against the shaft wall. Feeling like I had a little support, I eased my body up, trying to expand my torso to fill the shaft and keep me up. I moved maybe three centimeters. It was progress. I sucked in a big breath and expanded myself as much as I could, tightening my neck to press my head against the shaft wall, then worked my back muscles and shoulder to squeeze a little higher. A few more centimeters. If I could just get my butt into the shaft, I'd have a lot more flexibility to work with. I repeated the process of flexing different muscles, pain flaring in my left shoulder and neck. The pain grew faster than I was moving. I couldn't keep this up. But I couldn't stop. It had to be near 0200, probably the best time to snoop around Prime 1. I couldn't let them hold me here and do whatever they wanted to me. Something was definitely going on here. Something to do with the bug and the prime administrator. Pain jabbed sharp and hot in my right arm as I angled it up and pushed it past my head into the shaft. I gritted my teeth against the pain and spread my arms out, pinning the cast and my left hand against the walls of the shaft. I immediately felt stronger, like I could move better. I wiggled, snaked, and flexed, trying to keep my grunts to a minimum. I didn't want bots thinking some woodland creature had made it into the vents, and was dying up here, they'd be sure to come investigate. There! I felt the corner of the shaft dig into my lower abdomen and the pressure on my neck, head, and shoulders 
decreased. With a little more wiggling and kicking, I was completely in the shaft. I had a passing thought that I maybe should have tried to replace the vent cover, but that was Drek. They would know I was gone once they opened the door to my room. I slid forward, mostly using my feet. The pain in my injured right arm grew steadily. I realized I was shaking from the exertion. I stopped moving and rolled as much as I could toward my back. This freed up enough space that I was able to bring my right arm carefully down and hold it against my middle again. The pain noticeably receded. I continued on, staying on my side and using my legs and left arm to move along. I passed the shaft that led to my bathroom and, not long after, passed under a vertical shaft that led up as far as I could make out. The dim illumination from my room and bathroom faded only a little ways up the vertical shaft. I wriggled in near darkness, feeling each shaft wall carefully with my left hand before I moved forward. I didn't want to fall into some unseen opening. After maybe ten more minutes of shimmying along the air duct, I felt a draft across my neck. Soon after that, the walls of the shaft clarified a bit due to some light coming from somewhere. Before long, I arrived at a tough metal square of mesh, where the draft was a little stronger. Hazy yellow lights, which I could make out through the mesh on the far wall, illuminated the elevator shaft. The current of air whistled softly up through the shaft past my head, making my ear tickle a little. Now I needed to find out what floor the prime administrator was on. The elevator ride down hadn't taken more than ten seconds, so it couldn't be too far. But first, I had to get this mesh vent cover out of the way. I gave the mesh an experimental push. It moved a little. I felt around, trying to figure out how it was attached. It had to be like the vent cover back in my room. I held a slow breath and banged the flat of my left hand hard against the mesh. A soft, metallic thump echoed up the shaft. I cringed and hung back a little, instinctively tensing. I waited a few minutes. No guard robots descended the shaft, weapons blazing. No loud alarm clanged in the complex. Did creepy robots get a knockout shot too? I wound up aimed carefully, and slammed my hand against the mesh. The top part gave way and flapped downward. I lunged to grab it before it could fall all the way down the elevator shaft, just barely snagging it with a finger. My heart thumped loudly in my ears and behind my eyes. I pulled the mesh cover back into the shaft and slid it down past my feet. I eased forward, reaching as far as I could on the elevator shaft walls, hoping to find a ladder of some kind. It took a bit of squirming, and at one point I had to roll onto my back, but I found a couple of rungs leading up the elevator shaft. I had to be very careful and brace myself in the air duct, but once I got a solid hold on a rung, I had it made. The next thirty minutes or so were a combination of climbing and clinging. In the hazy wash of yellow light from the bulbs behind me, I couldn't make out how far down the shaft went, and I had no desire to find out. It had to be at least 50 meters. Plus, the rungs were kind of narrow. I had one functioning arm, and I really didn't want to take any chances. So, it was slow going. By the time I made it to the first heavy door, my papa said it was nearly 0300. I wondered if creepy guard robots slept. If so, I really hoped they were off for the night. They were ugly enough that they could use some beauty sleep. I had a bit of good luck when I came to the door that led out of the shaft. I was near the side that it opened from. If I could get some leverage, I thought I might be able to push the door open with a foot. Climbing a bit higher, I grabbed a rung as tightly as I could with my right hand, clenched my left hand around another rung, and leaned on it. My leg easily reached the door, although there was only a narrow lip of the door that I could push on. The rest of the door met the wall squarely. I pushed, felt some give, and pushed harder. More give. Maybe three centimeters of space opened. Sweat dripped down my face and sides by the time I felt like I had enough space opened that I could slip through. This part was not easy. 
I had to cling tighter to the ladder rung with my weak right hand, my right foot trying to wrap itself around a rung, all while reaching with my left hand and foot through the space. I found a helpful piece of metal doorway trim on the hallway wall and gripped it tightly, braced my left leg against the elevator doorway, and sucked in a breath. One shot. If I missed, I'd be fine for the first fifty or so meters. The last meter would be the problem. Holding my breath, every muscle tensed, I launched myself toward the space I'd opened. I yanked hard with my left hand, willing my fingers not to slip. I felt myself come short, but I leaned more and tightened my leg and pulled harder. Air exploded from my chest as I slipped onto the floor of the hallway, my legs still hanging out through the partially opened elevator door. That was stupid. It worked, but I was never going to do that again. My heart hammered. My muscles felt suddenly liquid. Bug me. It took me a little while to feel like I could stand again. I forced my breathing to slow and got to my feet. I had no way of knowing how much time I had, nor did I know if I was even on the right floor. The hallway looked correct, but all the hallways were the same in this building. No, this one just had the single door at the end. It had to be the prime administrator's office. And since there were no other doors in the hallway, robots couldn't jump me from behind the door. Unless, Nick, there are doors that are perfectly flush with the walls, like those panels that opened for the scanners. It was too late now. I couldn't go back. Or at least there was no way I was jumping across that space in the elevator shaft again. My heart pounding, I crept along the hallway. I wondered if the door would open, but before I could worry about that for any length of time, the pale white panel slid quietly into the wall. No surprise, really, considering. The prime administrator wouldn't need to lock an internal door unless a prisoner was behind it. When I got to within a meter of the open door, I stopped. My skin flared with cold tingles. The prime administrator was still sitting at his desk. I stood completely still, wondering why he hadn't turned when the door opened. Was he asleep? Was his concentration that good? I waited for what felt like half an hour, not daring to move, focusing on keeping as still and quiet as possible. No movement at all. He sat, slightly slumped in his chair, his hands resting on his desk. It seemed like he was just staring straight ahead. I hazarded a step forward. No reaction. Confusion replaced surprise and fear. I slipped through the doorway and crossed the room fast, the door sliding shut behind me. Still no reaction from the man. His stillness was scarily unnatural. If I looked long enough, I could see him breathe, but that was it. No other movement, and his eyes were closed. It was like he was a... I looked closer. No way. That was impossible. The word wouldn't leave my brain, no matter how hard I pushed. The prime administrator wasn't human. He was a robot. Chapter 22 He wasn't a robot. His hand was warm. The skin I felt when I touched his wrist and his hair, they were all real. No robot had flesh and bone. I held my breath and pushed his hand. It slid across his desk, feeling completely limp. But he had no reaction. Nothing at all. Still breathing unnaturally slowly. I released my breath and scanned the office. It looked exactly like it had before. Three walls covered in now dark screens, a couple of doors. Turning back to the prime administrator, or whatever it was, I investigated him. It. Something. A bit more. Everything about it looked human. It had talked a little funny, now that I thought about the time I'd spent in this office earlier, but it walked normally and everything. It had to be sleeping, or something like that, but I needed to use its desk, so I carefully pushed its hands off the glass desktop and set them on his lap. 
Without the hands to prop it up, it leaned forward somewhat. I ran my hands over the desk, searching for a place to power it on. I thought back. The corner? The robot thing had brushed the corner of the desk. I put my hand there, fingers spread. A hiss, and I sensed some movement. Heart suddenly clawing out of my throat, I spun, bumping the sleeping thing. The door. Just the door closing. It didn't matter. I had to move fast. Flickers appeared on the bank of screens on the left wall. The flashing pixels resolved quickly into multiple images, images of life in New Frisco. I needed to go backward and find that clip that I'd seen of me and the other pushers. I searched the desk with my hands. As I did so, multi-colored rectangles of light illuminated beneath my fingers. I leaned more over the desk, nudging the prime administrator again. He slumped more, then slid sideways, falling limply toward the floor. I grabbed at him, but he was a grown man, or robot man, or whatever. He was too heavy. I got a hold of his shirt, but he pulled me forward as he fell. With a thump, he hit the floor, still in pretty much the same position he'd been in when seated. His weight nearly pulled me off my feet, so I grabbed at his chair with my injured hand. An electric shock, stronger and longer lasting than a static shock, coursed up my arm. What the bug? I jerked back, stepping away from the chair. The tingles in my arm faded, but my fingertips felt numb. The chair was electrified. I stretched and wiggled my fingers to get rid of the numbness. I peered closer at the chair. It looked like nothing more than a chair. The prime administrator, whatever it was, lay completely unmoving in a semi-fetal position. Obviously, the electrical current wasn't some kind of defense mechanism on the chair. It had to have been going while the prime administrator was still sitting there. Of course. Whatever the thing was, the chair charged it. I pushed my confusion and curiosity away, which wasn't easy. A human robot, and nobody in New Frisco knew about it. I didn't even think we had this technology, and tech was my thing. Now wasn't the time. I needed to see that video. It would be my proof of what really happened that night. I checked my papa. Bren had died almost exactly 24 hours ago. I felt like I had lived through a year since then. I found the controls for the videos and discovered I could manipulate the videos on each screen. Scanning quickly, I set the player to feed all of the videos it had to those screens. There was no sound, so it almost felt like I was watching a fantasy of some kind. But these were all scenes of real life in New Frisco. There. The camera that had taken this clip must have been on one of the lights in Hope Park. It had a wide vantage point, but you could only see the face of my pusher friends and me if we turned just right. Even so, we moved around enough that I had no doubt that this was really me and my friends from the night before. I watched myself go to the cycles, put the glue under my papa, and start writing. The clip was long enough that I was able to see the entire thing. Melissa and Bren checking my heart rate, victory shining from my face, everyone leaving except for me and Bren. When Bren started pedaling, I wanted to shout at him to stop, wished I could go back in time and tell him to quit it, that I had been wrong, even though I had also been right. The camera lost sight of Bren and me as we rode away. It stayed focused on the empty park for nearly a minute after, then the clip ended. This was proof. Proof that there was more to the bug than everyone thought. And here I was, in the prime administrator's office, at his computer desk. What kind of damage could I do here before they caught me? I scanned the room again and held really still. No sound. My papa said it was 0330. I wasn't sure when things started waking up around here, but I decided I didn't want to wait around to be caught. I'd dig around until 0400 and then get out of here. Somehow. I bent over the translucent desk and fiddled around, brightly colored rectangles flashing under my fingertips. After a few minutes, I hit the right space, a spot on the left corner of this side of the desk, 
and a screen appeared in the dead center of the glass. A keyboard appeared under it, along with a few other lit spaces. Commands of some kind. I'd figure those out if I needed to. The screen populated with several icons. I clicked on one that said Observation. The icon expanded into a secondary screen down and to the left of the first screen, listing a bunch of directories. Purple res, green res, orange res. It was a list of all the residential quadrants in New Frisco. I clicked on purple res. A huge list of numbers appeared under the purple res heading, each with a thumbnail-sized image of what had to be the view from a camera. So observation was exactly that. That meant that if I went to the Hope Park directory, I should be able to find the video file of what happened last night. And I could probably even find a clip of Bren's death if I dug around in purple res long enough. I needed some way to carry those clips with me, or some way of getting them off the prime administrator's computer into a place that I could access them from outside. I didn't have a Z-stick. If I'd been going to class, I would have had one on me for sure. I felt like an idiot, but patted my pockets anyway. Maybe one would just appear there. No such luck. Dreck. I left the secondary screen open and continued poking around the computer. A small icon, a green X with red lines running down the middle of the legs of the letter, caught my eye. Vaccine. I knew that word. This had to have something to do with the bug. I clicked on it and another secondary screen opened, this time to the bottom right. I glanced at my papa, 0340. I needed to get out of here soon. A list of directories filled the new screen with different icons. One was an image of a clock with schedule next to it. This must be the schedule for the knockout. Why would it be called vaccine? I opened schedule. I was right. Could I turn off the knockouts? Make everyone have to go to sleep on their own? People would all of a sudden be able to push their heart rates past 140. I had to try it. I clicked on the link that said 2230. An orange alert box flashed. Identification verification required. A small black box opened inside the alert box. It was a fingerprint scanner. What would happen if I scanned my finger? Probably the thing would seize up. A cage would fall out of the ceiling, alarms would blare, and bright red lights would flash. At that point, robots would likely show up and blow me to bits. Better to not try it, I figured. But I had the prime administrator right here. I bent over the thing and grabbed his hand, stretching it toward the desk. No good. Maybe I could get him back into his chair. I leaned to hook my arms under his, but immediately trashed that idea. The stupid cast on my right arm was really getting in the way. I guessed that if I had a knife, I could cut the thing's finger off. If he was a robot or something, he wouldn't feel it. I pushed the gruesome thought away, staring at the crumpled heap of semi-human. Something pale green was poking out of the man's pants pocket. I stooped to get it. A small card, about the size of a couple of my fingers. I stuffed it into a pocket on my zip. Forget the fingerprint. I stopped and considered, looking back at the screen and wondering what the knockout had to do with the vaccination against the bug anyway. It was just supposed to calm your heart rate down really fast, so that the bug couldn't get anywhere. It had taken researchers all over the world nearly a year, back during the infection, to figure out that the bug needed a heart to be working pretty hard in order to be able to get in and do its nasty business. And since people couldn't naturally slow down their hearts fast enough, the knockout had been made, because there was no vaccine for the bug. Later, tests had shown that a person could carry the bug for a week or two and not die, or even get sick, as long as the person's heart rate didn't go too high. In fact, it turned out the human body's immune system could kill the bug within two weeks, again, as long as the person's heart rate didn't go up too high. As I stood there remembering my old virus classes, a thought tickled the back of my brain. It felt like a tiny speck of light, smaller even than the pinpoint of a star in the sky, had suddenly opened in my gray matter. I squeezed my eyes closed and tried to make the speck bigger. What did that mean? 
I knew I was missing something, knew that I almost had whatever it was. But it slipped away. I tried to catch it by whispering what I'd been thinking about. Okay. I stared at the screen on the glass desk, but didn't see it. The bug can be on... No. A person can carry the bug for a while without dying. I glanced at my papa. O three hundred fifty. But we can kill the bug naturally if we don't let it get us first. If we have time. I waited for the speck of light to come back. Nothing. And the knockout saves us from the bug in the air by slowing our heart rate. I waited, imagining I stood in my own brain and was tapping my foot impatiently. Nothing. But the bug can't be in the air anymore because of the wanderers. And me. Still nothing. But what about Bren? The speck came back. Only it wasn't a speck. It was a column of thundering light. I nearly sat on the prime administrator's chair, but caught myself just before shocking my backside. A vaccine directory. The knockout. The immune system. No bugging way. Impossible. No way could that be true. I tossed a look toward the room's doors. No sign of anybody or any robots. I had to find out if this was true. Glancing down at the crumpled prime administrator, I considered trying to wake him up and ask him. No, it. But that was stupid. The human robot thing was still bigger and stronger than me, and it was definitely being controlled somehow. It wouldn't answer me. My hands darted around the three screens in front of me, frantically trying to find a directory or file or anything that could tell me I was wrong. I had just glanced at my papa again, the time was 0400, when I found a directory called Prime 1. When I opened it, I saw there were schematics of the layout of the dome. I bent closer and scanned the thumbnails. What looked like offices filled the entirety of the sections of the dome that were above ground. The prime administrator's office was on S1. I guessed the S stood for subterranean, or maybe stupid. Probably subterranean, which meant that the room I'd been locked in was on S2. I opened the schematic for S2, curious. I hadn't noticed when I was being led to that room, but it looked like there were nine additional rooms. They were called H1 through 10. I pondered that briefly. Happy place one? Not likely. It had to be for holding or something similar. The directory indicated that there were two more floors below S2 and that S3 was mostly labs. I opened the schematic. The biggest lab had no name at all. It was just called Lab. Knowing I needed to hurry if I was going to find a way out of Prime 1 before anybody found me, I quickly opened S4. What I saw made me stand up straighter, then bend closer. S4 had no real rooms or offices. It looked like it was access tunnels and pipes and stuff like that. And one of the tunnels... I pictured Prime 1 in relation to New Frisco. That long tunnel led toward the dumps. It had to. I imagined the dumps, the long conveyor tunnels leading from each res. Prime 1 had one too, which made sense. I shook my head, filing that info away. I would rather find my way back up to ground level and get out that way. It seemed more direct, but it never hurt to have a plan B. But the video clip, I needed it for proof that the story the prime administrator was trying to get me to tell wasn't true. People needed to know that we were being lied to. The clip of the pushers at Hope Park would do that. I had to get it out of the building somehow, and if I was right about the knockout, I chased my thoughts around my brain. Then it came to me. I could send the clip to my IM box. Moving fast, I opened the network and suddenly found myself at the Prime Administrator's interface. Even better! I tapped in my IM box ID, attached the clip, and went to hit, but stopped as another thought occurred to me. They've got to be monitoring my box, I said to the room. If Bren were alive, I'd send it to him. One of the other pushers. I racked my brain, finally coming up with Melissa's ID. I sent the message and headed for the door I had come in earlier in the day, not the one that led down to the holding rooms. It was time to get out. 
The door slid open with a swish, and I glanced into the strange cylinder that I'd had to go through. It had to be a scanner of some kind. I took the spoke out of my pocket and poked a hole through my zip, sliding the spoke up next to the zipper again. I stepped out of the office, remembering how this had gone earlier. First, the long hallway, then the reception room, or whatever it was, and then this strange cylinder hallway. Lights flashed again, colorful, bright, and accompanied by pops. Then the voice came again. Proceed. I proceeded. Fast. I ran through the door to the reception room, cut quickly through there, and within seconds was jogging down the long hallway. Lights came on above me, obviously sensitive to motion. When I hit about five meters from the doorway that led to the platform that the Enforcer ship had come down on, I stopped. The robots were going to be there. They didn't have to sleep, but maybe they were powered down for the night? No, that was wishful thinking. They were guard robots. This wasn't going to work. I'd go through that door and be caught immediately. Maybe I'd get lucky. Maybe they'd be gone or wouldn't be turned on. Or maybe I could move fast enough that I could get away even if I was being chased. Those treads they moved on didn't look that fast. I stood for a moment, torn. The door slid open and a robot, glinting in the cold light above, whirred through. A gun of some kind unfolded from its arm and a metallic voice spoke. Halt! Chapter 23 I didn't halt. I spun and ran, making for the door I'd just come through. A quick, loud explosion sounded behind me. I flinched and dodged. A rubber bullet slammed into my left shoulder, sending me stumbling almost to the ground with pain. I'd felt worse over the last day. I kept going, through the open door, the first room, and the flashing cylinder. The few seconds that the scanner took to clear me and let me through felt endless. I ran through the Prime Administrator's office. Incredibly, the doors were still working, but they were sure to be locked soon. I'd be trapped. I ran down the hallway, glancing behind me for other guards or robots. Positive there were more around, probably converging from any other rooms and hallways. I had nowhere else to go but toward the elevator that had taken me down to my holding room. But they had to be able to control the elevator, which meant that if I got in, I was done. Game over. The guard or monitor system, or whatever they had in Prime 1, knew exactly where I was going. Even if there weren't any cameras, I had to change that. I narrowed in on the elevator door. As I stopped to catch my breath, despair clawed through me. It seemed like the only way the chasing was going to stop was if they just killed me. I ran my fingers down the elevator door, searching for a gap I could use. Nothing. I should have left the thing propped open somehow. End of the road. I had robots behind me, guards of some kind for sure coming up the elevator, and they would want to kill me once they realized I had no intention of going along with their cover-up. The cover-up. Maybe I should just go along with it. I remembered Bren's last moments, how scared he had been the confusion in his eyes. I couldn't go along with it. For Bren. For everyone else, whether or not they realized that the new chapter was based on a lie. A lie that covered up the truth about the bug. I had to find out if I was right, not just for everyone else, but for me. The freaky robot had seen me only a minute or two ago. No way could human guards have reacted yet. I hit the elevator button. I had to risk it. I couldn't get this door open by myself. Less than 30 seconds passed before I heard the elevator car approaching. A hum, then a few faint clicks, and the door slid open. I braced myself to jump anyone who might be in there. I even stumbled a step when the opening door revealed that the car was empty. Bug me! My heart hammered like a crazy carpenter or engineer. Within seconds, the door slid closed behind me and I felt myself moving down. It didn't take long to get to S3. I remembered the long tunnel I'd seen stretching out from S4 on the schematics, but I couldn't leave yet. I had to find out if I was right about the bug and the knockout. I had to. 
I clung to the side of the car as the door slid open. No shouts, so I peered around the bank of buttons into the corridor that led to the labs. Nobody. Which made sense. Where would they expect me to go? Not for the first time in the last hour, I felt thankful that they hadn't plastered Prime 1 with cameras. Their confidence that the people of New Frisco would obey without question was serving me well. They would have to search all over the building, although they probably had some way of monitoring the doors that opened, and the elevator. I had to expect that robots or guards could be right behind me. I stole another glance down the corridor outside the elevator, which was probably four meters wide and four meters tall. I had no trouble seeing due to the lights that had flickered to life when the elevator door opened. I slipped into the corridor and had a revelation just in time. I jerked back and stuck my body in the way of the closing elevator door, yanking off my zip. It took precious seconds, but I was sure this would be worth it. I dropped the zip in the path of the elevator door, stepped into the hallway, and held my breath. The door squeezed the zip against the slot where the door was supposed to seat, but it couldn't close all the way, and it bounced back open. That might slow them down. I hadn't seen any other elevators, although there had to be more, or at least some stairs. I exhaled and searched the hallway, calling back to mind the schematic I'd seen a bit earlier. That main lab should be down this hall, and around the first right turn. I came to the door I was looking for. Big, pale green letters were plastered across it, proclaiming simply, LAB. I stood there, mentally yelling at myself. Stupid. Of course the door would be locked. This part of Prime 1 was too important, and I had no way to open it. But I had to get in there. I kicked the door. It didn't move. I kicked it again. The same result. Stupid. I stepped closer and looked closely at the door. It was just like the rest of the pocket doors all over New Frisco. A three-foot-wide panel that slid into the wall when activated. A gray and black sensor pad was on the wall to the right of the door. That had to be how to get in. It probably only allowed access to a few people. Special people. Spam! People like the Prime Administrator! I reached for the pocket on my zip. The elevator! I ran back the way I'd come. My zip was steadily getting stuffed into the slot for the elevator door, and there was a loud, high-pitched alarm sounding from inside the elevator. I grabbed my zip, standing in the path of the doorway, and found the small green card. It was the same color as the letters on the lab. I knew this would work. On my way back to lab, I passed several other doors. I pulled up short at one. Comms. I didn't waste time to question the idea, but scanned the Prime Administrator's card and darted into the room. Yes! Communication technology clustered on tables throughout the room. I did the fastest circuit I could manage, trying to take in every bit of tech in sight. On the last table before I hit the back wall, I found what I was hoping for. Ear comms. I grabbed a few and ran to the door. Seconds later, I flashed the Prime Administrator's card in front of the sensor of the lab. The door made a sucking noise, then sank in maybe a centimeter. A long second passed. The door slid into the wall. I stepped through and the door closed behind me. I stayed in that spot, assessing the room and stuffing my handful of ear comms into a pants pocket. I figured the room was maybe 10 or 15 meters on every dimension. Three wide silver doors with big levers for handles lined the wall to my left. A couple of shining plasteel tables ran lengthwise from a couple meters in front of me toward the far wall, dividing the room into three sections. These tables were empty. On the right side wall extended another long table, this one holding several large monitors and a bunch of instruments that I didn't recognize. The silver doors first. I pulled the first open and was assaulted by cold air. These were cooling units. A light flickered on at the ceiling of the room, illuminating maybe twenty tall metal cylinders, all of them with a bright red triangle on them. The cylinders came up to my chest and were a meter in diameter. Making sure the door wouldn't close behind me, I went to the closest cylinder, peering at it. No labels, only the big red triangle. I pushed it carefully. It didn't move. 
I tried tipping it. Still no movement. It had to be a couple hundred kilograms. I felt around the top of the cylinder, discovering an almost non-existent seam that ran all the way around its diameter. So the cylinder had to open somehow. I ran my hands all over the thing, but couldn't find a button or keypad or anything. Straightening from my crouch, I banged the top of the cylinder in frustration. It gave a little. A hiss followed, and the top of the cylinder popped up, then rotated open, revealing hundreds, maybe even thousands, of vials. I'd seen these before. They were the knockout refills that the admins used on our papas every month. I glanced down at the red triangle on the cylinder again, dreading what that meant. The horrible, impossible idea I'd had in the prime administrator's office danced back into my mind. I forced down the fear that wanted to stop me and reached into the cylinder, holding my breath. The vials weren't glass. They felt like some kind of transparent plasteel. I pulled one out, realized I was holding my breath again, and carefully exhaled. The liquid inside the vial was slightly see-through but was tinged green, the color of a new leaf. I didn't get why a huge cylinder of the knockout had a symbol that looked like a danger warning on it. I wanted to act like I didn't know the answer, but I couldn't deny it. This had to be why I had lived and Brent had died. Gripping the vial carefully, I left the big cooler and headed for the wall of instruments. I needed to see if I could find proof. The video would be enough to make some people question the new chapter's preaching about the bug, but there was no way for me to prove to anybody that the vial I held was more than just the knockout injection. This vial was how the new chapter kept us controlled. The knockout wasn't saving us from anything. The first monitor came to life when I touched the space in front of it on the desk. A keyboard illuminated under my fingertips. After a few seconds of fiddling around, I realized that this computer wasn't encrypted or secured. Mr. Prime Robot Thing didn't think anyone would get in here, I said under my breath. Bug him. I tapped a little more, feeling like robots or other guards would burst in the room in just a few heartbeats. Most of the directories that appeared on the monitor meant nothing to me. Scientific and technical words, mostly. I scanned through them quickly. One directory was called Development, while the one under it was called Eradication. I hesitated for a moment, then selected Development. Before I could see the directory, noise exploded in my ear. So powerful and sudden, I felt like my body was being squeezed, my head pressed down on my neck. I flinched, my heart rate instantly breaking a hundred. I spun, scouring the lab. Nothing new appeared. Gripping the vial in my right fingers, I cursed the cast on my arm again and ran to the door. Bright red lights flashed from inside the light fixtures built into the ceiling. I couldn't tell where the noise was coming from, but every time it sounded, I felt like something sharp was cutting out a part of my brain. I tore toward the elevator, praying my zip was still there. I don't know if I felt a change in the airflow or pressure or detected a change in the pitch of the alarm, but I turned on instinct. One of the doors down the hallway I hadn't checked out burst open, spilling enforcers in their dark uniforms and sculpted armor. They immediately raised their keepers. I heard clicks as the ammunition clips rotated. I fell backward into the elevator in the same second the guns blasted, fire licking out the front of the barrels. Concrete, dust, and bits exploded from the wall I'd just been leaning on, splattering my face. Real bullets. Drek! Something hit my right eye, digging painfully. I grabbed my zip with my left hand, still gingerly holding the vial in my hand, and praying the elevator door would close, and that it was bulletproof. I hit S4, that tunnel that led to the dumps. The enforcers and guards wouldn't expect me to use the conveyor belt tunnel. I hoped. The elevator door slid closed, but some bullets slammed into the wall right next to my knee just before the door seated itself. I tucked my legs up, rolling frantically away, blinking fast to try to clear my eye. The elevator didn't move. Had I missed the button? I glanced over, peering through my left eye. 
The S4 button flashed red. Come on! I flung myself at the button panel. Move! Red flashing, a small black sensor panel next to the S4 button. I dug in my pocket for the Prime Administrator's card. Bullets hammered the outside of the doors. I had seconds before the enforcers hit the button to open the door from their side. I flashed the card at the sensor. The button stopped blinking, then glowed creamy white. A half second, then the elevator jerked downward. My heart skipped in relief. Please think I'm going up. I knew this was stupid. They would know I was going down. Down was my only way out. But if this was the only elevator down, which it seemed like it had to be since the enforcers had obviously come from the stairs, maybe I could get ahead of them. I forced my racing thoughts to slow down, taking steady breaths. I rubbed my left eye and found a little pebble of concrete. I blinked. Good, no longer half blind. The elevator car jerked gently and stopped. I had about two seconds before the door opened, during which I yanked my zip over my cast and finished putting it all the way on. The door slid left. I poked my head out. Red lights spun on the walls, intermittently painting the walls of the brightly lit corridors that stretched left, right, and straight ahead. Conduits, pipes, air vents, and other things that I couldn't identify plastered the walls and ceilings. I saw nobody, but the alarm was still sounding, and I quickly found the door that matched the stair door on the level up. They'd be coming through there. I mentally reviewed the schematic I'd seen, hoping I wasn't remembering wrong, and darted out of the elevator, tearing up the hallway that led directly in front of me. I had about 40 meters of hallway to cover before the hallway ended at a T. Halfway down the hall, over the alarm, I heard shouting behind me. I tossed a look over my left shoulder. They weren't in sight yet. I poured on the speed and reached the T, turning left. This hallway stretched about 30 meters and had several entrances to rooms and other corridors. I ran past lengths of conduit and pipes, breaker boxes, and one that said emergency power, taking the second hallway that led off to the right, wishing again that I could take this stupid cast off. Maybe it had been the crawl through the air duct, because I felt like I had hit a peak of agony in my right arm, and that no pain could match it. Or maybe I was just getting used to the constant throbbing. It felt looser than it had in, well, a day. The hallway dead-ended at a blank, gray, concrete wall. It looked as old as the rest of the walls, so it couldn't be some new addition. It had been left off the schematic on purpose. I paused to wipe my sweaty hand on my zip, afraid the vial would slip from my grip, but not wanting to take a chance on it breaking in one of my pockets. I spun back the way I'd come. I ran hard, turning down the first hallway I'd passed. The shouting grew louder, echoing and mixing with the physical volume of the alarm. I wished I could find that alarm and blow it up. Why had they made it so bugging loud? This hallway dead-ended too. Drek bug, fragging bug! It was like one of those dreams where you're trying to get somewhere, but your legs don't move fast enough, and it feels like you're moving through transparent mud. I had to have missed something. There had to be a way to get into the conveyor belt tunnel. Back again to the main hallway. I poked my head out. Explosions over the alarm. Concrete chips splattered my face. Throwing myself back, I saw a group of enforcers pouring down the hallway, right at me. Panic slammed my lungs into my throat. No, not here, not now. I scoured the main corridor. Where was that stupid tunnel? It had to be here. I spun again and ran down the branch I was in, feeling the enforcers getting closer, with their keepers and real bullets. I wanted to tuck my shoulders up as I dashed toward the dead end. How would it feel to... I pushed the question away. Near the dead end, I found it. A door that blended into the concrete, but was metal. Don't be locked. I slammed into it, and it gave way, swinging open and banging against a wall, then bouncing back. I dodged it and shoved it closed with my foot, searching the bland, all-concrete passage for something to block or lock the door. The conveyor belt tunnel was lit by intermittent track lighting built into the ceiling, and that was enough to see that there was nothing going by on the conveyor belt. Which shouldn't surprise me, since this was the end of it. The hallway ran straight for hundreds of meters. 
No matter how fast I ran, it would be easy for them to get me, and the conveyor belt was too low to the ground to use for cover. I had no time. Maybe I could jam the door. I bent, yanking off my zip. There was a slight gap between the bottom of the door and the floor. I shoved both sleeve cuffs through the gap, then stuffed the rest of the zip as deep into the crack as I could. This wasn't going to work. I yanked at the door, kicking the zip at the same time. The door stopped after a few centimeters. I yanked harder, keeping the zip in place with my foot. The door jerked a little, then stopped. A gap of maybe two-tenths of a meter was left. This was not going to hold for long. I turned and ran, wishing I could break the lights above me. Of course, that wouldn't help much either, since the enforcers had to have night vision goggles. I ran faster. The pounding alarm's pressure in my head decreased as I tore down the passage. I fought the urge to look back the way I'd come. Just run. I moved it, glad nothing was coming out of the regular holes in the walls of the tunnel. I didn't need extra noise beyond the fading alarm and jouncing hum of the conveyor belt. It was too late at night, or too early, really, for garbage to be coming down the chutes to the belt. Still running, I considered my next move. I had the vial, ear comms, and a theory. A good theory, but I needed proof. Sucking wind, I willed my legs to keep moving. They hurt and felt heavy. My lungs felt like they were being chewed on. I needed to stop, but I needed to not get shot. I felt myself slowing. This was completely insane. I didn't know what to do even if I got proof. Was I going to single-handedly bring down the entire new chapter? If I stopped and gave up, they might just take me in. Nope. Those had been real bullets back there. They were done pretending they wanted my help. They had something to protect, and they thought I could damage it or expose it. They thought I could do damage to it. Did the enforcers know everything? I wished I could think about that, try to figure it out. No time. I forced my legs to go faster. I felt sure I was at 160 beats per minute, maybe higher. I wasn't done. I pushed myself harder, forcing my head to clear and fighting off the thought of a bullet hitting me in the back. My lungs hurt. My whole body hurt. I soaked it up. They were chasing me because they were bugging, scared of me of what I might do to their control. They were scared of me. As I ran, a plan came to me, as did the sound of shouts echoing from behind me. The alarm had faded. This tunnel must have already led me out from under Prime 1. How much farther to the dumps? Would they be waiting for me? Maybe. But maybe I'd get lucky again, like I'd been with my zip. The thing must have held that door shut for a little while because I never heard a gunfire while I ran. Maybe the spoke stuffed inside the zipper had saved the day again. I ran on, forced to slow down a little because my legs just couldn't keep up the pace. But I kept moving. I hoped I could keep being unpredictable. They couldn't track me anymore, so if I could stay off their radar, I should be able to make this work. This was a ridiculous plan, but that didn't matter. Because if I was right about the knockout and the bug, I had to change things. Sure, the new chapter was calm and peaceful, but what the Prime Administrator was doing was wrong. Nothing but wrong. People had to know so they could choose, and they would never choose what was going on. That thought almost brought me to a halt. No one else knew. The prime administrator had been doing this all by himself. Then again, that robot thing couldn't possibly be running the show. It seemed too limited, and this thing had to be happening all over. Bloody bug! All over the world? Every person on the planet would be affected if I somehow beat them here in New Frisco. I shoved that thought aside. Not now. I estimated that the tunnel that led from Prime 1 to the dumps was probably two kilometers long. I wished it were shorter, but the dumps were on the edge of town, which made sense since they smelled horrible. By the time I came to the end of the tunnel, I was moving at a fast walk and totally out of breath. My heart felt like it had grown two sizes in the last day. 
it had probably pumped more blood in the last 24 hours than it had in the entire month before. The whole better calm than dead lifestyle didn't exactly lend itself to the racing around I'd been doing, but that hopefully also applied to the enforcers. I'd been smelling the dumps for a minute or so before getting to the end of the tunnel, but the smell became a lot heavier. The tunnel ended at a tough metal mesh, with an opening for the belt with its tall sidewalls to make it through. I'd seen this mesh wall plenty from the other side. There was also a narrow door on the side wall. It was locked. The prime administrator's card took care of that. I eased the door open, which thankfully was near me, and held it tightly, listening. The smells of organic refuse, electrical heat, and the night sky filled my nostrils. I heard nothing suspicious. I poked my head out, glad that it was still dark outside. I had maybe another hour of full dark to get completely out of sight. I slipped through the door and pushed it closed, pocketing the card. The distinctive flavor of the dumps coated my tongue. As always, I hated the smell and taste of electrical heat the most. Unsurprisingly, the place was deserted. Spread out in front of me was the entire expanse of the dumps, with the paper recycling plants, the plasteel plants, the organics troughs and barrels, and multiple sheds and conveyor belt paths, which were all moving. I guessed they never turned off. Garbage never sleeps? I'd never been in the plasteel or paper plants. When you got sent to the dumps for discipline, you were always on belt cleaning duty. I could probably find my way to the clothing shed and put on the entire getup of smock, head cover, and mask, and long gloves with my eyes closed. I took quick stock. Melissa was in orange res. I mentally mapped out how I would cross the dumps, then make it through the biz res to orange. This was going to be close. People would be out on the streets by 0530, and it was already well past 0430. Plus, enforcers would be out looking for me, and the cameras all over New Frisco were always on. Time to move. I hoped Melissa was a light sleeper. Chapter 24 I knew from the moment I started across the dumps that enforcers would show up soon, but the force that descended on the place was beyond belief. Two enforcer pods screamed over the edge of the sunken space from two different directions, followed almost immediately by a much larger pod with a slightly different design. This new pod was green. A transparent hemisphere made up the entire front of the pod. That had to be the cockpit. Stabbing out from under the pod were multiple, long, mean-looking barrels. Cannons or some other kind of weapon. Two turrets on top and two turrets on the bottom of the pod tracked back and forth, obviously controlled by motion sensors. Or worse, maybe even smart cameras. The new pod hovered above the dumps while at least ten figures slipped out of it and coasted the twenty meters to the earth, something glowing under their feet and at their back. These figures each had belts crisscrossing their torsos and guns slung over their backs. Their uniforms were the same color as the pod. The moment the figures hit the ground, they stomped hard and immediately lifted off the ground a few centimeters. Holy bug, they're rangers! The enforcer pods landed on opposite sides of the huge waste recycling area, and at least twenty men streamed out of each pod spreading out fast in a coordinated plan. A lump of fear made it hard to breathe. Tracking cannons jutted from the enforcer pods, too. The enforcers and rangers had to have heat vision goggles, too, probably infrared. I had no idea what else they had, but at school, we had always been coming up with ideas about what the canisters and cylinders on the enforcer's belts were. Explosives, gas, could be anything. I hugged tightly to the wall of the paper plant I'd made it to, willing the shadows to get darker and hoping they wouldn't turn on the floodlights that sometimes came on during later shifts. I forced myself to breathe and shoved my brain back into gear. I watched them move around, shouting at each other, then looked back to the rangers. 
It looked like the enforcers were going to spread out around the farthest edges of the dumps and start moving inward in a shrinking circle. The rangers were grouping up. It looked like they were going to clear the dumps from the inside out, meeting the enforcers and leaving no shadow, building, shed, or trough unchecked. Bad news. I had to move before the enforcers closed ranks. Somehow, I had to keep a building between me and every enforcer and ranger while crossing the dumps, and I had to do it without leaving a heat signature. I pushed into the paper plant, glad the machines around me were silent so I could hear anyone approaching. The plant covered about 30 square meters of space and was one simple room filled with the equipment used to recycle paper. Piles of unprocessed paper filled one corner, where a conveyor belt that branched off the central dump hub came in and dropped them. I jogged through the building, searching for something I might use to keep out of sight. Next to the piles of paper were several baths, all filled with water. Between the baths and a huge machine were more deep canisters, but along with water, these held what looked like paper pulp. I stuck my free hand in one of them, still gripping the knockout vial in the other hand. I was trapped. I had no way of hiding my body heat, and the enforcers and rangers were going to find me and kill me on the spot. I needed help. I dug into my pocket for the earcoms. In the bad light of the paper plant, I could tell most of them were destroyed, probably from me rolling around in the elevator trying not to get shot. Sorting through the bits, I found one that was intact. I stuck it in my ear and hesitated, worried the admins were monitoring all the frequencies. I looked around the paper plant again. Outside, I heard shouts and the noise of heavy boots, as well as the high-pitched whine of the pods. They were going to find me. I had no choice. I tapped the earcom and whispered a name. A light click sounded in my ear. What? Who's that? Connor's voice, obviously just woken up. Connor, it's Nick. A second passed. Fuck me, Nick? Nick Granger? Do you know any other Nicks? I stepped deeper into the paper plant. What are you doing? The enforcers were looking for you. Is it true about Bren? Connor's voice was getting louder. Quiet down! My whisper sounded harsh, too loud. I lowered my voice. Yes, friends, I choked and couldn't say the word. It's true. I need help. I'm in a paper plant and... In the dumps? Finally, Connor was talking quieter. Where else? They're after me. I need to figure out a way to get past the enforcers and rangers. But I don't know how to hide my heat signature. Rangers? What's that? Come on! Connor, keep up! They're like... Just don't worry about it. They're worse than enforcers. I need help. How do you hide a person's body heat? Why are you asking me that? I have no idea. He was right. I'd called him because he was my age. Paul would have been so much better. The shouting outside was getting louder. Right, uh, never mind. Forget I called. Nick! I tapped my ear calm before he got anything else out. Paul Martin. Paul's high voice came through almost instantly. Did he never sleep, like me? When was the last time he'd had the knockout? Nick? He was even whispering. How'd you know it was me? Who else would be calling me at this time after everything that's happened? Seriously? The voices were right outside the paper plant now. Of course they would come in. They would see my body heat through the walls and come right for me. I had maybe seconds. Paul, enforcers with heat vision goggles are after me. How do I hide body heat? Where are you? I could practically hear him bending over his table, doing calculations on his home station. In a paper plant. I pushed myself deeper into the shadows of the building. They were going to burst in any moment. Huh? Oh, a half second. Get in the pulp baths. They're 27 to 29 degrees. Human body heat is 37. The difference is enough to... Yeah, yeah, okay. I ran to the nearest pulp bath and got in. The pulpy liquid went up to my knees. Got it. You have to get all the way in. Your whole body. Okay, I sat in the cold stuff. If they're monitoring, I said, 
They'll find you, Paul said. No, they'll know you helped me. Silence from Paul. I heard a bump against the door of the plant. The door swung open and voices got louder. I'll stay out of sight, Paul said. He kept talking as I lay back in the cold water. The pulp felt slimy and squished all around me as I submerged myself to my chin. Melissa says she figured something out with the papas. I'll find out and see if it will help you. Don't worry. I squeezed my lips closed and I lowered my head. Gooey pulp slid all over my head and face. I kept just my nose above the surface, breathing as quietly and slowly as I could. Nick, Paul said. I know something weird happened with Bren. We'll figure it out. Then his voice was gone, and I was surrounded by cold goop. I lay in the pulp bath and felt ripples wash over me as what had to be a lot of heavy boots slammed into the floor around me. I realized I was still gripping the cylinder from the big lab. I needed a better way to hold on to this thing. Paul's last words rang through my head. We'll figure it out. I'd just put him in danger, like I'd done with Bren. I couldn't be the cause of him dying, too. Or Connor. The thought of them helping almost made me feel warm in the cold of the pulp bath, but I couldn't do it. Just talking to them on the earcom had been bad enough. The ripples and distorted shouts continued for what felt like days. I wasn't sure how much longer I could stay in this thing. It felt like some of the pulp was trying to slide between my lips and the thought almost made me gag. I had to get out, but I held still. Finally, the gentle agitation in the goopy water stopped for good. I took my time getting out, even though every muscle and nerve screamed for me to get out, get clean, and get warm. By the time I was sitting up straight, the voices outside had grown a little fainter. A few minutes later, shivering, I slipped out of the paper plant, caked in sopping wet, slimy paper pulp. The stuff smelled slightly of vinegar, but mostly of old water. I looked around from the shadows of the paper plant building. A team of enforcers poured out of one of the compost plants. The lines of the enforcers had closed. They had about ten meters between each of them. I watched for a few seconds as they moved towards the center of the dumps, skirting the jittering, humming conveyor belts and scouring the walls of every building. The gaps between the enforcers closed steadily, while the rangers moved a lot quicker on their hover things, covering every centimeter of space as they moved toward the enforcer line. I clung tightly to the plant wall, sliding toward the far side, the side closer to the center of the dumps. I'd made it past the teams searching the buildings, but was still between the ring of enforcers and the ring of rangers. This was insane. Fifty trained men and women with nasty-looking guns and... I would make it, or I wouldn't. Bug it. Hopefully my body temperature was still lower than normal. I sure felt like it was as another shiver hit me. I took a deep breath and darted across five meters of open space to the next paper plant the moment the nearest enforcer seemed to be turning away. My heart was hammering like one of the huge metal stamps in the engineering dome. Squeezing tightly against the wall, I slid around the edge of the room toward a door, doing my best to keep down. I dashed to the next building, ducking under a conveyor belt and scurrying on all fours to the wall. This was a plasteel plant. I could tell by the tangy smell. The enforcer's line had moved even closer. The gaps between them were maybe seven meters now. They were too good, and I was way too slow. I had to get through one of those gaps now, before it became impossible. I steeled myself for another dash. Got something! A voice from not far away, back where I'd come from. I froze, pressing myself into the base of the building. There, on the wall. The same voice, on the wall? I looked up at the wall I was crouching against, then at myself. There was just enough light from the stars and moon to see the paper mush on my shoulder. I wiped it experimentally on the concrete wall. A faint trail of pulp. Stupid. So bugging stupid. What is that? Another voice now. Unknown, but it shouldn't be here. They were going to find me. I'd left a drecking trail. I looked around, panic churning my stomach. Move! I had to move now! 
I wanted to kick myself. When the idea came, I wanted to kick myself again. Tossing one more glance around, I launched myself up and dropped onto the nearest conveyor belt, laying flat on my back and curling my feet inward and pointing my toes. The belts had walls to keep the garbage from falling off during transit. They were just tall enough that, if I got lucky, the enforcers wouldn't see me. The belt moved painfully slowly, steadily taking me toward the hub in the center of the dumps. The rough, slip-resistant rubber slats that made up the belt felt bumpy and unyielding under my back. I kept my eyes open, needing to keep track of my bearings. I turned my head and sniffed the belt. Almost zero odor. This had to be a paper belt. I couldn't be too far from the hub, and once I got there, I could just crawl to the belt that led to orange res. I nearly yelled at myself when I realized my mistake. The conveyor belts only carried things away from the domes and reses. Could I get any dumber? I had effectively trapped myself in the middle of the dumps. But as I thought this through a little more, I realized... I would also be behind the lines of the rangers. They wouldn't expect me to be in the hub. I might have a little more freedom of movement if this worked. I kept careful watch to make sure I knew when I was coming to the hub. As I approached it, I heard more voices as the men and women on the squads grew increasingly frustrated. I grinned. They must be furious that they hadn't caught a kid like me yet. Almost there. The sound of multiple conveyor belts was unmistakable. None of the voices I heard was very close. I leaned up, bracing my right arm on the side of the belt. I saw movement at least 15 meters away. Nobody was looking my way. I levered myself up and dropped to the ground, scraping my way under the complex conveyor belt hub. Quickly getting my bearings, I reached up with my unhurt arm and grabbed the underside of the belt, grateful again for the sides of the belt which concealed about 25% of me as I scampered along. Another plus was that the movement of the belt should help conceal my movement toward the tunnel that led to the orange res. I wasn't sure what I would do if an enforcer or ranger got near, but for now, this was working. I made sure the vial I'd stolen was stuffed into a pocket of my pants and kept moving. I had crossed probably half of the distance to the mouth of the tunnel before I got anywhere near a ranger. I heard and saw the hover skates, the glow of the propulsion units illuminating the ground for a couple of meters around him. I kept moving, matching the speed of the conveyor belt. The skates kept pace with me, and I heard voices nearby, some of them coming through the ranger's radio. I forced my breathing to stay soft and shallow. Sweat dribbled down my forehead. I came to one of the regular support structures for the conveyor belts and had a flash of inspiration. I stopped between the legs of the support and held totally still. The ranger's skates never even slowed. I waited a few seconds, then kept crawling, my left hand bracing me on the conveyor belt. My calves and thighs screamed the farther I went, cramps starting near my knees. My ankles felt stretched beyond breaking. I forced myself to keep going. If I made it to the tunnel, they would have no clue. I should have lots of time to get to Melissa and her IM box. Finally, I came to the tunnel mouth, having passed one more pair of feet. I had to get in without being noticed. I could use the little green card to open the access door. But some admin somewhere would know exactly where I was the moment I tried that, especially since the city had to be on total alert by now. I looked up at the belt, watching it run without impediment into the tunnel I needed to get into. I shrugged, my right arm giving a twinge of pain. This was going to suck. Bug. I backed up a little, putting about five meters between me and the tunnel mouth. I took a deep breath, grateful the enforcers and rangers were far behind me. Another breath, then I sat in the dirt, reached up with my left arm, and felt for a handhold. There were small gaps between the rubber slats of the belt. I needed both hands. Bug me. I sucked in a breath. No choice. I forced my right arm up, reached with both hands, and grabbed the next gap as it passed over me, jamming all of my fingers through. The belt immediately started tugging me along. Pain flooded my right arm, but it was manageable. 
My heels dragged through the dirt of the dumps, probably leaving a trail behind me as I was carried. I looked ahead, saw the opening approaching faster than I'd expected, and desperately jackknifed my legs upward as hard as I could, pulling hard with my arms. I only got one foot braced against the sidewall of the belt. I pulled again, fighting gravity and agony in my arm. The opening was right there, maybe a meter away. I tried again. Got it! My feet slid through the opening, just tight enough against the conveyor belt. I braced them tighter and pulled, trying to buck the rest of my body higher. My right arm complained, then exploded with pain. My entire body shook with the strain. I couldn't do this. I had to let go, let them catch me. No, I didn't. I was halfway through already, just a few more seconds. I gripped as tight as I could and felt the crossbar on the inside of the opening slide against the top back of my legs, then my backside. I pulled up harder and tighter. Machine grease might have helped. The skin on my lower back caught on the metal bar. The pain forcing adrenaline into my arms or something, because I got higher. I nearly screamed as the crossbar scraped along my back, dragging my shirt up with it. The moment I felt the bar brush past the back of my head, I dropped, my back on fire and my arm feeling shattered again. I lay in the dirt under the belt for a few minutes, almost every nerve on my back screaming. In a moment of clear thinking, I rolled over, probably too late, to try to keep the dirt off my flayed back. My face in the dirt, I swore, feeling my sweat turning the dirt to mud. When was this day going to end? Probably never. Or, if I just lay there, probably sooner than I wanted it to. It was time to get up. I still wasn't done. Enough running. Enough being chased. Bren's death wasn't an accident. Everyone had to know. I levered myself up on my left arm, the muscles in both arms spasming. It took me a minute, but I finally got to my feet and stumbled down the tunnel to the orange res. My shirt slid down my back, sending icy, jagged stabs into me. Hopefully, the enforcers and rangers would keep searching the dumps for a long time. But I couldn't count on that, so I ordered my legs to move faster. They grudgingly obeyed, and before long, I'd hit a slow, draggy jogging pace that I could keep up for a while. As I jogged, I used my left hand to ease my shirt up. It helped for a little while, but I stumbled and fresh fire broke out all over my shredded back. I swore and tucked the shirt up into my armpit. Maybe Melissa would have something that I could use to bandage myself. The wound could get infected from the dirt I'd rolled in. Maybe the residual stench of the garbage belt would infect it, too. Double the fun. I wished I could call her on the earcom, but if they were being monitored, the admins would have enforcers waiting for me for sure. I could tell I was coming to the end of the tunnel, because the echoes of my footsteps and breathing changed. Finally, I reached the door that led to what I guessed was a maintenance shed. I stopped and listened, trying to keep my breathing steady. If nothing else, with all the running I'd been doing, without the knockout to save me, I had certainly proved the bug was out of the air, as if that needed any more proving. I had to be at 150 or more, maybe 160. Interesting that I couldn't really keep track of my heart rate when it was so high. Examining the door, I reached for the Prime Administrator's card. If I used the card, they would know where I was. And if they figured out I was in Orange Res, they had to know I was going to Melissa's. The Prime Administrator had said he'd been talking to my other friends, and that they had all cooperated. If I went through this door, I would have to get to Melissa's fast, and get away even faster. But should I even go there? I'd be putting Melissa in danger. I stood there for a couple of long minutes, mulling my options. I had a total of one. I had to go through the store and get to Melissa, if for no other reason than to get those video clips. Between them and this file, I might actually be able to stop what was happening. And then what? And the new chapter? If the new chapter went away, what would come next? It would be better, I thought. Almost anything would be better. And people would know where we went wrong so we could learn. But mostly, people would be free to live the way they wanted, without a chemical controlling them. There was no choice, really. 
I pulled the card out, scanned it, and opened the door when I heard the lock release. I found the metal ladder within seconds of leaving the tunnel, limped my way up it, and pushed into the faint beginnings of a new day, the mountains to the east just starting to glow. The shed was at the far end of Orange Res. I had just jogged Orange Res's entire length. As I eased out of the maintenance shed, I double-checked that nobody was near. All was quiet still, but wouldn't be for much longer. My papa said it was nearly 0500. The long road that edged Orange Res ran left and right in front of me. I glanced toward Green Res. What if I went that way instead? I could be home in 15 minutes. Tell mom and dad about everything. Let it all go. All of the craziness of the last night and day spun through my brain. They would believe me. They would tell me it was okay. Mom would hug me and probably cry about Bren. Dad would get his serious look, like he did when he talked about his job in the nursery. He would hug me too, tell me I needed to take a load off. Something deep in me ached for that. The scene glowed in my mind for a long moment, calling to me. But I couldn't. What I'd learned, what I'd done, there was no going back. And if I contacted mom or dad through the earcoms right now, it would for sure be monitored. I hoped they were okay. I looked around, reminded myself of where Melissa lived, and took off running. The admins and enforcers would figure it out soon. I had zero time. Chapter 25 Melissa lived in the second house on the right, down Hotel 1, which meant that I had to cover several blocks fast while staying out of sight. As I ran, I hugged to the houses, trying to keep to the last remaining bits of shadow. I'd gone two blocks before I realized how dumb I was being. They had to know I'd just shown up in orange res. They weren't idiots, so they would know that Melissa lived here, and they would easily figure out where I was going. I picked up my pace and did everything I could to save time, cutting through yards and between houses as much as I could. I didn't hear any enforcer pod sirens by the time I got near Melissa's, but that would change fast. I plastered myself against Melissa's neighbor's house and peered around the corner. I scanned carefully, but couldn't see enforcers or rangers or anybody. Nothing moved. I darted around the corner and made for the back of Melissa's house. I stopped and turned back to the street. I'd spotted a small pile of tiny pebbles that had been missed by the cleaning bots. I grabbed as many as I could in one swipe and ran to the backyard. Melissa didn't have a brother or sister, so I guessed that her room would be in the same place as mine. If I was wrong, well, I needed to be right. This would be a lot easier if I felt like I could use the ear comm. I sighed. Here goes... Holding a breath, I stepped out from the wall of the house and flung half of the pebbles at the window. They clattered a little against the glass, but it was quiet. If she was asleep, would she hear that? I counted to ten and threw the last few pebbles as hard as I could. That was a little louder. I stared at the glass. I saw something, some kind of movement, but I couldn't really see. A light turned on in the room and Melissa came into view. Her eyes stared wide at me. She was wearing regular clothes, zip and all. She put out a hand. I figured she wanted me to wait, then disappeared. The light turned off a second later. I slipped back against the wall, hoping she remembered to game the sensor on her door. Melissa ran around the corner of her house, saw me, and came at me like a speeding pod. I almost fell when she hit me, but she caught me and hugged me tightly. I stood completely still, shocked. Nick! She squeezed me tightly, her face warm against my cheek and neck. Bug me nightly! Then I yelped when her hands hit my back. She stepped back, her eyes searching mine. You're not dead! Her eyes. She'd been crying. No? I can't believe you're here. She fixated on my arm. What happened? Why had she been crying? I stared at her. Nick, what's going on? I couldn't speak. I heard her voice, heard her concern. 
She didn't want to capture me, drug me, betray me, shoot me, or anything. All of a sudden, I couldn't see very well, and my throat closed up tight. My head swam. I had no idea where to start. Nick? I tried to stop it. Everything came rushing back. The last day, everything. Tears dripped down my face. I turned away, completely embarrassed. Bren, I tried to say. I couldn't even understand myself. Everything hurt, inside and outside. I was so tired. I couldn't breathe. I know. I felt her move closer. It's okay. I know about Bren. She didn't know. She didn't understand that I'd done it. It was my fault. I squeezed my eyes shut, trying to cut off the tears. All of this was my fault, and I was so tired. My legs went wobbly, and I hit the oxygrass on my knees. Bren, I did it. No. I felt her drop down, too. Her hand touched my shoulder. You didn't do it. I forced myself to take a slow breath, lifting my left arm to scrub at my face. I didn't have time for this. I didn't have time to be a baby. I forced the misery back down, wishing I could just be mad about things, wishing I could have done better. It doesn't matter. I swallowed and looked at her. Sorry. Her hand on my shoulder moved down, brushing my shredded back. I hissed. What? She leaned to get a look, then came back fast. Bugging dreck, Nick. What happened to you? I thought about the last day. A laugh pushed its way out, painful and short. (sighs) Everything. But your arm and your back? She examined the cast. This is old tech. Who did this? She looked at my back again and stood. She pulled me to my feet. Let's fix that. We don't have time. We have to do something. It's horrible. She yanked me along, around to her door. They're coming. We don't have time. I pulled back. They know I'm here. She stopped and faced me. How? They know everything, remember? I pulled the green card out of my pocket, grabbing the vial at the same time. I used this, and they have to know where I was going. What's that? She reached for the vial. I let her have it. The knockout? Why do you have a vial of... I'll explain later. We have to get in your IM box. I started for her front door. The vids? I stopped, totally surprised. What? I've been up all night, trying to figure out what's going on. I saw the IM from the Prime Administrator a little while ago. So that was why she was wearing regular clothes already. She pulled a memory stick out of her zip pocket. I couldn't decide why the Prime Administrator would send me those clips but I thought I should put them on a Z-stick, just in case. I grinned at her. That's perfect. What are they? Proof, or part of it. I held up my hand. What? Proof? She kept the stick, shaking the vial in her other hand. And what's this? More proof, kind of. I reached for it. Come on, I need them, and I'm out of time. You're out of time? She glared at me. Spam that! Tell me what's going on. She put the stick in one pocket and the vial in another. Melissa, this isn't a joke. I have to get out of here. I heard sirens screaming. I had a minute, maybe. Come on, everything's a lie. The knockout, the bug, the whole bugging new chapter. I stepped closer to her, trying to ease my shirt higher off my back. Give them to me. She didn't move, just stared at me. Was she going to betray me too? Despair seeped into me. Please! I'll carry them. She grabbed my arm and pulled me across her backyard, glancing toward the sound of the approaching pods. You can tell me what's going on while we move. I tore my arm out of her hand. No way! You... This... You're... I shook my head. You can't. They're trying to kill me. They don't care. They don't care about lying and saying whatever they want. They'll kill you. My breath caught. Like they killed Bren. She stepped close enough for me to see tears filling her eyes. They killed Bren? Her voice sounded like a steel cutter in the engineering dome. How? It was the bug, wasn't it? I forced myself to keep my eyes on her. Yeah, it was the bug. And they killed him. I knew it was true and felt the misery and tears I'd held back harden a little in me. They did it. They're trying to kill me and they'll try to kill you. 
I held out my hand again. Please, you can't come. I don't even know if I'll make it. She turned and walked away. I'm coming. I ran to catch up. No, please. Nick, it's my decision. If they killed Bren, I want to know how and what we can do to get them back. But you don't understand. So, you've made it this far. I'll help you now. I caught up to her just as she broke into a jog, and we crossed through the yards of the next street's houses. I couldn't stop her. As we ran, I realized I didn't want to. So where are we going? Melissa slowed down as her papa sounded, warning her that her heartbeat had hit 100. I thought fast. We have to get that off you. They'll track it. I cursed Dolfo silently for stealing the nano cutter from me. Bugging, thieving, wanderer! My heart crawled up my throat. We had to move fast, but out of sight somehow. Melissa turned fast, looking up at the mountains to the east and hunching behind a low tree. Okay. She pulled a pin out of her short brown hair and bent it a little. Then she tugged and a tiny needle came free from the cylinder of the pin. The sun's coming up. We'd better hurry. What is that? My custom papa remover. A few of the girls have them, but we keep them quiet. I invented it. She bent to her wrist, poked at the spot near where the strap met the actual papa. I've only used it once, since I'm sure I'd get in huge trouble for taking the wrist dad off. After a few long seconds, during which I heard pods land and enforcers start shouting, a tiny rubber rod slid out of the strap and into the oxygrass beneath her. Then the papa hung loosely in her hand. She stood and grinned. What should we do with it? Throw it on a house. Maybe make it harder to find. Good idea. She stepped away a bit and leaned back, ready to throw it. Wait! She spun, her eyes wide. What? I couldn't believe how stupid I'd just been. Bug me! Did you get the knockout last night? She looked confused. No, I used the glue. I didn't want to sleep. I thought back to what we'd been taught about the bug and our immune system. Did you get it any time in the last couple of weeks? Why does it matter? It just does! The sound of the enforcers shouting at each other grew louder. No, I haven't gotten it in months, maybe more. The tone of her voice made me curious. Why not? Why haven't you? Because, I said, because I want to sleep when I feel like it. And you're the only one allowed to have a brain? I have to be just like everyone else, but Nick is the only one who's allowed to be a rebel. What are you talking about? She glared at me. It was always about you, what you wanted to do, and what you thought about the bug. That's stupid. Shut up, Nick. Girls! I had never understood why Melissa and Bren had gotten along so well. Talking to girls was impossible. Why does it matter if I had the knockout? Melissa stepped closer to me. It just does. I hoped she'd believe me, hoped I was right. That's what we need proof of. Melissa stood completely still. She cocked her head, chewing on her lower lip. You said we have to get proof about the knockout? And I can't have had it recently? I nodded, grabbing at her with my good hand. Come on! She pulled away. I felt like her eyes were digging into my brain. She held up the papa. The bug? Somehow she understood. Yes. Melissa growled. Bug eating spammers? Well, let's go then. I'm still getting rid of this, right? She held up her papa. The pods, sirens, and propulsion units seemed to be vibrating the leaves on the trees. Yes, hurry. She turned and flung the papa hard. It sailed onto the roof of a house two doors down. Wow, nice arm. She hurried back, rolling her eyes. Nice back. We took off. Now where to? She asked. We have to stay out of sight, but we have to find somewhere that we can test the knockout in the vial and also broadcast the clips. I wished I could rest for just a few minutes. The moment the thought crossed my mind, two enforcer pods screamed through the sky a block back and slammed to the ground. Go! Then where? Melissa was already out of breath. Where can we do that without being caught? In a moment, I knew exactly where we had to go. I hated it, but it was honestly the best idea I'd had in more than 24 hours. We have to go back. Back to Prime 1. 
Chapter 26 Are you crazy? Melissa clipped her shoulder against a wall as we rounded the corner, trying to keep a house between us and the shouting enforcers. Why would we go there? We have to make sure. Running and the pain in my arm and back were making it hard to speak. Each word was a breath. Proof! We need proof! In that moment, the pieces of the plan that had come to me earlier crystallized. We had to stop. Wait, I reached for her arm. Wait, we've got to stop. But they'll catch us. Despite what she said, she slowed to a walk, sucking deep breaths. She wasn't used to running like this. I'd been pushing longer and more often than her. We have to do this right. We can't spam it up. I drew closer to her and crouched next to her. Then what's your plan? She dropped to a knee and leaned on her other knee. First, you have to know what's been happening. I swallowed. Or at least what I think has been going on. Hurry up! Shut up. I tried to figure out where to start. Okay, I guess I should start with last night. I told her about the race Brent and I had done. I told her about hearing him cough and watching him die. The closer I got to his last seconds, the smaller I felt. Melissa was staring at me hard. Finish. I didn't know last night. I still don't really know for sure, but it was like what the teachers said. It was like his heart exp- I choked on the last word. My mind was full of his eyes and his last word. Stop. I looked up at her. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Don't talk about him like that. Just tell me what came after. What's been going on? She wiped her face and sucked wind. Wait a minute. I recalled moments I'd seen here and there over the last couple of months. Bren and Melissa talking with each other more than with anyone else. You... She turned to meet my eyes. You and Bren? Her shoulders hunched. She nodded. Oh, Drek. I'd ruined her life, too. But we didn't have time to dwell on how much it hurt. After that, I ran away, got on my cycle, and went to the engineering dome. In the next minute, I gave her the outline of what had happened in the last day. Then I told her about the vial and the knockout and the bug. I talked so fast that by the time I was done, I felt almost dizzy. Are you sure? Her high cheeks had gone strange-looking like they'd lost their bones a little bit or had gone a little flat. No, but you figured it out because it makes sense, doesn't it? And it would work, wouldn't it? Sure, but that's... She seemed to be searching the oxygrass for the words. That's just evil. I mean, so evil. I know. We have to get proof. And tell everyone, Melissa stood. Come on. Wait, no, this was it. We had one chance at this. We have to split up. That's stupid. She pointed at my arm with her chin. You need help. Not with what I'm going to do. What are you talking about? You need to get in. I'll tell you how. You've got to get another vial and test it. Here. Me? Why do I have to do that? She stuck her hand in her zip pocket and pulled out the pale green liquid. And why another one? We have this. Because it's the only one we have. And I might need it. I grabbed the vial with my good hand and rolled it carefully. You'll be able to get another in the main lab. But why me? You know your way around there. Melissa glared at me. You have to send a screenshot of what you find to your IM box. Then get to the Prime Administrator's broadcast room and send it out. The shot and the vids. My heart was trying to hammer out through my chest. Nick, answer me. Why do I have to do that? What are you going to do? Because they might still think it's just me. If I distract them, you might be able to move freely around Prime One. How are you going to distract them? I forced a smile. I don't know yet. That's stupid. You said that already. Because it is. But I don't think they'll expect it. We have to be smart. Melissa cocked her head at me. How are you going to distract them? I heard shouting around the corner of the house. They were going to find us soon. It doesn't matter. Let's go. I took off running back toward the maintenance shed. I saw a schematic. The broadcast room is on an upper level of Prime 1. I think the second floor. As we ran, 
I told her about the conveyor belt tunnels and how to find the lab level and the stairs. We rounded a house about a block away from the maintenance shed. I dug into my pocket. Here, I handed her the little green card. You take it. Open the door. Prop it open. What? I explained between puffs. Go. They'll know the door was opened. If we're quick, they'll think it's me. She must have understood. She took the card with a glance at my face. Stuffing it into one of her zip pockets, she reached up and pulled her hairpin out. Here, just in case. She pulled to a stop and handed it to me, then shocked me by kissing me on the cheek. Be safe. She took off running. As I started running again, her hairpin in my pants pocket, I watched the gap between us lengthen. Melissa and Bren. He would have been so pissed at me for bringing her into this. But she'd wanted to. I slowed a little. I needed to be the only thing the enforcers paid attention to when they saw me. I still held the vial in my left hand. I needed to hide it. In my cast? Shouts made me glance over my shoulder. Three enforcers were maybe 30 meters behind me. I'd been spotted. I zigged left just as I heard some explosions come from their direction. Something slammed past my ear, crushing the air around it. I kept swerving. I ran around a house and saw the maintenance shed's door closing. I dug deep, plowing forward through the exhaustion in my legs. They were beginning to feel wobbly again. Another bunch of explosions behind me reminded me to dodge to the side. Not fast enough. Something hot sliced along my neck. Pain flared on my left shoulder. Halt! I reached the shed, saw a small rock wedging it open. I passed my empty hand in front of the sensor and yanked the door open the rest of the way. Don't move! I kicked the rock and ducked toward the doorway as explosions tore the door out of my hands. The heavy metal door slammed painfully into my right shoulder and arm. I almost dropped the vial. Get down! The enforcers were meters away. I let the door close and leaned on it, dropping to my knees. I stuffed the vial into my sock and glanced at my papa. 0520. The early morning had grown a little brighter, although it was still kind of dim. Down! On the ground! I am on the ground. I looked around, forcing panic into my voice and face. It wasn't hard. Help! They're trying to kill me! My voice felt small, but people had to be waking up. Shut up! The harsh voice was a woman's. Get down! I yelled again. They're going to kill me! Someone! It's all a lie! The biggest enforcer lifted his keeper. I stared at his black face mask, wondering if he cared, if he knew the truth. I sucked in a breath. It's a lie! The knockout! Someone help me! An explosion next to my eye. White pain. Everything went dark. Chapter 27 Pale, hazy light stabbed through my eyes, right into my brain. A high-pitched whine from outside matched the ringing in my ears. I blinked, clearing my vision, and realized I was sitting, my arms cuffed in front of me, and my body restrained against the wall of a pod. A pod. I looked around. I was surrounded by enforcers. The vial in my sock dug painfully at my ankle. I hoped it wouldn't break. That would be a bugging, stupid way for this to end. Subjects awake! The voice felt like a knife through my ears. I let my eyes roam the interior of the pod, acting like I was more disoriented than I really felt. No Melissa. She'd made it. Either that or she was on a different pod. I had to believe they hadn't caught her. Let me go! I tried to shout it, but my mouth felt like somebody had stuffed a shirt into it. Don't you know what's going on? Shut up! The enforcer to my right growled, his voice muffled by his menacing mask. You don't know! I had to keep them thinking only about me. They had to think I was desperate. Okay, well, I was desperate. Keep the subject quiet! A woman's voice. It sounded like the same commander of the squad that had taken me from the rangers. The forest felt like so long ago. Or what? Why do I have to be quiet? The enforcer to my left leaned over me and slapped his hand against my mouth. I felt something adhere to my face and wrap around the back of my head. When he pulled his hand away, some kind of tape was left behind. I couldn't move my mouth. I struggled a bit, but it was pointless. Pointless and painful. It felt like metallic tape with a sharp edge. 
I glared at the enforcer, but he didn't seem to care. Then it struck me. My back didn't feel chewed up anymore. My shirt was down, but my back felt different. I shifted my torso and realized bandages were wrapped around me, and something had been put on my back to soothe the pain. I thought they were going to kill me. Despite the relief on my back, a sick feeling settled in me as I wondered what they were going to do. As I thought about it, I realized things must have changed again. They had something else they were going to do to me, something that included cleaning and bandaging my back. The rest of the ride consisted of me trying to move my right arm enough to scratch an itch that had started just inside my elbow. Up in the cockpit, I heard voices but couldn't make anything out. I'd just done this, but this time I didn't have the spoke or my zip. I couldn't figure out why they hadn't killed me. I'd made it clear that I wasn't going to make their announcement. There was no reason to keep me alive. I knew the answer before the question had fully formed in my head. They'd caught up to me at the beginning of the day. People had been waking up for sure. They couldn't take the chance of killing me in public. I was probably heading to where they would finish me off. It was sure nice of them to fix up my back before they wasted me. Before long, I felt the pod bank and descend fast, and I saw the walls of Prime One encircle us. Melissa needed to hurry up, and I was going to need to stall. The pod settled to the ground. Two heartbeats later, we shifted and bumped and began to drop again. This time I knew to expect the metal detectors. I wondered if Melissa's pin, now in my pocket, would be picked up by the sensors in the robot's arms. It looked plastic, so I told myself it should be fine. Another minute passed, and we stopped. The enforcer to my left punched a couple of wide buttons, and the straps holding me to the pod wall and bench retracted. He and the one to my right grabbed my arms and hauled me out of the pod, down the ramp, and to the door with two metal robot guards. The light came from the room at the top of the big elevator shaft, as well as a few strips of light set into the concrete of the shaft. One of the robots whirred forward, its arm extended. I stood still as I was scanned. No alarm beep sounded. The vial in my sock was safe. But when the sensor attachment retracted, something new happened. A disc with fine teeth folded out of the robot arm and began spinning. The two enforcers held me tight, the one on my right yanking my right arm out and forward. I tasted panic, felt sweat breaking out under my hair. Were they going to cut off my arm? I struggled to shout, but the metallic tape cut into my lips still. I fought to get away, not having to fake fear. Don't move, the enforcer on my left said, unless you want your arm shredded. I fought the fear back as well as I could, but I could still hear myself breathing noisily through my nose. The enforcer on my right gripped my arm tightly. The spinning blade came forward. I tensed, wondering how the robot saw where it was supposed to cut. The blade sank into the cast, the high wind dropping in tone a little. I flinched, but the enforcer held me firmly, probably saving me from getting a deep slash in my arm. The blade cut through the cast as if it weren't even there, opening a thin line the entire length of the cast in less than a minute. The terrifying blade stopped its spin and folded back into the robot's arm. The enforcer on the right grabbed the cast, levered the cut wider, and gave a couple strong yanks. The cast fell to the ground. The enforcer checked my arm, apparently thinking I'd hidden something in the cast. My arm felt like it could finally breathe freely. Dried sweat made it itch, and I couldn't keep from scratching. My arm hair was plastered to my skin. I needed a shower. Clear. This time, when the door slid open, two enforcers accompanied me down the hallway, through the first room, and through the cylinder, and into the prime administrator's office. They held tightly to my arms the entire way. The prime administrator sat in his chair, his short brown hair combed into the same part as the day before, wearing what looked like the same clothes. When we arrived, he looked up, his face blank. I wondered if the enforcers knew the truth about him, that he wasn't entirely human. He looked at the guards. Oh, please wait at the door. His voice still grated. Remove the gag. A hand covered the tape, and I felt the tape release. As the enforcer took his hand away, the tape went with it. Nick, 
Please, the Prime Administrator gestured for me to come forward. I stepped closer. You're not making this easy. Why would I? I stared at him. I needed to make this bigger somehow. I needed more time. I let my thoughts chase each other around as I formed a plan. You're lying to everybody. I know the truth now. The truth? The Prime Administrator smiled at me. It wasn't a happy smile. You think you know the truth, but you have no idea what you are talking about. I know you're controlling everybody. I know you're not real. I stepped closer. A laugh forced its way through his lips. Hmm. I am as real as you. His voice, his words, sounded less stiff than yesterday. He waved away the enforcers, who I guessed had followed me as I got closer to him. Leave us. He's harmless now. I shook away my confusion at how he sounded. Whatever he was, he was probably the only one who knew everything that was going on. I might be able to convince the enforcers to help me if they knew the truth. I glanced left and right. The enforcers moved silently out of the room and the door slid shut behind them. I wished they had stayed. Maybe I could have convinced them about the Prime Administrator's lies. At least I'm not lying to people, making them sick every fragging day. The Prime Administrator stared at me, but it wasn't an angry stare. It was almost sad. Long seconds passed before he responded. We do not make people sick every day. Yes, you do. The bug's not in the air anymore, or I'd be dead. And the Wanderers, too. The Wanderers are a m- are a myth, I know, but we both know they're not. My heart rate had to be hitting way over a hundred. What they are is proof that you're lying, that this whole thing is a lie. He settled back in his chair. His empty eyes were fixated on my face. The wanderers are a myth. Humans cannot survive without supervision anymore. Now that was a strange thing to say. The hairs on my neck felt like they'd suddenly been frozen. Like you, Nick, he moved forward a little in his chair. We let you and your friends play your games after school and one evening. And this is what happens. This? You mean my best friend dying? Basically murdered by you? He was not murdered. His death is the consequence of your irresponsibility. Your irresponsibility and complete lack of regard for the greater good. Are you kidding me? The chill I'd felt earlier had become something different, something hot in my gut. The greater fragging good? That's total spam! I took another step toward him, furious. I'm not the one who puts the bug in people every day. I'm not the one who says that the knockout saves us from dying of the bug when the knockout is the bug. I moved toward him again. Maybe three meters separated us. You say the bug's still around. That's only true because you're infecting us every time we get the knockout. That's enough. The prime administrator stood, his tall frame looming over his glass desk. I wondered if Melissa had made it to the dome yet. I glanced at the wall of screens to my right. Scenes of a normal, early New Frisco day flashed calmly on each one. I needed to stall. It's not enough. You won't deny it because it's true. You're not even human. You're a robot or something. Nick, you will calm yourself. I spun back. No, I won't. You're trying to control everyone, and it killed my best friend. I knew what I had to do. I launched myself across his desk, reaching for him. He stepped back and shouted. I grabbed for him, and he dodged. I slid across the desk, jackknifing my body to bring my legs around, and landed on my feet. I kicked out at the prime administrator, but he jumped away. Yells came from the enforcers as they came back in the room, but no explosions came from their keepers. I'd hoped they wouldn't shoot out of fear of hitting him. I pushed myself off the desk and lunged for the door. A powerful hand snagged my right shoulder, pulling me back. I felt myself yanked and slammed onto the hard floor. Restrain him! The enforcers each went to put a knee on one of my shoulders, but I threw my legs up willing the vial to stay in my sock and tried to kick them. I got one in the faceplate. He stumbled back with a grunt. I wriggled hard and got out from under the other enforcer. I rolled to my left. 
He's lying. You have to help me. I pushed myself to my feet. I'm not the bad guy. He is. The enforcer I'd kicked slammed into me, shoving me against the wall. I crumpled, my back throbbing. He grabbed my broken arm, yanking me to my feet. I yelped at the fresh agony. The other enforcer caught my left shoulder. They hauled me in front of the prime administrator's desk. I swallowed, breathing hard, fury still burning in my gut. The prime administrator brushed part of his desk. Send up Tech Scott with some knockout. I struggled a little, trying to keep the enforcer's attention on me. I glanced at the screens, wondering if Melissa had made it yet. Come on! She had to make it through two conveyor belt tunnels, across the dumps, and then into the lab. It could take her a while. Maybe I hadn't done the right thing by involving her. I carefully pulled my hand out of my left pocket. Looking for something? The prime administrator's voice cut through my thoughts, drawing my attention away from the screens. What he'd said before finally registered. Knockout? Some tech was coming with knockout? Just looking at all the people you infect every day, I glared at him. Nick, you are too young to understand. Why did he suddenly sound more natural again? From one moment to the next, the prime administrator looked more human. Wrong. I understand exactly what you're doing. I gathered myself. But you don't. And your friend Melissa doesn't either. My legs went weak. All the tension I'd been gathering completely dissipated. What? You're a smart boy, but you're a very bad liar. The prime administrator came out from behind his desk. He moved more smoothly now, too. We caught her as she entered the dumps. She will be here soon. No. First Bren, now Melissa. I couldn't stand. The enforcers let me fall, probably enjoying my misery. What exactly did you have in mind, boy? He crouched in front of me. What was she supposed to be doing? Nothing. It hurt to talk. Nothing. She doesn't know anything. Please, just let her go. His hand lifted my chin, forcing me to look him in the eyes. A very bad liar. But I am honest. You and she will suffer the very unfortunate consequences of not letting the system keep you calm. He smiled. Better calm than dead. He stood. Hold him. Tech Scott will be here shortly. I yanked the vial out of my sock and slipped it under my foot. Frag it. I rocked back hard and felt the vial crack under my shoe. At the same time, I used my teeth to pull the tiny needle Melissa had given me free from its cylinder. Hey! The voice came from above, but it was too late. I ducked under the reaching hands and twisted hard, dipping the needle into the puddle of knockout. I jabbed it into the calf of the enforcer on my right, moving as fast as I could. He cried out, and I felt four hands grab at me as I went for another dip. Stop him! The prime administrator. I needed to get to him. I swiped the needle through the puddle and twisted again, standing abruptly. The enforcer to my left stumbled back, a little off balance. The other enforcer was already crumpling. I forced my right arm to grab the enforcer's wrist. He kicked at me, trying to get hold of my other arm and spin me. I only needed one jab. I got him, right inside his wrist. Within a few seconds, he swayed and fell. I reached for another dip, scanning for the prime administrator. I saw a tall shape coming at me. He bowled me over before I could get at the tiny puddle, but I managed to keep my grip on the needle. I rolled clumsily, coming down painfully on my injured arm, but kept the presence of mind to reach out with my other hand. Coming out of my ugly roll, I switched hands and pointed the enforcer's keeper up at the prime administrator. Stop! He stopped glaring at me with a hard expression, but still empty eyes. My heart pounded. Supporting the keeper with one hand, I slipped the needle into my pocket and reviewed what I'd just done. Had the needle scratched me? It couldn't have. I stood, pulling the keeper all the way free from the unconscious enforcer. They had Melissa. I had to get her away. Chapter 28 the prime administrator stepped toward his desk. I pulled the trigger, splinters of pain slicing through my right arm. Rubber bullets slammed out of the gun, one creasing a red line across the prime administrator's cheek, the others pounding into walls. He yelped, 
his hand going to his face. Don't move. I'll find the real bullets. Eventually. What do you think you're going to do now? I think I'll just kill you and call it good. I glanced at the keeper. There had to be a way to select the ammunition used. The handle in my right hand fit comfortably in my palm, and my left hand naturally went under the long barrel. But between my hands was a fat cylinder where the different ammo types were stored. Maybe there. Nick, you don't have it in you. He tried stepping backward. I fired again, aiming lower. One of the rubber bullets hit him in the stomach. He jumped, snarling at me. One more time, boy, and you will wish the bug killed you. Take another step, and it won't be the bug that kills you. I will. But I couldn't. I had to take him hostage, use him to get Melissa. Kill me all you want. A strange smile crossed his face. We both turned at the sound of the door opening. A man, small and round, eyes suddenly going wide, stepped through the door. Tech Scott. Two things happened fast. The prime administrator leapt for his desk, and Tech Scott shouted, his hand smacking onto a spot just under the sensor next to the door. A loud alarm exploded through the room. I jumped after the prime administrator and slammed the keeper at his back. As he fell, I wrapped my left arm around his neck and pointed the keeper at his side. I couldn't lift it any higher with my right arm. Don't move! What the bug was I doing? No time to think about it. I mean, come in here! Tech, the prime administrator said. Just wait for the enforcers. He can do no harm to me. What was he talking about? I jabbed the keeper into him, making him wince. Tech Scott froze. I said come in here! He came in, a white plasteel case in one hand. That had to be the knockout he'd been coming to give me. I forced my thoughts to slow down. If Melissa was captured, they'd be bringing her in a pod. That meant that they would be coming down the pod elevator. The entire sequence opened up to me. Tech, don't listen to him. The prime administrator struggled, but I clamped tighter around his neck. I know you're not human, I reminded him in a harsh whisper, but I can still shoot you in the head. Then they'll know it too. I dragged the barrel of the keeper up his side, my arm screaming in pain. He stiffened for a moment, then stopped struggling. Let's go. I pointed with my chin at the door leading to the scanning cylinder. Where? The tech looked around wildly. No surprise there. It had to be strange to see the prime administrator taken hostage by a 15-year-old kid. Out to the pod elevator. The pod lift? Just go! He nodded and crossed the room, still gripping his white case as if it were armor against what was happening. I followed him, having trouble walking with any kind of grace while holding onto the neck of such a tall guy. I nearly stumbled going through the door from the reception room to the hallway, but was able to keep my feet. As Tech Scott approached the door to the lift area, I called out, Wait! He turned, his face dripping with sweat. I took a long look at the keeper's ammo cylinder. There was a knob I could reach with my thumb. Notches labeled 1 through 5 ran around the edge of the knob. Currently, the arrow on the ammo case pointed to 1. I thumbed it to 5. I hoped that was bullets. Okay, go partway through and tell them all to... Uh, to go to the right of the door, and don't let the door close. I pushed the prime administrator forward. The door opened for Tech Scott. He followed my instructions, and I heard shouts. But then he explained, and I saw two enforcers cross in front of the door. The robot, too! I pushed forward a few more steps. Finally, I saw the freaky robot that had cut off my cast whirr across the concrete floor. I'll kill him! Stay back! My right arm felt like it was going to fall off, but I made it lift the keeper a little more and quickly point up. This was going to hurt. I pulled the trigger, a thump and a painful push against my arm, followed by a narrow silver canister flying in an arc through the doorway. It hit the ground and exploded with a loud flash, smoke pouring out of it. Don't try anything! I thumbed the knob to four and muscled the prime administrator through the door, glancing quickly left to make sure nobody was still there. All clear. Then, I was facing four enforcers, two creepy robots, and a terrified tech. We all stood on the platform that remained when the lift was up and waiting to receive a pod. 
It was maybe eight meters wide and at least twenty meters long. I aimed above them, gritted my teeth, and fired again. Bullets splattered against the concrete walls. I swiveled the weapon so the barrel rested on the prime administrator's shoulder. He hissed as the hot barrel began to burn his shoulder. It felt good to get some pressure off my arm. I was glad the smoke wasn't spreading outward much, obscuring my line of sight, but was instead reaching up the shaft. If I looked up, I would have been able to see the main floor of Prime 1. Where's the pod? I yelled at everybody. Nobody answered. The pod with Melissa, the girl! We've warned it off, one of the enforcers said. My heart skipped. I clenched my jaw. Call it back or he dies. Then some of you do too. Nick, don't be stupid, the enforcer said. This doesn't have to happen this way. But it did. I'm dead if I stay here. I have nothing to lose. You're not dead. We just need to figure things out. The enforcer took a step toward me. Call it back. Do it! I jammed my knee into the back of the prime administrator's legs, forcing him to his knees. I will put a bullet in his head. It was hard to stare down someone with a black faceplate, but I tried. And get back now. Do it, the prime administrator said. Let's not allow anyone to get hurt here, enforcers. What a lying piece of spam. I almost pulled the trigger. It wouldn't be murder if he wasn't even human, right? The enforcer moved back. It was only a couple of seconds later that I heard the whine above my head. I fought back the urge to glance up. Don't move! I jabbed the barrel of the gun into the prime administrator's neck. Tell them to do what I say or I will shoot you. You know as well as I do that I have nothing to lose here. The prime administrator did exactly what I asked. Just cooperate. The safest thing is to let him leave. Tell the ones on the pod. I knew he wouldn't leave it at that. Once I was in the pod, he would send everything he had against me. I thought it through as the huge piston that was the lift slammed loudly and began to come lower. If I kept him with me, I might have a chance. In the final seconds before the lift platform arrived, I considered what had happened in the last day and a half. From gaming the speed damper on my cycle to holding the prime administrator hostage. My parents would be horrified, but if this didn't work, they'd never know any of it. The pod showed up, the door opening and a ramp extending. As the noise settled and stopped echoing off the shaft, I shouted, Melissa, show me her! I pushed the barrel into the man's neck again. Even with resting the gun on his shoulder, I felt like my arm was turning into a limp twig. My left arm felt locked in place around his neck, like it would never unbend. Nick? Melissa appeared in the doorway. Her eyes went wide. Everyone but her, off! Melissa, tell me when they're all off the pod. I pushed the prime administrator forward, dragging him into an awkward, crouching walk. Melissa stepped back and four enforcers tromped out of the pod. I felt their glares through their faceplates. That's all of them. Nobody moves. Nobody tries anything or his head's deer meat. We hit the ramp and I shoved him up toward the pod, my eyes never leaving the group of enforcers. Melissa gasped when she saw who I had with me. Nick, what are you doing? Getting us out. But you have the prime administrator. Yep. I tossed her a glance. You remember the simulators we used at school? I glared at the group of enforcers. I'm keeping him with me until we're safe. If you follow me, I will kill him. I bent close to the prime administrator's ear. Tell them. They'll examine your body and see the truth. A pause. Just let him go for now. We will catch him later. He's harmless. His voice infuriated me. I wanted to push him out of the pod a kilometer above the ground. They could inspect what was left of him. The ramp folded in on itself at the same moment the propulsion units fired up and the door flipped downward. In another few seconds, we were lifting off. Melissa took us out of Prime 1 fast, the propulsion units screaming. Nick! Melissa called back from the cockpit. What is wrong with you? That's the Prime Administrator! It worked, didn't it? I prodded him forward and made him sit on one of the benches that lined the pod. It took me a moment, but I found the button that activated the restraints and hit it with the keeper. 
I only lowered the weapon when the straps had finished stretching across his chest and lap and clicked into place in the bench and wall. Be good, I said, bumping the prime administrator's foot with mine. He didn't move, but stared at me. Have you thought this through, Nick? The man-thing's face stayed completely expressionless. Nope. That's probably why it's working. You're going to die. You don't have it in you to kill me. That's why you lose. That's why humanity was lost. I stood there, a sick twisting in my stomach. Everything. The knockout. The bug being in the air. Our helpful papas. It was a lie. From this man. Or thing. Why? Still no expression. You would clearly not understand. And he closed his mouth and simply stared at me, obviously done talking. As I watched him, something happened to his body. It seemed to relax a little, and the eyes lost their focus. What the fragging bug? Hey! No reaction. What are you? Still nothing. The sick twisting in my gut got worse. I headed forward. Hey, glad you can fly this. We need to figure out what's next. Yeah, Melissa said. Simulators are the best part of school. A moment of silence. And what's next is that we figure out how to not get killed. It'll be all right, I said. I prompt. Bug that. Of course it's not going to be all right. We just kidnapped the prime fragging administrator. Fine. The plan sucked. I checked our hostage. He was still restrained and somehow blank. I tossed the keeper onto the co-pilot's chair and leaned on her soft pilot's chair. I held my abused right arm against my stomach. Melissa was heading north, toward the edge of New Frisco. I lowered my voice. Can you go faster? I tried to imagine what the enforcers and admins would be doing right now. We had to get off their radar somehow, and fast. Sure. Melissa reached for the throttle in the console between the two pilot seats and pushed it forward. I felt our speed increase. I'm sorry my plan didn't work. I told you it was stupid. It might have worked if you hadn't gotten caught. Why did she always have to talk like that? I was trying. I couldn't exactly fight off a hundred enforcers who ambushed me the moment I opened the door to the dumps. A hundred? Probably. Well, maybe you should have tried staying out of sight better. Like you were doing a good job with that, Mr. Take the Prime Administrator hostage? This was stupid. We were passing over the edge of the city and we had no idea what to do next. Shut up. I pushed a smile on my face to show her I was joking. You're right, though. We need a better plan. How about stay the frag alive? Through the cockpit window, I could see that we were flying over trees and ancient roads. Have you ever been out this far? What? I repeated my question. She stopped and was quiet for a moment. Well, no, but that's got nothing to do with anything. I chewed on that for a moment or so. Actually, it does. Our lives are changed no matter what, and if we ever try to go back without changing New Frisco, or the new chapter really, we'll just be taken and killed. I stared out the window, then glanced back at the Prime Administrator. We had to get rid of him somewhere. I needed to search him, see if he had something that could be tracked. After another few seconds, Melissa said something that I couldn't make out over the noise of the pod. What? I leaned closer. You're right. We've got to do something. Something permanent. Let's figure it out together. I straightened. Be right back. Uh, keep going north. She nodded. I walked back to the prime administrator and patted him down as well as I could with one hand. His pockets were empty. As I straightened, his body seemed to come back to life. Nick, the prime administrator said. I'm not going to lie. You've made a lot of trouble for yourself and your friend. Shut up. I kept patting down his legs, scanning his shoes. I caught sight of a couple of keepers racked on the pod's wall. I stopped, picturing a way to make this all a lot less complicated. I looked back at the Prime Administrator. We should just shoot you, or throw you out of the pod. He gave no expression. It would do me no harm. There he went again. What's that supposed to mean? You will never find out. He stared at me with his empty eyes. I don't see you surviving this, Nick. I said, shut up. I checked his arms and realized I hadn't cuffed his hands. I dug around one of the lockers nearby and found some cuffs, slapping them around his wrists. I should give you the knockout, let you die of the bug. 
He didn't even look up at me. It would have no effect on me. There was a playful tone in his voice now. He was playing with me. Bug off. I turned away. We needed to figure out what to do. But if you don't want your family to suffer consequences, I can make you a deal now, Nick. My family. My mother and father probably still had no idea what was going on. All they had was that awful call the first night. I gave the man my hardest glare. They're already suffering because of you. You make them sick every day. They and everybody else have no choice about their lives. Be that as it may, you've taken this as far as you can. Let me go now, turn yourself in, and I'll make sure they're not hurt. It still surprised me that he refused to deny what I was saying. Totally unbelievable. You must know we cannot let you escape. Escape. I gave him another hard look. I said shut up. I headed back up front. This wasn't about escape anymore. This was about bringing down the new chapter. Chapter 29 After we had been flying north for a while, I asked Melissa to make a wide circle back over the city. While we flew, we talked and planned. First thing is that we need to tell everybody the truth. All of it. I remained standing so I could keep an eye on the Prime Administrator while we talked. Will they believe us? That's why we have to have proof. Do you think a screenshot will be enough? I don't know, I considered for a minute. I think between the video of me blocking the knockout and pushing my heart rate past 140 and not dying, with everybody knowing that Bren died of the bug, added to a screenshot of the makeup of the knockout might be enough. Yeah. What's he saying? She jabbed a finger toward the back of the pod. I mean, about the knockout and stuff. He doesn't deny it. The fury came burning back. I said it in his office, but the enforcers were gone. And he didn't deny it. So it's true, right? The bug's in the knockout. It has to be. It's the only thing that makes sense. So why aren't you dead? I haven't had the knockout in months, maybe a year. She was quiet for a moment. That's why you asked me if I'd had it recently. Because the bug can't stay in our system if our heart rate doesn't go high enough. I nodded. Yeah. Do you think people will believe us? I thought about that for a while. She was right. People might not believe us, no matter how much proof we showed them. A lot of people seemed happy to go about their controlled lives. It seemed like if we had food and a place to sleep safely, most of us didn't care about not having any choices. So would everybody just not care? I thought about Bren. He would have cared. Melissa cared. I was sure my parents would care, even though they were fine with life as it was. An image came to me of thousands of people lined up outside several admin stations, wrists held out for a refill of the knockout, allowing themselves to be tricked and herded and controlled, like the old sheep or cows. We're not animals. What? I said, we're not animals. It doesn't matter if they don't want to know, or even if they don't care. I felt like a hot coal in my core was flaring, almost breaking into flame. We don't need to be supervised. We should be able to choose our own life and not have to be given a disease that will control us. Nice speech, but we still don't have a plan. Shut up. You say that a lot. I wasn't sure where to go from there. I knew what I, what we, needed to do, but it was like my brain had frozen. I forced myself to start talking. Well, I think we need some help. I looked down. But I don't like the idea of getting anyone else involved. That hasn't stopped you yet. What was her problem? Hey, I told you I didn't think you should... Relax, I was kidding. She spared a glance my way. Besides, this is about everyone in New Frisco anyway. So everybody's involved. Kind of. But not everybody kidnapped the Prime Administrator. This is truth, Melissa said. But I've been talking to the other pushers since the park. They really wanted to know what was going on. I had no idea where she was going with this. And? And I think we should get them to help. I mean, we have to get real proof, send it out to New Frisco, all while not getting captured. She nodded in my direction. 
unless it's on purpose. You're funny. I know. I think you're right. I thought back to the main lab and the cold storage rooms the knockout was kept in. We'd been taught in school that the knockout had to be kept at a certain temperature, or it would go inert and soon become useless. We do need help because you missed something. I closed my eyes, trying to picture the steps that we would have to take. We have to destroy the knockout and the bug so they can't do it anymore. Melissa looked me in the eyes. She nodded. Good. Yeah. She made a face. Who is they, anyway? I don't know. Maybe just the Prime Administrator. We're going to have to find out. Yeah, but we don't have time for that right now. We might have to make time, Melissa said. It's not as if they'll want us to stop them. But we don't have any way of doing that. And the Prime Administrator is the boss anyway. You think he's the only one at the top? What if there's someone else? I just said we don't have the time to figure that out. We have to assume he's all there is. I flapped my hand toward the back of the pod. Besides, if there were anybody else, would they have let us get away like this? She thought for a moment. Okay, maybe you're right. My mouth dropped open and I stared at her. What? she asked. You just said I'm right. I just said maybe you're right. Ah. I turned and watched the forest zooming under the pod. Okay, so step number one is to get proof. Then we have to spread the word. That's two steps. Shut up. You shut up. She smiled in my direction. And three, we have to destroy the bug. All while not getting caught. Unless it's on purpose. She was never going to let that go. I cleared my throat. So we have to get in without anybody noticing. But since they'll be on guard and watching, are you sure? What do you mean? She gestured backward with her head. Maybe they'll just think we want to escape now. If we drop him off and then take off, maybe he'll think we want to get away. Good point. I scanned the terrain outside of the pod. Here, set it down and we'll let him go so he can't figure out what we're doing. As Melissa maneuvered the pod to the ground, I headed to the back. I stood in front of the Prime Administrator. We're going to let you go. You've come to your senses? Surprising. Ha ha. I felt the pod settle to the ground and punched the button that opened the door. Just leave us alone and we'll call it even. He smirked at me, which looked really strange since his eyes were as empty as ever. Your freedom will not last, Nick. Shut up. I grabbed a keeper from the weapon rack and pointed it at him. Your life won't last, Mr. Prime. You have already proven that you are unable to do what is necessary. He shook his head. I released the restraints and followed him with the gun as he stood. Every breath you take is proof of my cause. This last sentence was said much quieter. What the bug are you talking about? He walked down the ramp and stared up at me through the bright light of the early day. It doesn't matter. He turned and walked away. Goodbye, Nick. I wished I had it in me to just pull the trigger. If he was gone, things would be much easier. I tightened my grip, aiming at the back of his head. So much easier. I stood there for a second, then a few more. My right arm wobbled and jittered in exhaustion and pain. I lowered the gun. Bug-ridden fragger! Nick, what are you doing? I pushed the gun back into its brackets and joined Melissa up front as the door closed. Nothing. Let's go. Head straight east for a few kilometers until we're sure he can't see us. Then circle around and go south. I know what we need to do. Really? Her mouth turned up at one corner. Get taken prisoner again? I pictured the layout of Prime 1. We're going to have to get really lucky. And we need a way to communicate. I'm not sure earcoms are safe right now. We need the others. All the pushers? No, just Paul and Connor. They stuck around, and I know they'll help us. 
We I a few times before we realized the admins were probably watching us. And they told me you called last night. Okay, but how do we contact them without the admins finding out? You know Paul's a little inventor, right? Melissa banked right. We'd probably gone three or four kilometers away from where we'd let the prime administrator go. I remembered Paul fighting his brother, David, two nights ago. David had been scared, but Paul had been excited about what I'd done. Sure, he's got his own station in Dev 4. He found a way to convert the EARCOM's wireless transmission from light to a radio signal, then send it out on a higher frequency. He and Connor are at school, and they have one EARCOM that's rigged, and I have another, she blew a raspberry and grimaced. Or I do at home. I forgot it. That's amazing. Do you think he has any more? Paul had saved me last night. Could he do it again? He said he might have enough materials for a couple more. He was trying to make them for all the pushers. We have to get to him. A beat. Without getting caught. I rolled my eyes. Then I remembered the thick, black-trunked pine tree. I know how we can do that. I sent my thoughts back toward the prime administrator. He had to have something on him that would help the enforcers find him. A tracker or something. How long until he made it back to the city? Would he believe we were trying to get away now? Melissa's voice interrupted my thoughts. We have to assume they think we're coming back. Was she reading my mind? I think so too. We'll have to be careful. Have a real plan. I know, but... I think if we actually make a real distraction, or diversion, one that seems legitimate, we might be able to get back in. Okay, so something big? Really big. I thought hard. We needed equipment and supplies for this. Where will we do it? Melissa asked. I think we should blow up the engineering dome. Chapter 30 we flew south for a while, Melissa pushing the enforcer pod hard. There had to be some way to track the pods, even if it was just through radar. We needed to get completely off the new chapter's radar, like the Wanderers did. While Melissa guided the pod, I collected guns and other equipment, and finally called my parents on the earcom I'd picked up in Prime 1. I had to keep things as general as possible and even lie, in the hope that the frequencies were being recorded. Mom? Oh, bug me, Nick! I almost burst out laughing. I'd never heard her use language like that. Get Dad on? Nick, what's going on? Enforcers have been guarding the house all day, since really early. Mom should have been at the nursery. Had they not let her go to work today? I'll tell you, but I need to tell Dad, too. Can you get him on, and fast? As I shoved a couple of flexible restraints in my pocket, I noticed that the benches attached to the pod's walls looked like they were storage compartments. I lifted the seat of one of them, stopped for a second, and smiled. Perfect. The bench was full of enforcer uniforms. Nick, is that you? Dad sounded tense. Relief and fear and lots more washed through me as Mom and Dad talked over each other asking me questions and wondering if I was hurt. Mom said something about that horrible call the other night. I shook my head. I shouldn't have called them last time, but this time it might help. Mom, Dad, I'm sorry. I don't have time to explain much. Don't have time? Mom's voice went really high-pitched on that last word. What does that mean? Nick, just come home. This is crazy what they're saying. Dad's voice was still really tight. I'm sorry about what's happening. Last night, Brennan and I snuck out. I swallowed. We blocked the knockout, and he died. We know about Bren, Mom said. Please, just come home. We'll figure out what happened. I'm so sorry about Bren, Dad said. I know you two were close. Now his voice felt like a hug. I wished I could stay in that moment. It was my fault. Kind of. But I got in a lot of trouble. I held my breath. This was the only way to keep them safe. We'll figure it out, Dad said. Please come home. A sob broke through Mom's voice. I leaned on the bench of the pod, exhaustion making me want to collapse. 
I had to do this. If my plan worked, I might not make it, and they would have nobody else. But I couldn't drag them down with me. Melissa and I are running. We're just going to get away. We stole a pod, and we'll find somewhere to hide. I'm so sorry. Nick, you come home this instant! Mom's voice shook. You're not running anywhere! Please, son, Dad sighed. Just stay safe. Did he understand? Kate, Dad said. Nick knows what he's doing. But he's only fifteen! My mom was crying again. I felt like I was being stabbed right in the heart. I'll try to come back some day. I'm sorry. I did all this. It's my fault. If my plan worked, they would know the truth. They would eventually understand. They would. He's a man, Kate. He's making a choice. Dad was crying now, too. I wished I could reach through the earcoms and hug them both. We have to let him. Somehow my dad understood. Bruce, he's all we have left. We can't. Mom cut herself off. I have to go, I said. I love you. I turned the earcom off with a tap. A violent shudder tore through me. I yanked the earcom out and dropped it on the floor. Monitor this! I stomped it to tiny pieces. I wanted to tear the new chapter down, lie by stinking lie. I dressed myself in the enforcer uniform and then walked back to the cockpit. Melissa jumped and yelped, Fragging bug, Nick! You scared me! She looked me up and down. I thought you were an enforcer. I lifted the dark mask off my face, forced a smile, and hoped my eyes weren't too red. It's not even hot in here. I think the helmet has a built-in cooler. And the mask's wicked. I can tap it here. I dropped the mask over my face again and hit the button at the side of the helmet. And it goes low light, night, and even heat vision. I wonder if it does x-ray. You're ridiculous, she scowled at me. But that's great. That'll help a lot. I pulled the helmet off and peered out the cockpit window. Okay, we've got to be far enough south of New Frisco. These are the trees and hills. Find a road. We both leaned forward while Melissa guided the pod lower, slowing us down somewhat. There! We had just floated over a hill when Melissa pointed. Is that it? We moved closer and I got a good look. I checked north and south, trying to figure out where it ran among the hills and trees. I think so. Uh, Go south. Follow it. After a couple more minutes, I knew we were on the right track. I had seen those riding cars before. Okay, slower. I plopped into the co-pilot seat. What is that? What? I followed her pointing finger. I'd noticed the dark cloud, but had thought maybe it was going to rain. But rain almost never came from the east. Is that smoke? Looks like it. A wide swath of smoke, the color of a dirty road, spread across the sky. Some wispy columns of darker smoke drifted up from the middle of the forest. Something burned deep inside me. This wasn't left over from when the rangers had caught me. Find a place to land, I said. A clearing or something. Fast! What is it? What's going on? I don't know, but it's not good. A sick feeling settled in me. She found a clearing maybe a quarter kilometer from where the small columns of smoke still floated upward. As soon as I felt the bump of the struts hitting the ground, I opened the door and jumped out. A sour, heavy stench filled my nose. Was that the smell of trees burning? It smelled like the fire the wanderers had used, but stronger, thicker. Nick, what's going on? The wanderers. It has to be them. But why would they have such big fires? I took off, worried that I already knew what I would find, but hoping I was wrong. I heard Melissa break into a run behind me. As we ran, we found trees that were blackened and scarred, and quite a few trees that lay on the ground, still putting out smoke. Along the way, I came across some packs, and saw other signs of the wanderers. Some of the packs were nearly unrecognizable, totally destroyed by fire. One or two of them still smoldered. Why would the wanderers drop their packs? We found one of the rectangular packets that was one of their tents. 
Coughing sometimes against the slight haze and the ashes we kicked up, we kept moving. We found the first body within a hundred meters. She wore the colors of the forest, her hair curly and black. She was on her face, her back a torn mess. I stumbled and almost fell over another body I hadn't seen, hidden behind some brush. I dropped my left hand to steady myself and brushed this body accidentally. I stood, breath catching, my stomach squeezing up through my chest and scrubbed my hand against my pants. Melissa shouted something, then coughed. I spun, not a bug cough. I threw up too, strangely thinking to make sure I didn't throw up on one of the bodies. Nick! Melissa's voice was a whisper, hoarse and torn. What is this? Wanderers. Sometime later, we found ourselves walking in silence, pointing with our eyes and heads at each body we found. I realized Melissa was squeezing my left hand hard, as if she was trying not to fall. I squeezed back. My legs felt detached, like they were moving without my control. Dolfo. His nearly white hair looked dull against the leaves and dirt of the forest floor. I forced myself not to look at his blackened chest. His eyes were open, but he was long gone. I thought of his raspy voice. He'd been a spammer to me, but this was wrong. Nick? What happened here? I squeezed my eyes closed, trying to find a way to push the images of all of these people out of my head. I'd recognized a few more faces, especially the girl who told me I was eating deer meat. This was wrong. So wrong. The rangers, I said, or enforcers. Maybe both. Killed them? The enforcers? Why would they do that? I stared at her, willing her to figure out the answer so I wouldn't have to say it. She looked at me for a long moment, then dropped her gaze. Oh, yeah. You knew them? Kind of. I hadn't seen Wendy yet. Maybe she'd escaped. They gave me food. Drugged me, too. This is bad. Yeah. I wondered if Gabe was around. I could still hear his soft voice in my head. We need to check for survivors. Nick, Melissa backed away, reaching for a nearby scarred tree. Her eyes were wide. I, this, uh, I don't know if I can. It's okay. I'll do it. I turned away. Wait, she can't? If you don't want to go back, no, that's not it. I'll help bring them down. She gestured around us, obviously fighting to not look down. But this, I can't. Oh, yeah. It's okay. It's not. I turned again, taking a deep breath and holding it for a moment. Was this my fault? As I searched, finding Stan and Matt not far from Dolfo, I knew it wasn't. The rangers were always trying to find the wanderers. That's what the wanderers had said. Not just find them, though. The Wanderers couldn't be put in the new chapter. They knew the truth. This had to be what Rangers did when they found any Wanderers. Wendy was the last one I found. She was curled over a medium-sized gray rock. I hurried to her and put my good hand on her shoulder. She was cold and didn't move. Bug it. I felt like throwing up again and fought it down. Wendy had been nice. She'd left me medicine, even if it had included a tracker for the rangers to find me. She'd helped my arm feel better. I put my right hand on her still shoulder next to my left. I swore. This was too much. Too much! I was so tired, so sick of running. Suddenly, I couldn't catch my breath. I felt like something was squeezing my chest. My body shook, shivered. This had to stop! They didn't have to kill everyone. Anger burned in me. I felt the tears streaming down my face and only slightly registered Melissa approaching and crouching next to me. I wanted to break something, break the trees, split the ground open, and swallow the whole fragging new chapter up. I tried to choke back the tears and couldn't. The whole thing, break the whole world. Melissa pulled me close to her. 
I wanted to hold it back, didn't want to put this on her. But she was there, and I was burning and dissolving with grief and pain and fear and fury. I don't know how long she held me like that. When I realized that I was putting nearly all of my weight on her and could feel her soaked sleeve under my cheek, I pulled back, embarrassed. It's okay. Her whisper felt like a soft touch. Sorry. It's okay. I cleared my throat, trying to ease the pain and tightness. I felt different. Now that it was gone, I realized I'd been holding a knot of something, or damming it up inside. In its place, I looked around at all the still forms of the wanderers. In its place had settled something else, something cold and hot. How was that possible? Are you okay? I forced what had to be an ugly smile onto my face. Nope, but I will be. What do we do with them? I stopped and thought about that. In New Frisco, when people died, they were cremated, their ashes buried in organic boxes in Memorial Park. We couldn't burn everyone here. How did the people before the infection do it? I had no idea. Nothing, I guess. I mean, what could we do? I turned Wendy gently toward me, wanting to see her face. She rolled slowly my way and I scrabbled backward. She dropped off the rock and rolled over. Except it wasn't a rock. It was a little girl. And the girl was alive. Chapter 31 The little girl moaned. Her entire back was covered in blood. But when I looked at Wendy, I wondered if any of the blood was the little girl's. Wendy had saved the little girl, covering her with her own body. Rage. That was the word for this cold and hot feeling inside me. I let it settle deep, enjoying the hot taste in my mouth. The little girl couldn't have been much older than five or six, with long but tightly curled black hair and skin the color of tree bark. She'd been wearing a gray hood which had fallen away when I'd moved Wendy. Melissa made it to the girl before I could, kneeling next to her and reaching for her shoulder and face. Hey, it's okay. The girl's eyes flickered a little, then opened. Are you hurt? Melissa gently passed her hands over the little girl's blood-soaked shirt, then her arms and legs. The little girl moaned and squirmed, pushing Melissa's hands away, her eyes opening suddenly and darting all over the place. Hey, I said. I took a half-step closer, unsure of what I could do. It's okay. Melissa tossed a glance at me. I didn't know what she wanted from me. We're not going to hurt you. It's okay. She held the girl's arm with both of her hands, then helped her sit up. The little girl's eyes were a brilliant green, so bright they almost glowed in the late morning light filtering through the trees and leaves. She blinked a couple of times and looked around the forest. What? Her voice was high but rough. She yanked her arm out of Melissa's hand. We're not going to hurt you, I promise, Melissa said, reaching for her again. We want to help. She looked up at me again. I nodded. We just want to help. The girl looked up at me. You're back. My heart skipped a beat at her direct tone and expression. I dropped to a crouch. Yeah, I guess you remember me? I thought I remembered her big shock of black hair above bright green eyes. You came to camp. The girl looked around the forest again. Her eyes widened when she saw Wendy. They're all dead? I tried to answer, but my voice got caught on something in my throat. I felt like the world was cracking apart, watching her realize what had happened, watching her face crumple. Melissa pulled the girl into a tight hug. They're all dead? The girl repeated. I'm so sorry, Melissa said, tears streaming down her face. They stayed that way long enough for me to have to sit. The little girl cried for a while, her heartbreaking sobs muffled by Melissa's zip. 
I found myself wondering what kind of person could just murder a bunch of people like this, wondering what the rangers were told that made them feel like it was okay. If they heard this little girl crying, would they feel bad? I let the anger and grief that her sobs were causing in me build the rage deep inside me. I was going to use that rage soon. We're going to help you, Melissa said. What's your name? Devera. She scrubbed her face on the sleeves of her pullover. That's a pretty name, Melissa said, helping Devera to her feet. My mom's the midwife, Devera said. I wondered why. Devera saw the confusion on our faces. Devera was the goddess of midwives. What's a midwife? I asked. Devera laughed, surprise shining from her face. You're dumb! Everybody knows that! I wasn't dumb. I traded glances with Melissa. She didn't know either. No, not everybody. We're from the city. Devera gasped and stepped back, obviously afraid. No, it's okay, Melissa said. We're not like the enforcers. Or the rangers, I said. They don't like us either. Devera didn't move, but the fear left her posture. Okay. Her eyes searched the area, probably looking for her family. But what are you doing here? Trying to end all of this, I said. Figuring out how to stop them, Melissa said. Who? What? I asked. Stop who? Devera's eyes settled on something, and her face, her wide cheekbones and round chin, seemed to deflate. She started slowly, but was running after a few steps. I ran after her. Stop the city! The enforcers and rangers! I had to raise my voice as I tried to keep up with her. Stop her, Nick! Melissa had reacted slower, but she guessed what Devera had seen. Devera was way too fast for me. By the time I got to her, she was kneeling next to a dark-skinned woman who lay crumpled against a still-smoking tree. The woman's body was so covered in burn marks and blood that I had to force myself to keep looking. I grabbed Devera, who was screaming, Mom! over and over again. Devera, come on, let's go, come on, I said, trying to drag her away. Melissa had to help me. When we got her about a meter away from her mother's body, it was like a cable had broken, and Devera collapsed against Melissa again. I had to force myself to tune the little girl's cries out. I felt like they were cutting me in half, then in half again. I found myself crying too. Embarrassed, I stepped around a tree and had to lean on it, gasping to catch my breath. When was this going to end? I got control of myself and helped Melissa guide Devera away from the body of her mother. The sights around me felt like fuel that I could use to add to the fire in my gut. This couldn't go on. I wanted to do something for them. It didn't seem right to just leave all the bodies here untouched on the forest floor. I wondered what the wanderers did when somebody died. I glanced down at Devera, whose sobs had subsided and was mostly sniffling now, as we kept walking toward the pod. I could ask her, but that might make it worse for her. She seemed so little. Her head didn't even come up to my elbow. She was so young but she was going to have to spend the rest of her life without her family, knowing who killed them. Melissa and I exchanged a look above Devera's head. I indicated the area around us with my head and mouthed, What do we do? She shrugged and shook her head. We had to leave them. There was nothing else we could do. A few minutes later, we came to the pod. Melissa had to reassure Devera that we weren't enforcers, that we had stolen the pod. My uniform didn't help. I told Melissa my plan. We ditch the pod and take my side jet back to town, staying off the grid. We get Paul and Connor, see if they want to help, and find a way back into Prime 1. Probably we use these uniforms. Paul's too small. You, Connor, and me could probably get away with that. Okay, fine. We'll figure that out. What about Devera? Melissa gave the girl a squeeze. Devera was clinging to Melissa as if she wouldn't ever let go. Melissa and I spoke at the same time. We have to take her. We'll find somewhere safe, I said. 
And when we're back into Prime 1? I stepped up the ramp into the enforcer pod. We'll split up. One person does the analysis of the knockout, gets proof of what it really is, then sends it to your IM box. Another person sends that and the video clips out to the whole city. Do you know how to use broadcasting equipment? No, but it can't be that hard. Maybe Paul can do it. Melissa guided Devera to a bench. It's okay. Just strap in. You're safe now. She turned to me. He probably can. Then we destroy the knockout, right? Yes. I'm not sure how, but we'll find a way. We have to destroy it without getting anyone infected. Of course. I closed the ramp. And we do all this without getting caught. Yeah. What are the guards like in there? Just enforcers, although there are some robots too. Creepy ones. I described the machines that rolled on nearly silent treads and had attachments that unfolded from their arms. We should find a way to cut off Prime 1 from the outside. You know, so they can't call for backup. Melissa made her way to the pilot's chair. Great idea. Maybe we can bring Prime 1's power grid down. That might even get rid of the robots. Maybe. In a few moments, we were in the air. Where's the side jet? I guided her, leaning on her seat and glancing back toward Devera now and again. What were we going to do with the little girl? We had to keep her safe. We had to succeed and get out alive so we could take Devera somewhere she could be safe from the new chapter. Maybe we could find other wanderers. I checked the time on my papa. It was nearly twelve. No wonder I was hungry. I hadn't eaten since sometime the day before, even before being locked in that room. I could hardly believe I'd escaped Prime One twice in one morning. I looked through the glass on the pod's cockpit and found the road and the stream. The tree had to be somewhere near. It took another half hour to find the tree, and we had to go back and forth a few times, but I finally spotted the dark fir tree. As Melissa landed the pod, I headed into the back. Devera, I'm Nick. She's Melissa. We are so sorry. You didn't do it. The clarity of her voice set me back on my heels a little. What? It wasn't you that killed my mom. The rangers did it. Her green eyes flashed. I want to kill them. I felt like I should tell her she shouldn't talk that way. But that was stupid. I wanted to kill them too. All of them, Devera looked down. Hearing those words from a kid who couldn't be older than seven was disturbing. But the blame wasn't Devera's. How old are you? Eight, almost nine. So I was wrong. How was I supposed to know how old little kids were? The pod settled to the ground. Devera unstrapped and stood. Where are we going? We're going to go back and try to end all this, but we need to find a way to keep you safe. I want to help! I stared at her, trying to imagine what an almost nine-year-old could do to help us. Probably not a lot. But she deserved a chance to get back at the people who had killed her family. She should be allowed to get justice. I don't know. We'll try to find something you can do. But you're... well... A kid! But I'm fast, and I always want our wrestling matches. She stood straight, her green eyes challenging me. Her chin moved up slightly, as if she were going to poke me with it. I can help! I knew it was bad of me, but I couldn't deny her the chance. We'll find something. I promise. Don't break promises. I won't. Melissa joined us. Did I hear you say Devera was going to help us? I bit my tongue and stared hard at Melissa. She had to understand. I am going to help, he said. Hey, I know you want to, Melissa said, but we can't put you in a dangerous situation. I already was in one, Devera glanced at Melissa. They killed my family. Did they kill yours too? Melissa opened her mouth, maybe to argue, but nothing came out. I was impressed. Devera was pretty convincing. But you're a little girl, Melissa finally said. I'm almost nine, Devera kept glaring. I'm almost the same as you. Melissa's face darkened. No, you're not. I'm almost sixteen. 
That's a big difference. It's only seven years. That's really small. Devera's nostrils flared, her face flushing. That's practically your entire life. I don't care. They killed everyone, and I'm going to kill them. She stared at Melissa, tears running down her face. I had no idea what to say or do. Melissa had no response either. Long seconds passed. Melissa finally ended the moment by going to Devera. Okay, you're right. She wrapped the girl in a hug and pulled her close. I thought Devera would resist, but she squeezed Melissa back, scrubbing her face on Melissa's zip. They stayed that way for long enough that I began grabbing things out of lockers and off shelves. When I saw movement, I turned. Melissa, is there a way to make this thing fly itself? You mean autopilot? She dug through a locker, looking for a uniform that would fit. Yeah, but I mean without us in it? Of course. When we're ready, we'll just send it in some direction. Try to throw anybody who's tracking it off our trail. She had to show me she'd thought of it too. Whatever. I thought of it first. You should get on a uniform too, I said. They should help us get to Connor and Paul. We need weapons too, and enforcer earcoms would be good. Yeah, we can listen to what the enforcers are saying. I watched as Melissa pulled a uniform out of the locker. You should change. I carried three keepers and a belt out of the pod, headed for the dark tree, picturing the exact spot where I'd left the side jet. I flexed my right arm, finding I had more movement in it than I expected. It would still hurt to use the side jet, but that wasn't a problem. I started it up. It felt a little rough under me, like it wasn't flying as smoothly as it had before. By the time I got back to the pod, happy to be back on my side jet, Melissa had come out and Devera was helping her put things on a thick, heavy belt. A helmet sat on the ground next to her feet. Both of them turned at the soft whine of the side jet. I think it's running out of power. I'm not sure it'll get us back. I dismounted and the machine settled onto its pneumatic feet. Trade power cells with the pod, Melissa said, examining the side jet. It took another 30 minutes or so to trade out the side jet's power cells with a couple from the pod. During that time, Devera unearthed a cache of rations from a locker in the pod, and Melissa found earcoms in a small locker. We stopped to eat, my stomach rumbling well into our meal. Throwing the wrappers into a mini incinerator built into the pod, Melissa plopped into the pilot's chair. Devera and I waited outside while Melissa set up the autopilot. She came running out of the pod as the ramp closed, jumping a few feet to the ground. The pod lifted off to about 20 meters and headed toward the forest, picking up speed. I set it to go southeast. It should just keep going until it runs out of power. Melissa fastened a too big helmet onto Devera. The pod had reached cruising speed and was already at least a kilometer away and getting smaller. What happens when the power's out? It'll probably crash. Maybe it'll hit a squad of enforcers. I glanced after the pod. Melissa snorted. Huh, not likely. It was going to be a tight fit, but if Devera rode just in front of me, with Melissa behind me, we should be able to make it. The side jet probably wouldn't be as fast, but that would be fine. I got on the side jet first and helped Devera up. Melissa slung four keepers over her shoulders then climbed on, her hands went to my shoulders to help her stay on. I leaned forward, a little too much, and we started out fast. Melissa's arms wrapped around my stomach. Slow down! Relax, I said. Devera felt small and delicate in front of me. She was leaning forward, hugging the center console of the side jet. You okay? I asked. She didn't answer. Devera, everything okay? I kept my eyes on the ground before us, guiding the machine toward the road. Go faster! I glanced at her. I could just barely make out the side of her face. Her eyes were wide, cheeks stretched in a smile. I put on more speed. Melissa's grip tightened. It was not a bad sensation. Soon we were on the road, headed back toward New Frisco, back to where this had started, and where we were going to end it. They help women have babies, Devera said. 
I had no idea what she was talking about. What? Midwives. Her voice was breathy, full of energy. They help women have babies. She had to shout to be heard over the wind and whine of the engine. I'd completely forgotten. I burst into laughter and poured on the speed. Chapter 32 We have to avoid the cameras! Melissa's voice slammed into my ear. Apparently, she thought she had to yell, even though her mouth was right next to my ear. Granted, it felt like we were cutting through a tumbling, powerful river of wind as we shot down the ancient road, sometimes dodging distorted piles of metal that used to be cars. I shook my head to get rid of the ringing her shout had caused, then yelled back out of the corner of my mouth, I know! We'll have to ditch this thing outside the city! We'd been speeding back toward New Frisco for about thirty minutes, and would have to leave the side jet soon. The trip was much faster in the light of day. Amazingly, the side jet didn't seem to have any trouble carrying so much weight. We crested a hill and found that we were within a kilometer of the city. I leaned back to slow us down, having to push Melissa backwards a little as I did so. We need a place to hide this, I said. We left the roadway and kept our eyes peeled for a grove of trees or some tall bushes. Devera saw a group of ten or so trees and pointed it out. I angled the side jet there, and when we had stopped, I helped Devera down. Melissa slid off too, taking her pleasant warmth and weight away. I missed it immediately. I shook that thought away. Not a good time. Melissa and I tightened our enforcer uniforms, strapped on the heavy utility and ammunition belts, and put our helmets on. Devera watched. When we were ready, Devera nodded. You look mean. I inspected Melissa. She did the same for me. You look right, she said. How am I? Fine. We just need to avoid talking, and no talking through ear comms. Just monitor what's being talked about. Right. She slung two keepers over her shoulder. I took the other two and did the same. What about me? Devera fingered her wanderer clothing, the rough, earthy-colored cloth. Do I look good? I wanted to kick myself. She would look completely out of place. We need to find her some clothes, Melissa said. I mentally mapped out the moves we would need to make and checked my papa. It's 1330 now. Let's split up. We'll leave Devera here, and you go find her some clothes. I'll get Connor and Paul. Then we can meet somewhere near Prime One, maybe at 1430? Do you think it's safe to leave her here? Melissa put a protective hand around Devera's shoulders. I don't want to stay here, Devera said at almost the same time. I crouched, so I was looking into Devera's eyes. It's our only choice. If anyone sees you, they'll know you don't belong here. You'll be caught. We can't let that happen. But to leave her alone? Maybe one of us should stay with her. Melissa crouched, too. No, I pointed at my papa. We have to time this right. By the time you get her some clothes and get her into the city, school will be over, so she won't look out of place walking around while everyone else is in class. You'll have to act like you're not together, but she can act like she's going to a work assignment or something. So can Connor and Paul. Nobody will question us. At least they shouldn't. After a moment of thought, Melissa nodded. Okay, that all makes sense, but how are you going to get to Connor and Paul? I don't know. I don't think I should go to their classes. People would notice something so unusual. I think I need to find them right after their classes. And Paul will need to go home to get his ear comms. What if you I am them? I chewed on that. That might work, but don't you think the admins have to be watching all of the pushers still? Wouldn't they be monitoring IM boxes for messages? Yeah. It was strange to be talking to Melissa without being able to see her face through the opaque mask on her helmet. I could see through my mask just fine, though. I think I should just wait for them outside the school dome. They'll go home, and they both live in green res, so they should come out the same door. We were wasting time. I stood up and shook the circulation back into my legs. I'll get it done. Where should we meet? Melissa straightened, too. 
Let's meet at Holland Park, you know, between engineering and school. That's pretty close to Prime 1. Okay, near the scarf store. She flipped her mask up. It's weird talking through these things. Yeah, but we have to be careful. Let's get moving. I felt a little jittery with nerves, but did my best to force that away with a slow breath. See you in an hour, I turned. Nick! Melissa grabbed my arm. She lifted my visor. Her face was really close. My heart thumped a few times and I swallowed hard. She stared into my eyes. Be careful, please. It's going to be okay, I said. Don't say that. She squeezed me tighter. You don't know that. Just be careful. I'll do my best. She pushed my visor down and let me go. I heard her talking to Devera as I walked quickly over the top of the hill and down the slope. I needed to find the right place to enter the city. It would seem strange if an admin somewhere saw an enforcer walking into the city from the outside. One of the parks. I was too far from Hope Park, but I could probably get to Brown Park, the one between Orange and Purple Res. People would be there, and the cameras should be focused on them. And if people in the park saw me come from the outside, they wouldn't question me. I was an enforcer. I walked faster. I didn't have a lot of time if I wanted to catch Paul and Connor right after school finished. As I moved, it occurred to me that three days ago, even two days ago, I'd been sitting in class with no clue how my world was about to change. The kids in school, even now, had no idea how much their world was about to change either. As I neared Brown Park, I slowed, keeping trees and terrain between me and the park itself. I heard a few voices, mostly of younger kids, who weren't in the nursery anymore, but who didn't have to go to school all day, and some parents. That reminded me. I pulled off my left glove and felt around the outside of the helmet for a way to activate the enforcer earcom. My fingers found a button. I pushed it. My visor suffused with a red glow. Then it clarified again, with all kinds of things superimposed over the terrain I saw. As I turned my head, information appeared about elevation, distance to different things like trees and stuff, and a flashing status update about a keeper appeared. It said, inactive. I pulled one of the keepers around and grabbed the handle. The flashing word changed. Active. Select projectile and target. Cool mask. I let the keeper fall and searched some more for how to activate the earcom. Nothing. Making sure nobody could see me, I hunkered down and took the helmet off, noticing it had a number on the back. 1984. It took me a minute, but I finally noticed that the chin strap was more than just a piece of cloth. It looked like... I put the helmet back on, then fastened the chin strap. The moment it buckled, the earcom came alive. Hearing some chatter about extra guards being assigned to Prime 1, I stood as tall as I could, stuck my chest out, and walked quickly around some trees and into Brown Park. I was halfway across the park when the voice came over the earcom. 1984, code and assignment. This voice was clearer than the other voices I'd been hearing. It was a man's voice, slightly distorted. I ignored it and kept walking. The voice came again. 1984, respond with code and assignment. Who was this guy talking to? Wait, 1984, 1984. Bug me, of course. The number on the helmet. The voice was talking to me, thinking I was an actual enforcer with that number. It wanted me to report in. I unstrapped the helmet as fast as I could, hopefully deactivating whatever tracker I'd activated when I'd turned on the earcom. I should have known they tracked enforcers. A random enforcer showing up at the edge of Brown Park must have looked odd. They must have to report in whenever they turned on their earcoms or whenever they began an assignment. I hoped they would just think it was some kind of random blip or bug and walked faster mentally kicking myself, wishing I had a way to tell Melissa not to activate her helmet. Hopefully she would figure it out quickly enough to not cause a problem. By the time I'd circled between the engineering dome and purple res, I felt a lot calmer. No enforcers had converged on me. Nobody even looked at me. 
But every time I saw a person through the visor, a targeting circle followed that person until they were out of sight, and I was fed information about distance to the target. Both cool and scary. For a moment, I wondered if the helmet helped an enforcer aim his keeper, but that didn't make any sense, since I'd been shot at plenty and had only been hit a couple of times. If the robot shoot at me, I thought, that might be a different story. It was a little strange walking as tall and big as I could down the streets and walks of New Frisco, the early afternoon shoppers and young families all around me. I wondered how many of them knew about Bren, knew about me, or at least knew what the admins were saying about me. As I rounded the engineering dome, I entered the small shopping district on the edge of the park between engineering and school. The place was basically a few small buildings with counters open to the front so shoppers could walk through and pick up whatever they wanted. There were also speaker screens set up at regular intervals along the walkway, their frames shining silver in the afternoon sun. Most of the time when you were shopping, you just tuned out the announcement and news that the speakers droned on about, but today every screen was broadcasting the same clip and several people were clustered around each screen. As I passed by the screens, I caught what they were saying, which was obviously on a loop. A woman started the report. Tragedy struck two nights ago when young Bren Radcliffe died, a victim of the still-lethal bug. Reports say that Mr. Radcliffe found a way to avoid the knockout and was practicing a dangerous activity with some friends of his. One of those friends has been identified as Nick Granger, who has not been seen since the tragedy. He is currently wanted for questioning about this horrible event. Mr. Granger is in serious danger, as it is suspected he has also found a way to avoid the knockout. It may be only a matter of time before he dies of infection as well. A man picked up the story. One official has indicated that Mr. Granger might be the leader of a group of young people, all of whom put themselves in danger of death by the bug regularly. If you see Mr. Granger, help him and the people of the new chapter by reporting his location immediately via EARCOM, IM box, or directly to any admin or enforcer. Remember, better safe than sorry, better calm than dead. Dread felt like a piece of ice sliding into my stomach. I swallowed a sudden sour taste. Lies! All of it sounded so good! So real, but it was a lie from the start. The bug might have killed Bren, but it was only a tool, like the keeper I still carried. I could have been killed by a bullet yesterday, but it would have been a ranger killing me, not the bullet. The bug was a bullet fired every day at every person in New Frisco by the prime administrator. I made it through the small market area, passing among the people buying toys and games and clothing accessories, kind of in a haze. I shook the weird feeling away and focused again as I approached the school dome. I needed to get to the south entrance. I checked my papa, which was more of a wrist-mounted clock now. I had maybe three minutes. Lengthening my stride, I kept my eyes and ears open. I needed to look like I was busy. If anyone talked to me, I'd be found out right away. The clean white wall of the school dome, practically glowing in the bright sun, curved ahead of me and to my left. In my visor, the wall even had a bit of a heat signature. I saw kids leaving the school, maybe a hundred meters away. I walked faster, worried I might catch someone's eye. I rounded the sidewalk corner and arrived at the edge of the stream of kids. Kids. I was still one of them, wasn't I? Glancing down, I saw my arms and chest, covered in enforcer uniform. Nope, I guessed not. I watched my former peers as they made their way out of the dome. I would never do school again. That was crazy. Bren's sister, Jan, walked out, surrounded by other girls a year younger than me. Seeing Jan's sad, drawn face, her blue eyes red-rimmed and black hair kind of messy, felt like a punch to the stomach. She had to be so confused about what had happened. I thought back to the call I'd made to her that first night, wondering if I'd done the right thing. Did she blame me for Bren's death? How could she not? Her world had completely changed with my call two nights ago. And it was because of me. 
Maybe by the end of today she would understand. That was my best bet. Maybe then I would have the guts to talk to her again. If everything worked out, she would know by the end of the day who was really responsible for her brother's death. I watched Jan pass, wishing I could talk to her right now without getting noticed. There was no way. I went back to scanning the crowd, hoping I would recognize Paul or Connor from behind, if they had already come out. I tried to picture where in the dome their classes would be. With luck, they would have come out by now. Yes, there was Connor. He caught sight of me and looked away fast. I debated how to catch his attention. I didn't want to grab him and cause a stir. I had to be an enforcer. Nobody questioned enforcers. I stepped into the stream of kids, some of them taller than I would be if I weren't wearing big enforcer boots and the helmet. Moving quickly, I caught up to Connor and walked beside him. He tossed a nervous glance up at me and looked down, obviously hoping I was just on patrol. I toyed with the idea of playing a joke on him and acting like I was on official business. Bad idea. Connor. He looked up. The helmet and visor distorted my voice so he couldn't know who I was. Connor, it's me. I scanned the people close by. Nobody was watching. In fact, everyone was obviously doing their best to not look at me. What? I returned to Connor. Doc, it's me, Nick. Holy bu- He caught himself and glanced around. When he spoke again, he whispered, but I had no trouble hearing him. The helmet. Nick, what the bug? Hey, don't look at me. We're just walking near each other. Okay. He looked pointedly down. What are you doing here? We're here to finish it. It's all a lie and we're going to stop them. Stop who? What's a lie? What happened to Bren? I can't explain much here, but the bug isn't what everyone thinks it is. We have to stop them or... What would happen if we didn't do anything? I thought of Bren. We have to stop them or more people are going to die. What do you mean? Where have you been anyway? Look, just meet us at Holland Park, near the scarf store. What for? Connor's face turned right and left. I scanned the dispersing students, too. Nobody seemed to be watching us. We need your help. Help with what? I told you, we have to stop them. Connor missed a step and almost tripped. Seriously? What do you need me for? I hadn't thought that far ahead. I pictured what our moves would have to be in Prime 1. Connor was pretty good with computers. I need your help getting into their network. We have to get some proof of what they're doing. Who else? It took me a few seconds to understand his question. Melissa's with me. I'm going to get Paul, too. I figured it would just complicate things in his mind if I mentioned Devera. Okay. I felt some tension leave my body. But I'll talk to Paul. You're kind of noticeable. I heard the smile in his voice. That's good. Thanks. Tell him we need his special ear comms. Special? Special ear comms. What does that mean? Ask him. What's going on? I heard the frustration in Connor's voice. We'll talk more when we meet, okay? Fine. I moved away from him, but stopped when he raised his voice somewhat. Wait, when? As soon as you can, I said. Don't let anybody see you, and don't I am or use regular ear comms. Okay. Be careful. You too, Mr. Enforcer, sir. Chapter 33 I headed off, circling around and back toward Prime 1, figuring I had time to do some scouting before everybody showed up at the meetup. My path took me near the dumps. I could see some of the first shift of workers and students finishing their work, spraying down the conveyor belts. It was hard to believe I had been down there less than twelve hours before, being chased by enforcers and rangers. The memory of my few seconds hanging from the underside of a trash conveyor made my bandaged back twinge. As I walked, the railing that kept people from falling down the ten meters into the dumps ran along on my left. I held my keeper in both hands, trying to imitate the way the enforcers always looked. I had another slung over my shoulder, 
hanging against my back, which enforcers didn't usually do. But so far nobody seemed to have noticed, or cared enough to show they noticed. Studying the area, I felt like I was watching a video clip of a story, or some other kind of fabrication, like a hologram of what life in the new chapter should be like. People wearing the city-issued clothes, some of them wearing accessories they had picked up in one of the markets in town. I wondered why the markets were even there. Everyone knew that if you wanted to sell something, the item and the cost had to be approved by admins in Prime 1. Besides, you had to go into debt something like a thousand mitts to be able to open a vendor front. But I guessed if a person wanted to sacrifice an entire year's worth of remittances just so they could sell scarves or cheesy jewelry, if that made a person feel like he had anything like a free life, it wasn't my problem. I remembered learning about the old market system, how there were literally thousands of food vendor fronts, restaurants, where people could go to get food any time of day or night. Not in the new chapter. Nobody sold food here. If you wanted to eat a meal outside of school or your house, you used your papa and got the meal the computer system said you should have, all to keep us perfectly healthy. No freedom or choices there. How would it be to ask for a plate of deer meat and actually get it here in New Frisco? That made me think of the wanderers and the image of their bodies scattered around the forest floor hit me again. I forced it away and focused on the path in front of me. I passed the edge of the dumps. Prime One's immense dome filled my vision, soaring at least a hundred meters up. People walked by, some shadowing maintenance spots, others making their way home or to a ship somewhere. It was funny how people with so many different hair and skin colors pretty much looked the exact same in the city-issued greys. I crossed the street, dodging a bot and hanging a left so I could circle the dome of Prime One. Twenty minutes later, I rounded the east entrance and turned toward Holland Park, chewing on what I'd seen and learned. First, these uniforms were amazing. I was covered head to toe in black enforcer uniform, walking in the bright afternoon sun but I was cool and comfortable. I didn't feel a breeze or anything, but there had to be some mechanism that was moving air around. Or something. Second, there were no more guards than normal at the four entrances to Prime 1. I could only guess the admins didn't want to make it look like anything was wrong, or that they were worried about me and what I might do. I wondered if the Prime Administrator was back yet. He had to be. I hadn't bothered to take his ear calm. I hoped he thought that we had just run away. He may have sent out enforcers to find us. That thought almost stopped me, but I caught myself and kept walking, pretending I'd just been slowing to make the turn into Holland Park. If they had sent out pods to go after us, they may have caught up to the one we'd sent off on autopilot. If they had, maybe they had shot it down and thought we were dead. Or maybe they had somehow made it land and found that we were gone. Either way, it didn't matter. Hopefully they weren't expecting us to try to get back into Prime 1, but that wouldn't change anything. We had our plan, and we were going to get back in there. I was the first one at the meetup. I stood in place for a while, the keeper hanging from my hands, trying to look like a normal enforcer on patrol duty. While I stood there, I tried to figure out how we were going to get in. Each entrance to Prime 1 had a guard to either side of the door. The uniforms might fool them, but if we had Paul and Connor and Devera with us, there would be questions we couldn't answer. More than that, though, we probably needed to have some kind of identification. Since neither Melissa nor I had a working papa, and we were going to deactivate Paul and Connor's, that would be a lot more than just suspicious. My thoughts were interrupted when Melissa and Devera came into view. At least, I assumed it was Melissa. We should have memorized each other's numbers. Devera wore basic new Frisco grays, with the sleeves of her zip long enough to cover up the fact that she didn't have a papa. She walked a few steps behind Melissa. They were obviously trying to make it look like they weren't together. 
Melissa looked my way. I raised my keeper and nodded, hoping she could tell it was me. She approached, passing a bench on the way, which she pointed at with her keeper for Devera's benefit. That was definitely Melissa. Greetings, Melissa said, taking a position to my right. I guessed she might not be sure it was me. Name and ID, I said, pitching my voice low. Ah, uh, I heard the sudden panic in her voice. Kidding, it's me. Melissa hissed at me. If we weren't wearing these things, I'd smack you. If we weren't wearing these things, I could have seen your face just now and mocked you for years. Jerk. Yep. A quiet moment passed. Did you get them? Yeah, I talked to Connor and he was going to talk to Paul. They'll meet us here. I hoped another enforcer didn't walk by any time soon. When? Soon, I hope. Devera was staring expectantly at us. She needed to stop but it would be a bad idea for one of us to talk to her. She's going to give us away. Yeah, she said. So Paul and Connor need to get here. Connor's right there. Connor had shown up at the opposite end of the market row that Melissa and Devera had come from. I turned so he could see my visor, trying to catch his eye. He saw me and looked around. I figured he decided nobody was looking because he gave me a small thumbs up with a questioning expression. I put my left thumb up and pointed my keeper at the bench where Devera sat. Connor walked casually in our direction, his hands buried in his zip. When he got to the table, he said something to Devera, who looked surprised, but then started nodding. Connor sat and slumped low, obviously trying to look uninteresting. Hey, do you still have the Prime Administrator's card? I asked. I do, Melissa said. They never searched me. I think they always thought you had it. Good. Hold on to it. We had to wait another ten minutes before Paul showed up. I had to stop myself at least once a minute from going to Connor and asking him what was going on. Paul carried a satchel slung over one shoulder and across his chest. He spotted Connor and walked right up to him. After a short exchange, Paul turned and gave me and Melissa a long stare, his mouth slightly open. We watched as Connor and Paul had another exchange. All of this was done while the same clip I'd seen earlier played on a loop on the screens and people came and went through Holland Park. Finally, I saw Paul hand Connor something, then walk off. As I watched, Paul found another bench, sat, and tapped his papa. He started tapping on his wrist, so I assumed he was playing on his hollow game console that projected from the papa. Now Connor said something to Devera and stood. I was impressed with how Paul and Connor were acting. I could tell they knew they were being monitored. Connor walked toward us and passed close to Melissa. After he had gone, Melissa stepped closer. They did great! Her voice was pitched low, but I had no trouble hearing her despite the somewhat noisy area. What do you mean? That didn't look suspicious, and I've got Paul's ear comms. Her hand touched mine, and I closed my fingers around something very small that had almost no weight. We need to take off the helmets to get these in, I said. Yeah, let's split up again and find somewhere out of sight. When we've got them in, we'll talk to everyone. Good. I moved away from the scarf vendor and headed south, toward the engineering dome. But before I got to the dome, I turned left toward Hope Park. This was a section of road that nobody was walking on. I quickly pulled the helmet off, stuck it between my legs, and used my left hand to insert the ear comm. I had the helmet on again in five seconds, maybe less. I felt the ear comm grow warm, like they usually did. The power pack for earcoms was really small and ran off the heat generated by a person's head, and they activated when they were placed in an ear, so Paul hadn't changed that part of them. I heard the last part of a sentence. Should be on any second. That was Melissa's voice. I'm here, I said. Everyone else? Here, Paul said. Yep, Connor said. Paul only had four, so Devera doesn't have one, Melissa said. Okay. Paul, Connor, thanks for doing this, I said. Doc, Connor said. Of course I'm in for this. Whatever it is. Nick, 
Paul said. How did Bren die? Is what they're saying true? I don't think it is. I winced at the question and the grief that already felt like it had settled into my bones. Slow down, Paul, Melissa said. Nick, tell them everything. Connor, Paul, are you somewhere, um, discreet? Yep, Connor said. I'm walking toward the park. I'm still at Holland, but nobody can hear me, Paul said. I told them the story of the last two days. So much had happened, but I was done talking after less than five minutes. So if what you're saying about the knockout is true, Connor said, Bren died of the bug, but you didn't. And he was basically killed by the admins. Yeah, and they want to kill me and Melissa too, since we know the truth. Or maybe it's just the prime administrator. Maybe he's somehow the only one who knows what the knockout really is. I began to make my way back toward the engineering dome. Could he really do this alone? Connor asked. I don't know, I said. It was time to get moving. Look, we need to do this. Like Teacher Harris! Paul's voice came through the earcom, high-pitched. What? Melissa asked. Remember when he went crazy, started shouting about the bug? Paul sounded excited. Sure, Connor said. Maybe he'd figured it out too, Paul said. We chewed on that. So he didn't retire or anything, I said. They killed him, Connor said. A moment of silence passed. If the new chapter learned that someone figured out the secret, that person was dead. Every time. It had happened before. We had to stop them. What's the plan? Connor's voice again. We go into Prime 1 and get proof about the knockout, probably with a chemical analysis, I said. Everyone knows what the bug looks like chemically and under a microscope. Then we broadcast it to every screen in New Frisco. It sounded ridiculous. I couldn't believe Melissa and I had tried to do this on our own just a few hours earlier. And we destroy the knockout, Melissa said. I think we should tell people what happened to the Wanderers, too. So here's what we do, I said. Melissa and Devera will go to the power utility and find a way to shut down the robot guards. At the same time... Robot guards? This was Paul's voice. You didn't say anything about that. Yes, very freaky. Totally quiet and with weapons that unfold. They seem pretty invincible, so I don't think we want to try to fight them. We can fight the people, though, I hope. I'd rather not fight the people, Paul said. Me too. If we're lucky, we won't have to. I sounded a lot more confident than I felt. But they'll also cut off communications with the outside, except for broadcasting. That's gonna be hard, Connor said. Impossible, Paul said. And were you hoping to get into the broadcasting room and send out the proof from there? Yeah, I said. Then it's pointless to try to cut off their power grid, but keep broadcasting capability. Prime One's firewall is fragging strong. You're better off trying to splice into the line and send a broadcast piggybacked on their signal. Piggybacked? That was Melissa. I've got a handheld game console in my bag. I could probably use the vid chat on it to... Paul trailed off. Uh, between Connor and me, we could figure out how to set it up. I've got the tools. No, I said. People have to believe us, not just see us. If we're sitting in the speaker's chairs at their desk and sending the clips out from there and telling the story from there, we have a much better chance. You're talking about gaining control of the broadcasting equipment and everything, Connor said. Yes, but I know where it is, I said, and we're going to make a distraction to get the enforcers out of Prime 1. I think it's the only way to make sure people see and believe the truth. Distraction, Paul said. You never said anything about that. I hadn't gotten to it yet. I took a breath and held it tightly. We need to blow up the engineering dome. We talked about that before, Melissa said. But how do we do it? The engineering dome? Paul's voice got so high it squeaked. People are in there. People I like. And my own workstation, he didn't say. Not the whole thing, I said. Just the fuel storage. Oh, Paul said, his voice normal again. So set off an incendiary of some kind? 
I was just thinking of using a keeper to fire a grenade into it. I picked up my pace. That's what I said, Paul said. That's dangerous, Connor said. We can make sure nobody's in there. A few people passed in front of me as I paused. But that can wait. First, Melissa has a card that can get us into Prime 1. But we need the digital signature changed. Is that possible, Paul? Easy. I just need to add a few pits, and as long as I stay within the parameters of the algorithm, it's like... I cut Paul off. Okay, so we need to meet really fast so we can deal with Paul and Connor's papas and the card thing. Everyone gather at the east edge of Purple Res, where H begins. Two minutes. On our way, Melissa said. I was already there, standing on the corner and trying to give an impression of menacing authority. I'm here. Just a minute, Connor said. Paul didn't say anything, but he jogged into sight within a few seconds. Here, came his voice. When he stopped in front of me, I pulled off my left glove and dug into a pocket in the enforcer jacket. I handed him the tiny pin Melissa had given me. Use this to take off your papa. Paul's eyes widened. But I got the knockout last night. My heart sank. Then you need to make sure your heart rate doesn't go up too high. But there's a tracker in there, and we can't have them knowing where you are. He stared at me for long seconds, fear in his face. This is insane. He shook his head and got to work on his papa. The others arrived a few minutes later. I turned to Connor. You have to take your papa off so the admins can't track where you are. Did you get the knockout recently? Connor swallowed. Last night. I exchanged a visor-covered look with Melissa. You have to be careful with your heart rate, but we won't be running. You should be okay. Got it, Paul said. He held his papa loosely. This is crazy, Connor said. He took the pin from Paul, examining it. Where'd this come from? Give me the card, Paul said, digging into his satchel. I made it, Melissa said to Connor. She pulled out the small green card and handed it to Paul. But what if my heartbeat goes too high? Connor asked. The bug's not real anymore, Devera said, her hand going to his arm. Don't be scared. It's in my blood if Nick's right, Connor said, his voice cracking. I am right, but you can do it, I said. Either take it off or you don't come along. I stepped away. Meet at the north entrance of the dumps in five minutes. I walked quickly back toward the engineering dome, easily seeing Prime One rising above it. When you're done with the papa, Connor, find somewhere to hide it, somewhere you might actually be if you're not at your shift. Okay, Connor said. His voice sounded almost panicky. I'm taking it off. Great, maybe in a park or something, I said. Nick, Melissa said. How are we going to do this? Paul's got a point about the broadcasting equipment. Are we going to piggyback in? I thought for a moment, feeling alive and clear. Like I was finally making real choices. Like I was finally free. Piggyback. That was it. Yes. And no. I told them my idea as I walked. Passing right next to a bush on the edge of the grounds of the engineering dome, I dropped Paul's papa into the bush and kept moving, heading south. So we still meet at the dumps? Connor asked. Yes, we'll get into Prime 1 through the conveyor belt tunnel, I said. Are you guys done? Yeah, Paul said. We're on the move. Melissa's got Devera. Connor and me have the card. Connor's papa? I asked. Behind a tree, Connor said. Great, two minutes, I said. Are we sure we'll be able to get in? No, but this should work. Everybody should be focused on the fuel explosion, I said. You keep talking about that. Who's going to do it? Melissa asked. Me. My visor told me the south door of the engineering dome was 50 meters away, and that there were no heat signatures behind the wall. This visor was totally blaze. As I lifted the keeper, green words flashed before my eyes. Select projectile and target. I thumbed at the wide cylinder on the keeper. Grenade selected. This was completely nuts. I was completely nuts. But the time had come to change things.
What? Melissa said. You'll be caught. I won't be. One minute. I fired. The explosion was incredibly loud. I stepped back around the corner of the engineering dome, counted to ten, then fired again. The door must have been destroyed in the first blast, because this time the explosion came a second or two later, and it was much larger. That was the fuel? Paul asked. I picked myself off the ground and shook the haze away. Distraction. I got up, bits of rocks and plasteel tumbling off me. Go! I ran. Chapter 34 I was at the north entrance to the dumps a minute later. I had twisted a knee when I was knocked down by the fuel storage explosion, but I could move all right. Smoke billowed into the sky as Paul flashed the card in front of the sensor. We hurried into the small building that served as a worker processing station. A red-faced man behind the counter stared at us, then at the pillar of smoke that we could easily see through the windows. What's going on? Some kind of security breach, Melissa said, her voice lower than usual. We're here to investigate. But this is the dumps. Shut up. Melissa said and fired her keeper. Electrodes spat into the man's chest and he convulsed, then fell unconscious to the floor. Connor, Paul, and I turned to her, shocked. Devera nodded, a strange look of satisfaction on her face. Let's go, Melissa said. Our path through the dumps to the conveyor tunnel for Prime One was unobstructed. Everybody had left their positions and gone to the east entrance building to see what was going on. Nothing like an explosion had ever happened in New Frisco, so it was no surprise that everyone wanted to see, which was what I was counting on. Inside of another minute, we were hurrying down the dimly lit tunnel. Connor and Paul were breathing a little hard. Guys, take slow breaths, I said. Keep calm. I realized what I'd just said and almost burst into laughter. Better calm than dead. In this case, it was true. Before long, we came to the door I'd tried to jam closed with my zip. Paul opened it. Okay, remember where the broadcasting room is? I said as we were walking. Melissa nodded. Second floor. Give Devera a keeper, I said, and first kill the solar panels. Melissa hesitated, but finally took her extra keeper off her shoulder. Be careful, Devera grinned. Now they have to be careful. For a moment, she didn't look nine years old. You'll have to take the stairs at least part of the way, I said. We're good, Melissa said. No bug in us. We stepped through the door. Go. We'll IM you in about ten minutes. We all hurried down the short hallway to the main utility corridor. I pointed. That's the stairs. Melissa and Devera took off running. Connor, Paul, let's go. I handed my extra keeper to Connor. Remember, breathe slowly. We headed out the other direction. We saw nobody as we walked quickly. Just before we came to the elevator, I saw the box I'd seen my first time in this corridor. Emergency power. I lowered my visor and thumbed the ammunition drum on my keeper. Get behind me! Connor and Paul jumped and I fired. It still hurt my injured right arm, but I could manage it. Besides, this was fun. Bullets tore through the metal casing of the power box, sparks flying and high-pitched whines echoing all around us. When the smoke cleared, I smiled. The casing of the box was shredded. I thumbed the drum again and fired more. Electrodes splattered into the box, more sparks and loud snapping. The lights flickered a few times. That should take care of that, I said. Doc! Connor said, his face slack. Very cool. Nice, I get to go next, Paul said. Let's move. Ten meters from the bend in the hallway, two enforcers rounded the corner. They weren't fooled by my uniform. They reacted faster than I could, raising their keepers. Halt! We didn't halt. Get back! I yelled at Connor and Paul. I fired, stepping backward fast. Electrodes splattered out of my keeper, flopping uselessly on the gray stone floor. Frag! 
I ran backward as fast as I could, frantically using my fingers to look for the switch to change my ammo, my eyes glued to the enforcers. Their keepers lifted a little, and I threw myself into motion, ducking and bouncing off walls. Connor and Paul had run and found a corner to hide behind. Explosions filled the narrow hallway, followed by the whines of ricocheting bullets. I felt multiple impacts on my back, flinging me to the floor, but the enforcer uniform absorbed most of the impact. Rock chips and dust filled the air. I rolled onto my back, finally finding the ammo knob. I flipped it and squeezed the trigger, clueless about what I was about to fire. A massive thump and flash, pressure, and then noise so loud I thought my ears would bleed, slammed into me. If I'd been standing, it probably would have cut me in half. Dazed, I pushed to my knees, my ears ringing. My visors showed me multiple heat sources that were fading quickly, small fires. Nick! I heard the voice in my ear come and in the hallway, Paul's voice. Nick, bug me, are you okay? Hands gripped my biceps. Doc, what the bug did you do? That was Connor. I shook my head, trying to clear it, not entirely sure what I'd just done. I think it was a grenade. On my feet, I surveyed the smoke-filled hallway. Gashes in the walls, floor, and ceiling. Rubble everywhere. Two dark forms lying very still. I felt my heart rate spike. I ran to the downed enforcers, kneeling between them. Nick, we have to go, Paul said, yanking at me. Wait a minute. I dropped my keeper, yanking at the helmet of the nearest enforcer. I avoided looking at the gashes in his torso and legs. The helmet wouldn't come off, but I got a finger on his neck. A pulse. I let out the breath I'd been holding. Nick, we have to hurry, Connor yanked at me now. Who cares if they're dead? I do, I spun to the other enforcer. He had a pulse, too. If we start killing people, we're no better, and we might as well give up. Grabbing my keeper, I stood. We're not here to kill people. I lifted my visor and stared Connor and Paul down. We're not. Paul nodded. Fine, Connor said. Let's just go. I led the way down the hallway, a blaring siren echoing off the walls, and red alarm lights flashing and rotating in the dim illumination of emergency lights. We were at the lab less than a minute later. Paul got us in. Connor found the computers and got them warming up while Paul and I opened the storage rooms. We used anything we could find, beaker stands, tools, gloves, to jam the doors wide open. I'll get a sample, Paul said. He put on a pair of gloves and ducked into one of the rooms. Push the top, I said. Got it. His voice sounded a little muffled. Ready over here. I'm in my IM box, and I've got the analysis deck set, Connor called. Paul, help him out, I said. I'll take care of the knockout. Okay, Paul said, already emerging with a vial in his hand. I ducked into each storage room, opening all of the big cylinders. It took me about a minute. The knockout would eventually become inactive. But who knew how quickly people could get down here? I thought fast, wanting a faster way to heat up the knockout. Bug me! Connor's shout echoed through the lab. You were right! It's the bug too! It probably just knocks you out a little faster than the bug can get you! Send it to Melissa! I called. The cooling units. I pulled my visor down again and blasted the cooling unit in the storage room I stood in. The unit screeched and shuddered. A loud clank followed and sparks fizzled out of the vents. It was dead. Nick, what are you doing? Paul's high voice called. Making sure, I yelled back. I'm not shooting the vials. Don't worry. I ran to the next storage room. Melissa, can you hear me? We found an elevator, Melissa said. We're on the roof. Wait a second. They're sending you the analysis now. Get to broadcasting fast. Melissa's voice came back, loud crashing noises in the background. The solars are sliding down the dome as we speak. Tell them it was fun, Devera called. Devera says, I heard her. I blasted the next cooling unit. 
See you in a few minutes. Okay. I checked my papa. We'd been in Prime 1 for five minutes at the most. Sixty seconds later, all of the cooling units were destroyed, dripping fluid of some kind on the concrete floor of the storage rooms. I still wasn't done. I wanted to be sure. I searched the lab. Are you finished? It's sent, Connor said. What are you doing now? Paul asked. Heating units. The bug will die faster if we make it hotter. I found one and turned it on. Good idea, Paul scanned the lab. Got one here, he bent over. Connor, I said. Get the card and go hold the elevator. We'll be finished in a minute. Shoot anyone who tries to stop you. I gave him a long look. With the electrodes. Or rubber bullets, Connor said, going over to Paul, taking the card and walking quickly out. And breathe slowly. Paul appeared again, his face sweaty. It's on. Is it getting warm in here yet? The enforcer uniform still felt cool. Maybe a little. Keep looking. I took the helmet off and set it on a work table. I was tired of looking through the visor. It wasn't good for this kind of work. I found another heating unit and carried it closer to a storage room, turning it on and setting it on the floor. Got another, Paul said. He carried it closer to a storage room and turned it on. We have to go. We found Connor at the elevator, his foot jamming the door open. Took you long enough, Connor said. Inside the elevator, Paul flashed the card and hit two. The elevator shot up. It felt like only seconds later that the doors slid open. I darted out of the car and scanned the area. It was a small elevator lobby with hallways off to the right and left and a reception area ahead of me. Nobody sat behind the desk. A sign on the wall read, Broadcasting Rooms, with an arrow pointing right. Okay, let's go. I dashed down the right hallway. A door ahead of me opened and a tall man stepped out. Don't move! I yelled. He spun to see me, terror on his face. Get back in there, I said, and followed him. Two more people sat at terminals with multiple screens. I don't want to hurt you, but I need you to cooperate, okay? What are you doing? A balding man shouted at me. Who are you? I'm the guy who will shoot you if you don't shut up, I said. He's just a kid. This was the tall man I'd ordered back into the room. A kid with a keeper, I said back. I heard Connor and Paul arrive right behind me. Go clear the speakers away from their desk. Bring them here. Connor's footsteps faded quickly. Paul squeezed around me. I want you to show my friend how to work this, I told the people in the room. How to get a broadcast out. What? This was the first time the only woman in the room had spoken. Why? Just do it and you'll see, I said. No, I don't think so, she said. I thumbed the drum, held my breath against the imminent arm pain, and fired rubber bullets just above her head. She yelped. Yes, I think so, I said. Nick? Melissa's voice sounded strange. I realized I'd heard it both through my earcom and in my other ear. We're here, I said, raising my voice. I glanced down the hallway. She and Devera appeared at a run. Did you see anyone? I turned back to the three adults. No, Devera said. That was fun. Great, you two get to the speaker desk. I turned back to the woman and man. Show my friend how to record a broadcast and how to program it to be broadcast at a certain time to all the screens. What is this about? the tall man. It's about the truth, I said. It's about not killing people. You kids are crazy, the balding man said. We didn't have time for this. You're right. I thumbed the drum and shot the balding man, electrodes embedded into his chest. The tall man screeched and fell back. The woman cried out again, going to the balding man, who was already slumping to the floor. He's fine, I said, but you two had better start teaching. Paul had been studying the monitors and keyboards and other equipment. What does this do? The tall guy hesitated. I gestured with my keeper again. Tell him. Nick, we've got them, Connor's voice said. I stepped into the room to make space in the doorway. The tall man and the woman exchanged a look. The woman stayed with Baldy, but the tall guy went to Paul and started pointing and talking. 
The speakers, their hair perfect, but confusion and fear making their faces ugly, stumbled into the room, Connor close behind. You two sit over there, I pointed at a corner of the room. Connor, there are flex cuffs in a pouch on my right hip. Connor dug through the pouch and restrained the speakers. Do you have any idea how much trouble you will be in? The male speaker said, his voice unnaturally smooth. His name was John Jennings as everybody in New Frisco knew. What is it you're trying to accomplish here? Rebecca Wake, the female speaker, put her flex-cuffed hand on his arm. They're insane, John. Don't try to reason with them. She sounded almost like she was singing. I'm just trying to understand here, Bex. Bex, John, shut up. Unless you want to find out what a keeper feels like, like that guy did. I pointed at Baldy. What have you done to Mark? Rebecca's eyes were wide her mouth an almost perfect oval. Connor, come here, Paul said. I need your help. The woman was talking to Paul now, too. Connor gave me his keeper and joined the group. We're ready, Nick, Melissa said through the earcom. I looked through the windows of what I guessed was the control room into the room where the speakers normally sat. Devera and Melissa sat there now. I've got the analysis and the clips, Paul said. What? Melissa said. The clips were in my IM box. I hacked in, Connor said. Sorry. He's not sorry, I said. Connor shot me a crooked smile. I'm not. Okay, start with the story they've been telling. Then tell the truth of what happened. Show the clips. Then the analysis. Then show Devera's arm. She doesn't have a line where the papa was. This was it. Paul, ready? Let's go. Paul looked at the screens above the windows. He spun a ball embedded in the console in front of him, and the image of Melissa and Devera widened, a space opening up to the left of Melissa. We're recording in five. Paul nodded to Connor, who hit a button I couldn't see. Four. Paul typed quickly on the keyboard. Three, two, one. Melissa stared at the camera for a long moment, then began talking. People of New Frisco, your life has been a lie. The latest lie is the one about how Bren Radcliffe died. She paused. I stared at her, willing her to keep talking. She swallowed a few times and wiped at her eyes. Bren Radcliffe was murdered. But here's the lie you were told. I forced myself to look away from her as she continued. The tall man and the woman stood next to each other, listening. The bug is no longer in the air. Nick Granger isn't a danger to you or me. Watch these surveillance clips taken from New Frisco's camera system. I watched the tall man and the woman, as well as the speakers as the clips played. They understood what they were seeing when they saw both Bren and I racing full speed through Hope Park. All four of them looked from me to the screen in front of them a few times while the clips finished. Bren Radcliffe died that night, but... Nick Granger didn't. Why? Not because the bug is in the air, but because it's in your blood. It's put in your blood every day, but Nick Granger hasn't had the knockout for nearly a year, so the bug wasn't in his blood. Want proof? Connor hit a button and a series of screenshots from the analysis appeared next to Melissa's head on the screen. Now the tall man and the woman fell into some rolling chairs, Shock, obvious in every part of their body. People of New Frisco, you are given the bug every night when you are put to sleep by the knockout, and every time the knockout saves you from a dangerous heart rate. You're not being saved. You're being herded, controlled, and sometimes you're being murdered, like Bren Radcliffe and like Devera's people. Melissa turned to Devera. Will you tell them about your mother? Devera sat still for a long moment, eyes straight ahead. Melissa had been amazing, but this would be it. This would finish off the new chapter. They shot my mom and my baby brother. They shot Wendy. They burned the forest. Devera stood and kept speaking, describing the attack on the wanderers. While she spoke, she took off her greys, revealing her wanderer clothes beneath them. She finished simply. I've been a wanderer all my life. 
She raised her arms, letting her sleeves slide to her elbows. I've never worn one of those things you call a papa. Paul zoomed the camera in on Devera, showing us her empty wrist and her big green eyes. My whole life is proof that your life is a lie. Tingles shot from my scalp down my neck and all over my body. Had Melissa coached her? Stop there, I said. Paul hit a button. Wow! Get ready to broadcast, but save it to a stick. I turned to the speakers, then the man and woman. Any questions? You have to go, the woman said. We haven't broadcast a story on the explosion yet. An admin will be here any second. Relief flooded into me. She believed us. Judging by the man's expression, he did too. We have to send this out, Connor said. Then make sure nobody can do any more broadcasts. Can't be done from here. You could send your clip out, but blowing up this room wouldn't be enough, the tall man said. There are two more control rooms. We'll send it out now, I said. Then we shut down the power grid for the entire dome. Got it! Paul typed fast, then hit a green button. He scowled at his monitor and hit the green button again. Somebody knows we're here! I can't get the signal past the firewall! Frag it! I thought fast. Can you splice or hack or whatever into a screen and send the signal all over the city? I could get it onto one screen, Paul said. Probably. I can help, said the tall man. We have to go now. The network is one enclosed thing, totally interconnected. I know how it works. He stood and met my eyes. You have to trust me. I have two young kids in the nursery. I don't want them to ever get the bug. Ever. I studied his face, understanding what he was saying. I had no choice. What's your name? Nate. Go. Help them get out, I said. Paul and Connor joined Nate, Paul gripping a Z-stick. You coming? Melissa and I will kill the grid. Paul, give Melissa the card and take Devera. Melissa and Devera showed up at that moment, carrying two keepers. Melissa had her enforcer uniform back on. Devera, go with them, okay? Shouting carried through the hallways. You have to get going. Act like you're scared. We'll get their attention, Melissa said. Nate took off running, the others streaming behind him. Keep your heart rate down, Melissa shouted, pocketing the little green card. I glanced at the woman and the speakers. Will you help? All three nodded. We're going to make it look like we came here to send out a broadcast, but failed and got frustrated. We have to help them get out. I aimed my keeper at the control consoles. Step back. The woman grabbed Baldy, who was beginning to stir, and dragged him to a wall. Melissa, find the power grid. It's got to be on the ground level. Shut it down, blow it up, whatever. Don't let them catch you. She caught my gaze and held it. What about you? I've got this. She nodded and ran out of there. Be safe. Don't get caught, I said through the earcom. Meet at Brown Park. Wait a reasonable amount of time, then get the side jet and go. Even if someone doesn't make it, go. They'll be coming for us. What? What do you mean? Melissa asked. Just hurry up, I said. I fired my keeper. Sparks and small fires erupted from the consoles, glass shattering and scattering all over. I waited for the bound speakers to scramble out of the way, then blasted the screens. The windows to the speaker's room came next. They exploded, showering everything with glass. I glanced over my shoulder and nodded at the three people, then ran. Lies! I shouted. It's all lies! I tore down the hallway, kicking open doors and shooting at walls and windows, aiming high, screaming my head off. Chapter 35 I made it, limping slightly, through three rooms and into a hallway before enforcers cut me off, all of them shouting and firing their keepers. Rubber bullets, electrodes, and real bullets filled the hallway. I threw myself at the floor, dropping my keeper. I was nowhere near fast enough. 
My left shoulder exploded in pain, followed immediately by my stomach and both legs. On my knees, another bullet tore past my ear, maybe even taking part of my ear with it. Two more bullets pounded against my chest. The armor of the enforcer uniform stopped the deadly things, but it still hurt. Falling forward, I covered my head with my hands. Silence invaded the hallway. It worried me more than all of the keepers in the world. I looked up. The prime administrator, wearing a new cream-colored suit, walked toward me, parting the group of enforcers at the same time that I felt a knee slam into my back and yank my hands into some flex cuffs. My right arm, as usual, screamed in protest. Nick, the prime administrator said, I'd hoped you would just leave, go into the wilderness, but I had a feeling you might make the wrong choice. I wish I were surprised. He knelt in front of me and reached for my wrist, his empty eyes on mine. You and your friend should have done as we asked. We will find her, too. It's all a lie, I shouted. He's lying to you enforcers, too. Ah, oh, one sixty or so. We must wait. The prime administrator turned to the enforcers. Take him. He stood and walked back the way he had come. Two enforcers hauled me to my feet and dragged me behind him. I shouted the whole way. When we got in the elevator, my two enforcers, plus four others, joined the prime administrator. Nobody spoke. I decided to fill the void. You know it's a lie, right? The knockout has the bug in it. He's killing people, controlling people. It's a lie. Silence him. The prime administrator didn't even move as he spoke. A tall enforcer slapped his hand across my face. The now familiar sensation of the gagging tape covered my mouth and part of my cheeks. The rest of the ride passed in silence. It occurred to me that I might not get away this time. It didn't matter. We were about to win. When we got into the prime administrator's office, he held my wrist again. One thirty. Better. He smiled at the enforcers. Better calm than dead, right, Nick? He pulled a capped syringe out of his jacket pocket. I knew what it was and shouted against my gag, trying to pull away from him. The enforcer's hands felt like the vices in the engineering dome. A poke against my wrist. I felt myself falling. When I woke up, I sat slumped in a chair in front of the prime administrator's desk. I was no longer wearing the enforcer uniform. The tape was gone from my mouth and my hands lay in my lap, unrestrained. Confused, I looked at the tall man with the empty eyes. He had given me the bug again, and I didn't have a papa with a knockout to save me. Sweat broke out on my scalp. My heart kicked up a notch. I willed it to slow, trying to breathe slowly. Please, no, not like Bren. Strangely, the thought of Bren's death helped me pull myself together. I felt my heart slow. You were right about the bug, Nick. He stood, came around his desk, and sat on the corner. I'm impressed with your determination, but you should not have come back. You have made things difficult. Difficult? Good. The moment stretched. Anger filled the silence as we stared at each other. The prime administrator's lips stretched in a joke of a smile. I kept quiet. I needed to give Melissa as much time as I could. The others, too. He had to keep focusing on me. I looked around the room. It was just the two of us, of course. The man's wobbly face shook, and the smile dissolved into a glare. A strange glare, with those empty eyes. You think you can stop this? This is evolution, Nick. This is progress. Rage nearly choked me. I had to strain to breathe, but I had to stay calm. I had the bug. Progress? Evolution? We destroyed ourselves. Humanity made a mess of existence. The prime administrator stepped from behind his desk. 
You want that cycle to repeat itself? We finally stopped it. Finally fixed it. Fixed what? I had to hear him say it. His brows furrowed, but his eyes remained empty. The problem? What problem? I willed myself to stop shaking. I pictured my heart slowing, beat by beat. The problem of choice, Nick, of individuality. Society must be united for it to survive. His gaze wandered for a moment. That doesn't work if everyone thinks they have a voice. Too many voices. All that does is make noise. Destructive noise. He stepped toward me and, almost lazily, slapped me. The sound surprised me almost more than the pain. My heart rate jumped. No! I stared into his dead eyes as he moved away from me again. He knew exactly what he was doing. Noise? Who did he think he was to run the lives of all of the people of New Frisco? One voice keeps societies on track. One authority. He smiled again, this time condescendingly. You can't deny that the new chapter has no crime. Almost zero disease. People are happy. Who's happy? I sugged in a ragged breath. You? My ear calm buzzed to life. Nick, I can hear you. It was Melissa. I'm at the power grid. They think I'm an enforcer. So far. We hear you too, Nick, Connor said. We're almost at the nearest screen. Keep him busy. Everyone is happy, boy, the Prime Administrator's nostrils flared. Or almost everyone. Keep him busy. I'm not happy. So you would selfishly try to bring down humanity's new chapter because you, Nick Granger, are unhappy with your lot? He seemed to be warming to his lecture. This is the problem. One loud, angry voice thinks it can change the world for everyone else. He wandered behind my chair. The next moment, I felt the chair falling backward. I jerked, grabbing the armrests. The chair tipped forward again, settling on all four legs. I concentrated. If I was under 130, I'd be surprised. He came into view, a small smile on his face. How's that heart rate, Nick? Bugging spammer! I forced myself to focus. Breathe. Not now. Not after all of this. I thought about what he'd said. He'd been talking about angry voices and me trying to bring down the new chapter. It's fine. As I was saying, he continued to pace, the few loud voices must not be allowed to derail progress. I had to admit it. He sounded good. But he couldn't be right. He, this man, had killed Bren, had killed the people who had helped me. Sure, they'd betrayed me too, but they hadn't tried to kill me. When you murder people to make something good happen, the good is wrong. That's the problem. It is for the greater good. Whatever the greater good needs, we will do. But you're deciding what the greater good needs by yourself. With the wisdom of history. The Prime Administrator stepped closer, one hand grabbing my wrist. The wisdom of history. Who made you the one who gets to decide? He looked around. His face suddenly reminded me of pictures of lizards that we had seen in ecology class. One thirty. Your control is good, but you will fail. And I will tell you, Nick because you will not be leaving this room. And you will die of the bug, as the people of New Frisco are expecting now. It's a sad story, but it will help. The door that led back through the scanning cylinder opened, and two guard robots rolled silently into the room. They both had two arms extended, each with a barrel of some kind of weapon pointing at me. I felt my heart rate increase, no, stay calm. I felt a strange grin try to form on my face. Better calm than dead. Tell me what. It had to happen soon. Come on, guys. Why, I am the one. The one who decides. 
He activated his desk and images began to flow across it. He tapped the desk after a moment. What I saw stole my breath and strength. Because I am the catalyst. I brought about this stage of humanity's evolution. The picture on his desk showed people wearing clothes like the one we saw in the texts. Three men smiled behind what was some kind of a chemistry lab table. A caption under the photo listed their names. One of the men was the prime administrator. Under his grinning image was the name Adam Holland. Adam Holland? Like Holland Park? He nodded. Yes, an old retired name. His expression softened as he looked at the picture. These were my research colleagues. None of them agreed with me, but I was right. Humanity needed a reset. He straightened and looked around, raising his arms expansively. And it has worked! I looked at him, then the picture. Reset? I stared at the picture. It was him. In the ancient picture, but also standing in front of me? That was impossible. You? Well, what do you mean? Understanding tugged at me, but I had to hear it from the prime administrator. You're a smart boy, Nick. What do you think? I blinked, shaking my head. You? You did it? Totally impossible. Ridiculous. You did it? You did the bug? I felt my bones shake, nearly dissolve. I felt like vomiting. A slow smile spread across his wide face. Got it in one. Holy bug! Melissa whispered. She'd heard the whole thing. Almost there, Paul said. But you should be dead by now. I was staring at the impossible. An immortal, murdering monster. I will never die. The screens on the wall to my right flickered once, then flashed black. A second later, the video began playing. The one we'd recorded earlier. What? What is this? The Prime Administrator, Holland, gave the screens his strange glare. I spun, seeing that the same clip was playing on every screen on all three walls. I watched Melissa's face, then Devera's. I couldn't hear their words, but I remembered what they were saying. The truth. You thought you stopped us, but you didn't. I smiled, enjoying the moment. His pale face wobbled as he looked at each wall in turn. His silence felt amazing. The images on the glass desk flickered. Melissa with the power. I'm there, Nick, Melissa said. Get out. Get out now. How is that possible? I turned back to Holland. How are you still alive? You will never learn that. The images on Holland's desk flickered again, then fuzzed over. The desk suddenly went clear. Holland started. What? It's off. I grinned at him. We turned it off. All of them. My ear insert buzzed for a moment. Nick! Melissa's voice came too loud. I flinched and tried to hide it. They will be reactivated. Holland tapped a corner of his desk. Nothing happened. Everything Adam. I spat his name, loving that I didn't have to call this monster by a title anymore. Communications, too. The robots! Melissa's voice drove a spike behind my eyes. They're not on the same grid! They're here! It sounded like she was going to say something else, but her voice suddenly cut off with a loud cry and some explosions. To what end? Holland actually laughed. It will all be turned on again soon. But the bug will be dead. All of it. His face went hard as understanding came to him. You have failed, he said. There is emergency power for... For the storage room? I put as much anger into my smile and voice as I could. Do you mean the emergency power grid or the solar panels? I waited for surprise to register. We took care of those first. The image of the sparking and spitting electrical box came back to me. I wondered if Melissa had enjoyed shooting a grenade at the solar panels as much as Debera had. 
The man's mouth opened, then closed, his empty eyes so starkly plain against his anger-hardened face. You were already going to die. Now it will be painful, he glared at me. Die, knowing you've made no difference. He reached into a pocket. I tensed, unsure of what to expect. The new chapter will never die. His hand emerged, holding a dull gray instrument of some kind. I took a long, slow breath, letting it out carefully. I was right at 120. Maybe less, maybe a bit more. I had to be. He pressed a series of buttons on his instrument. I leapt toward him. Chapter 36 The robot's extended arms exploded. I hunched and flinched, expecting an explosion of pain as I bounced off Holland's translucent desk. The bullets hit the floor at my feet. I flung myself to the right. The guns tracked my movement, firing again. I jumped, tripping on my own feet and falling to the left this time. Bullets tore into the stone floor again, the noise squeezing cottony pain into my ears. Melissa's voice cut into my head as I dove at the man. I got two of them. Only the electrodes work. Holland cackled. Dodge, boy. You can't dodge your blood. I kicked myself mentally. He didn't want to shoot me. He wanted me to die of the bug. Everything would be easier that way. Not a chance. I sucked in a breath, listened to my heartbeat. If I wasn't at 140 yet, I was close. Everyone knew 140 wasn't an exact number, but was a minimum threshold. What was my vulnerable range? Bug him. I planted my feet. Frag off! Slowly, Nick. Get it under control. Holland snarled and lifted the thing in his hand. The robot's arms followed his movements. They fired faster than I could move, the explosions crashing all around me. A bullet slashed across my calf as I rolled to the left. Another slammed into my left shoulder. I kept rolling and scampering, the bullets shattering against the stone floor and sending jagged bits of stone and metal into my face. My right arm throbbed as I put weight on it, making for the chair I'd been sitting in. The explosion stopped. How's the heart, Nick? The high voice felt like hundreds of knives in my ears. I pictured my heart, willed it slower. Bug you! I threw the chair at Holland, knowing my heart rate was too high. I could almost feel the biotoxin in my blood streaming through my veins toward my heart. Holland dodged the chair, but didn't see me coming right after it. He tried to dodge me, but he was slow. I hit him, my right shoulder slamming into his chest, just as the robots began firing again. I felt a sting and fire on my ribs, my neck, and my left leg as bullets grazed my skin. Then we were tumbling over the desk and slamming to the floor. I grabbed for the tiny gray controller he held. The desk shattered in a hail of bullets from the robots. I rolled again, instinctively ducking behind the largest shield I had, Adam Holland. His body jerked as bullets slammed into him. He made no sound. I got hold of the controller as bullets sliced into me. Burning agony covered me from head to toe. More explosions, more searing pain. My vision blurred as I searched the controller and found a red button. I hit it. The explosions stopped. Hissing and tensing, muscles spasming, I struggled to my feet, which miraculously still held my weight. The robots were frozen, smoke leaking out of their barrels. Bug me! I stopped, focused, counted. 145, maybe 150. No! I waited for the coughing to start, willed my heart to slow down. No good! Even if I closed my eyes, I knew the prime administrator was dead at my feet, the bug about to infect my heart. I needed to calm down. I needed... I needed the knockout. I dug through Holland's pockets and found the syringe. A drop of the knockout remained in the cylinder. I tapped the air out of the cylinder and sucked in a breath. Better calm than dead. A smile tugged at the corners of my mouth. Please work. 
I jabbed my wrist, and everything went dark. Chapter 37 The pain from the bullet wounds and my arm, as well as voices in my ear, woke me up maybe ten minutes later. I lay there for a minute, listening to my heart. The knockout was a wonder. Strange to inject my killer into me and have it save me. As I pushed myself to my feet, my eyes settled on Adam Holland's face. Too bad the knockout part worked so well, huh? I leaned against the wall, eyeing the silent robots. I turned to Holland's inert form. No wires, no hissing, sparking bits. And blood came from his wounds. What kind of robot was he? Nothing like the transforming ones that had just killed him. A wave of exhaustion nearly knocked me over. We could figure that out later. Pits dotted the floor, tiny rock debris scattered everywhere. I felt trapped, like the walls were going to squeeze the life out of me at any second. Melissa, I need help. Are you okay? I grunted. I can walk, sort of, but I need help getting out of here. I struggled across the room, taking long, slow breaths. No more knockout. Not ever. What's going on out there? After the broadcast finished, the enforcers threw down their keepers. Then it was just the robots. Killing the grid didn't stop the robots. I heard Melissa breathing hard. Where are you? S1, I've got the bug, so I need help. I limped through the door. I think it was just the prime administrator. I don't think anyone else knew. You can turn the power on because I need the elevator. The thought of stairs made me feel like throwing up. I scanned my body, limping across the room. Trails of red and brown marked where the bullets had come too close. I worried that if I looked closely enough at my ribs, I'd see bone. How do I get to you? Melissa asked. Everybody out here is crying, Connor's voice came over the earcom. Everybody. It's weird. We'll be out there soon, I said. Melissa, go to the pod lift and take any elevator you find down to S1. Then just follow the doors and hallway. In the reception room, I looked around for something to lean on. Blood oozed from at least ten places bullets had grazed me. I was lucky Holland had been so big. I tapped my earcom. Kate Granger. A click followed by soft silence. Nick, is that you? The tension in my muscles eased a little bit. Yeah, it's me. I heard her say Dad's name. Nick, the explosion and the video. You? Dad sounded out of breath. Careful, Dad. It's time to avoid the knockout. I smiled into the empty room. Yeah, it's me and my friends. We did it. Where are you? Mom asked. Prime One. We'll be right there, Dad said. More attention leaked from me. I scanned the reception room, noting the glass table I'd stopped at my first time in this dome. I saw again the doors that looked like elevator doors and made my way to them. I didn't remember an elevator here on the schematic I'd seen. There was no button, only a flat sensor box. I needed a card. Melissa chose that moment to show up. Hey, I said. Great timing. Greetings, she said. Then she noticed my state. Bug me! Are you okay? Working on it. Let's get out of here. She took my arm. Still got that card? She pulled it out of her enforcer jacket. I pointed at the sensor box. She swiped the card, and the doors parted into the walls. An elevator? Melissa poked her head into it. Where does it go? Let's find out. Not yet. You need a med. It can wait. She looked me up and down. You're bleeding all over. Were you shot? I forced a smile. A little. But, you know, better calm than dead. Her eyes lit up with understanding. Bug me. Oh, yeah. No, bug me. I stepped into the elevator. I can stay calm for a week or two. I motioned her in. Going down? Maybe up? She followed me in, confusion on her face, and the doors closed. No buttons. 
I nodded. Yeah. Maybe ten seconds of an incredibly fast drop later, the door hissed open. Melissa helped me limp into a room whose lights flickered on as soon as we emerged from the elevator. Several computer terminals, along with a lot of monitors, lined the bottom half of the walls of the semicircular room. Lines beeped across the monitors with all kinds of strange-looking data on the edges of the monitors. We stepped farther into the room. Tall, wide windows completed the curving walls, allowing us to see what lay beyond. As the lights flickered on in the room beyond the windows, we saw that it was a lab of some kind, with maybe ten clear glass cylinders that looked like long, wide pods, each with one end pointing at the room we stood in and the other end pointing away, like the spokes on a cycle. I looked closer and felt my heart rate spike. Bug me! I tried to force my heart to slow. This was insane! Totally bugging crazy! Nick, that's not... that can't be... Melissa's mouth had fallen open. Are those people in there? Yeah, but not people. Those are all Adam Holland. They're all the prime administrator. We stood in stunned silence for a while, taking in the glass pods and the inert forms in them. Clones? Melissa asked, leaning over a pod. No. A voice filled the room, loud and angry. Well, yes, but that's not all they are. We spun around, searching for the voice's source. There was nobody else there. Who is that? I asked. Nick, for being so smart, you are disappointing sometimes, the voice said. A matte, flat screen flickered to life. The prime administrator's face appeared, but instead of the lifeless eyes I'd gotten used to seeing, these ones blazed furiously. After all that time interacting with my avatar, and you never put it together. Behind Holland's face was a completely blank, gray wall. Your avatar? I took in the pods again. These are your avatars? What does that mean? Like I said, Holland glared at me from the screen. One voice, one authority. That's how you ensure humanity's prolonged success. You call this success? You call poisoning people to keep them in line success? You're bugging crazy! I leaned on the table where the screen stood. No wars, no hunger, no discord. Almost all disease eradicated and technology advancement beyond your imagination. Holland's hot glare dropped a few degrees. Yes, that is success. That's robots, you fragging bug eater! And you killed my boyfriend! Melissa thumbed the ammunition cylinder on her keeper. Here's your success! She pulled the trigger and shot one of the pods. The glass shattered, liquid spilling out and dropping through the metal grate floor. The avatar in the pod erupted in explosions of gory red. As the pounding of the keeper's explosions faded, loud machine beeping and keening filled the room, along with smoke and a sour smell. I jerked closer to Melissa. Easy, relax. Go ahead. Holland's voice cut through the noise. Destroy them all. Throw your childish tantrum. Enjoy your last minutes. I grabbed Melissa. Wait, what are you talking about? Goodbye, Nick. While losing New Frisco is frustrating, the new chapter proceeds. A smile creased Holland's face. Perhaps you have time to see your parents. Dread sank into me. I tapped my earcom. Connor! Paul! Use the earcoms! Everyone has to get out! Get away! Something's coming! Deadly aware of how fast my heart rate was spiking, I ran for the elevator. Melissa jumped in after me, thumbed her ammunition drum, and fired just as the elevator door closed. A second later, as we shot up, we heard and felt an enormous thud under us. I stared at her. Grenade? Yup, had to be done. Melissa let her keeper drop. How close are you? I listened for my heartbeat. Too close. What did he mean? Losing New Frisco? Melissa led me out of the elevator door and we hurried across the room. I tried to run calmly, breathing evenly, 
ignoring twinges of pain everywhere. Don't know exactly. Something really bad, though. I'm sure of it. We found the next elevator and less than a minute later emerged from Prime 1. My heart rate had settled somewhat. The area near the dome of Prime 1 was filled with people. I spotted Connor, Paul, and Devera. Nate, the tall broadcasting guy, was with them. What are you doing? We have to go. Get in pods. Get on cycles. Get out of the city. All the shouting made me lose control, and I felt my heart rate climbing again. The people cheered, a lot of them crying. A familiar face stood out to me. Jan! Her name was out of my mouth before I could think. Her eyes met mine for a heartbeat, then she turned away. I stepped after her, but brought myself up short. No time right now. She disappeared into the crowd. I saw people working on papas, and the wrist ads were falling to the street in a steady stream. Confused at how they were doing that, I looked closer. Roger and Phil were handing around a few nano cutters, making sure people worked fast and handing the tools along. Maybe Phil wasn't so bad. Melissa fired her keeper into the sky. She yelled at the top of her lungs, Listen! Everyone quieted fast. She kept talking. Everyone, stop taking your papas off. You will have to let the bug leave your system first. Understanding washed across the people, and most everyone bent to pick their papa back up. But we have to get out of here. Spread the word. Get on cycles and use enforcer pods. Do whatever, but run. People still stood there, not moving. They had to know more. The prime administrator wasn't real, I yelled. The real one is named Adam Holland. He made the bug. He's controlling everything, and he can't afford to let anyone from New Frisco Get to any other cities in the new chapter. He sent something to kill us all. We have to go, but don't let the knockout hit you. Move! Blank faces turned to terror. People started shouting, tapping ear comms, and running toward the residential zones. Nearly half of the crowd leapt on cycles and started pedaling furiously away. Three or four people fell, victims of the knockout. I stepped toward them. A group of enforcers, their keepers slung across their backs, split up and lifted the unconscious people, carrying them toward safety. My mom and dad ran into view, or at least walked fast. Good, they were being careful about the knockout. I met them and fell into a hug. It couldn't last. Mom, Dad, we have to go. Some kind of quiet thunder rolled over the city from far above. We looked up and watched as a cluster of aircraft, all of them dark and light-absorbing, zoomed into view maybe two kilometers overhead. Terror filled me. Holland had to have sent them. I grabbed my parents and shouted through the ear comm, Melissa! Connor! Paul! Grab Devera! There's a pod in Prime 1. Get in there! We take off in... A high-pitched whine cut me off. As we ran back into Prime 1, something cone-shaped and metallic slammed into the ground just outside the dome. It shattered the road and the sidewalk buckled for meters around it. The shockwave of its impact almost burst my eardrums. The missile, or whatever it was, whined loudly, then the top of it blew off. A massive plume of green-tinged smoke billowed out. Our view was cut off as the door into Prime One slid closed. More thunderous booms shook the ground. My heart slammed in my chest. Mom, my heart rate! Her eyes went wide. She scanned the room we were running through. Melissa, right? Melissa appeared, running alongside. Yes? How do I get my papa off? Melissa handed her a tiny pin. We stopped for a moment as my mom worked. Melissa ran ahead, dragging Devera with her. I saw Connor and Paul, along with Nate and a bunch of other people, dive into the enforcer pod. Where was Bren's family? I hoped Jan and her parents were in a pod somewhere, escaping what had to be some kind of killer gas. I tugged at my mother. Mom, what are you doing? Dad's grip on my shoulder tightened. I looked up at him. He was staring at my mother. Their eyes met and he nodded. His hand wrapped around my wrist and he started dragging me toward the pod, my mom catching up after a moment. He's at 140, Kate, my dad said. 
Bruce, my mom sounded terrified. The nursery, the babies. I know, but we can't. Go! I thought that was Connor's voice, but the pounding in my head was so loud, I wasn't sure. Dad lifted me, carrying me into the pod. I was having trouble seeing, thinking. We got in the pod, and the light changed as the door closed behind us. I felt something wrap around my left wrist, something warm and safe feeling. My heart wouldn't slow down. The pod lifted off. The papa settled onto my wrist immediately, giving off loud beeps. My heart beat loud between my ears, in my throat, through my whole body. Everything went dark. Chapter 38 Who was hitting me? And why was my bed so hard? I blinked, my head feeling like it had been stuffed full of gray protein paste. As my vision cleared, I saw my mother bent over me, tight, concerned eyes staring at my face. She straightened and looked past my head. Bruce, help him up! I stood, feeling hemmed in on every side. There almost wasn't enough room in the pod to breathe. Connor and Paul stood near my mother, Melissa too. Devera was holding Melissa's hand. The pod's propulsion units vibrated through the metal floor. I looked around, taking in the crowd of loudly talking people. The pod smelled a little sour, and I realized that had to be the smell of a bunch of sweating, scared people. There had to be at least thirty people in this thing. A hand squeezed my shoulder. Dad, I said, turning. Did others get out? The babies? My dad's wide face broke into a smile. Yes. I heard a group of enforcers showed up and got every single one loaded in a couple pods. I heard the relief in his voice. Nick, I... He swallowed hard. I'm so proud of you. How brave you've been. He pulled me into a hug. I got a good look through the round windows of the pod. Ten, fifteen, maybe twice that number of pods were flying near us at different altitudes, and those were only the pods I could see. Mom joined in, squeezing me tightly. Warmth and exhaustion washed over me. Tears pushed at the back of my eyes, fighting their way out. I scrubbed my face on my dad's gray shirt. I'm so sorry. They squeezed tighter. No, it's okay, Mom said. Her face was right next to my ear. Her voice was warm and good. What you've gone through, and Bren. She couldn't finish. I felt another set of arms go around me and craned my head to see. Melissa, tears falling freely down her cheeks. I yanked an arm free and brought her closer. Your family? She nodded. Just heard from them. They're okay. She forced a smile. I understood. How could I not? We'd both lost Bren. Suddenly, a bunch of bodies piled into us, voices loud with laughter. We made it! We did it! That was Paul. My family and I were totally submerged in a tangle of arms and excitement. As the pod carried us away from New Frisco, we stood there, pulling each other tight, smiling into the new world we'd just created. This has been a production of Beat by Jared Garrett, narrated by the author Jared Garrett. Beat is book one in the Beat series, Book two is called Push. Find more of Jared's books on Amazon and other platforms. Thank you for listening.